our story unfolds in the courtyard of a vast house with traditional Chinese architecture, situated in the Tianwu continent within the bustling city of Yayan. We learn that the residence is none other than the prestigious Yu family's abode. As night falls, a hushed commotion ensues, marked by whistling and muffled voices that echo through the house, and the atmosphere surrounding the area suggests an imminent burglary which is about to happen. Suddenly, figures draped in capes come into view. One of the men, with a swift kick, shatters the door before them. Broken planks go flying in all directions, adding an element of chaos to the already tense situation. As the scene zooms out, three men come into our focus. Two of them are wearing hoodies, appearing to be lackeys, while the third, clad in green with long hair, stands before them. This authoritative figure directs his shouts towards the house, turning his threatening remarks to a man named Yi Yun. He inquires if this useless trash is already dead. In the subsequent scene, the camera zooms in, offering a closer look at the man in authority. Here, we discover that the figure before us is Fang Hu, a member of the Yi family and the steward of the household. He is formally dressed in green, carrying a folding fan in his hand, exuding an air of authority and control. Finally, we catch a glimpse of the man inside the house. His head is bowed, and he appears on the verge of collapse, evident from his clear exhaustion. The camera perspective shifts to the man's viewpoint, and a silhouette emerges from the partially open door as Fang Hu, dressed in green, approaches. Amused by Yi Yun's miserable state, the man in green begins to compliment him. He recognizes the lad as a genuine genius who has reached the ninth stage of body tempering. It is at this point that the reason for Yi Yun being on his knees becomes apparent. Despite being exposed to a substantial dose of soul-eroding corpse poison, the young man has miraculously survived. With a face drenched in malice and eyes shimmering, the man in green enters the house and finally reveals his intention. As a fellow member of the Yi family, Fang Hu the man in green has arrived to carry out the execution of the young man before him, and as a gesture of kindness, he intends to accomplish it in a single strike. Meanwhile, the young man, clearly injured with blood dripping, braces himself. At that very moment, the lackeys receive orders to attack. One man in a hoodie steps forward, addressing the young man as master and stating that he has no choice in the matter. The lackey firmly grips his sword, swings it through the air, and warns the young man not to blame him for his heartlessness. As he's about to strike, the young man retaliates swiftly, grabbing the lackey's hand. And of course the lackey's eyes widen in realization that he's fucked. As the scene shifts, we zoom in on the young man's face, and it's crystal clear that the sheer intensity of his gaze has sent shivers down the lackey's spine. Fear drips from every pore of the lackey, who's now sweating bullets and trembling like a leaf after catching just a glimpse of those eyes, his experience was as if he had peered into the depths of hell itself. And, of course, a resounding crack echoes through the house, accompanied by a splatter of blood. The lackey, now moaning in agony, clutches his severed hand, once he used to draw a sword against the young man. The severed hand soars through the air lifelessly as the lackey collapses to the ground. Meanwhile, another lackey standing beside him watches in horror, realizing the dire situation he's in. It's written all over his face, he knows he's fucked. The young man, undeterred and standing tall, falls into a moment of ominous silence. With a glint of malice on his face he proceeds to deliver a chilling piece of advice to the trembling figures before him. Facing those poor bastards with an unwavering gaze, he declares that, before taking any action, they should keep the talking to a minimum and with those words the air is thick with tension as the young man establishes his dominance in the face of impending confrontation. The lackey on the ground is in no position to utter a word, lying there drenched in blood, trembling, and taking his last breaths. The man in green, who once exuded an aura of authority, is visibly shocked to witness the defeat of his lackey with a mere single move. This leaves him questioning why the fuck he is not poisoned or injured. To his further dismay, he discovers that our lad's cultivation has also recovered, plunging both him and his lackey into a state of shock and fearful perspiration. The young man, standing confidently before them, observes their anxious state. With an unwavering grin, he taunts the duo, asking them if they're wondering why his cultivation has recovered. No beating around the bush, this dude's got a tale to tell and by the looks of his face it's clear that it's a wild one. Alright, buckle up for this roller coaster ride. So, our dude's just vibrating on his bed, deep into his senior game otaku life. Then out of nowhere, fate decides to play a wicked hand. He blinks, and suddenly he's not in his cozy gaming cave anymore. This is precisely when his soul began its journey, drifting into the young man's body. Of course, the experience wasn't a pleasant one for him initially. After entering the body, he felt a painful sensation, and the residual memories of the young master revealed a grim truth. He had been poisoned by Yi Kun, the eldest son of the Yi family, and the blood on his hands was a clear indication that his body and mind had been corroded by poison. Overnight, he went from being a martial arts genius to a waste, and as if that wasn't enough, he almost lost his life. To add to his misfortune, he died shortly after arriving due to the poison-contaminated body. Talk about a streak of bad luck. However, the story of this loser virgin gamer boy didn't end there. 
Fortunately, he found himself standing inside what seemed to be a digital world, surrounded by a bunch of system windows. Feeling lost, a notification window suddenly appears before him. Upon closer inspection, the notification mentions something about the multiverse devouring system matching with the host and activating automatically. Lost in thought about the mention of multiverse devouring he got hit by another notification, which states that the system has detected a large amount of poison within the host's body, which may endanger the host's safety. It asks whether he would like to devour it. Without a second thought, the boy presses yes. In that very moment, a sort of electrical effect intensifies around him, indicating the process in action. The boy, still clueless about what's happening, emptily gazes at the system windows that have started to pop up. One notification informs him about the successful activation of the attribute panel, another announces the successful activation of the strange space, and the last one declares the successful execution of the poison devouring process. It promptly congratulates the boy for obtaining 800 experience points and reveals that his original pile mountain palm has been upgraded to the fire poison palm. Right then, a system window appears, displaying a bunch of stats about his attributes and rankings. This is where the boy realizes that, after devouring the toxin, the original Pile Mountain Palm has unexpectedly evolved into a higher level Fire Poison Palm. Now, jumping back to what's happening in the moment, the man in green is practically drowning in frustration and confusion, relentlessly pushing our lad to spill the beans on who helped him regain his cultivation. In response, our lad shoots a direct, soul-penetrating gaze into the man's eyes, leaving him visibly shaken. However, he also concedes to spill the details. But what he spills is far from pleasant. Turns out, the heavens couldn't stomach this old man's scumminess, so they hooked him up with an incredibly potent ability called the Super Thick Golden Finger. The old man, initially overwhelmed, manages to pull himself together and, with a shaky voice, asks our lad what he wants. While our boy is playfully messing with the old man, deep down, He's grappling with the reality that the body he now inhabits has just recovered from a deadly poison, and his physical strength is not at its peak. Time is of the essence, and he can't afford to beat around the bushes. In the midst of these thoughts, a system window abruptly appears, informing him that he's been granted a newcomer's gift package and asks if he'd like to open it immediately. Without a second thought, our handsome boy commands the computer to open it. As he wonders about the contents of the newcomer's gift package, another system window pops up, congratulating him for obtaining a million times attack speed. It goes on to explain that a million times attack speed is an extremely powerful divine ability, impossible to evaluate for its level of cultivation. Currently, the host's strength is too low, but he can unlock higher attack speed after improving the realm of cultivation. The young man, gazing intently at the system window, finds it intriguing that the world of martial arts values speed above all else, and this million-fold attack speed immediately enhances his combat power. While our boy is immersed in his thoughts, the old man swiftly orders his lackey to take down the lad's limbs. The lackey, seemingly scared, perhaps already anticipating the consequences, complies under his master's pressure. Before the lackey can make a move, our boy snaps back to reality, placing his hand on the old man's shoulder. It becomes clear that something significant is about to happen. With a mischievous grin etched on his face, he unleashes his threefold attack speed followed by the fire poison arm. Right then, a bright explosion intensifies, leaving the old man gaping and terrified. With just one attack, the old man goes flying, crashing into the ground, shattering the floor and leaving a trail of fire, dust, and rubble behind him. His not-so-ticketed flight comes to an end when he directly hits the other side of the courtyard wall. Pinned against the wall, it's clear that the old man has been rendered unconscious, his mouth agape in a stunned expression. The following moment, he falls, kissing the ground, after leaving quite a mess around him. Having sent the old man flying with his intense blow, the young man stands amidst the rubble as the dust settles down. He revels in his newfound abilities, realizing that it's his first time using them yet he found them quite bone-chilling. He also discovers that the increase in speed has also boosted his explosive power. Meanwhile, the old man we all thought was out cold, surprisingly enough. Turns out, he's still kicking, though completely drained as he could not even hod still his trembling finger. He manages to scrape together enough strength to shoot our boy a question, how the fuck did he get that kind of speed and power? Our lad, not in the mood to spill the beans, decides to leave the old bastard hanging. He casually lets him know there's a bunch of stuff the old coot doesn't have a clue about. With a demonic grin, he suggests the old man start seeking answers from the demons down in hell. Our man just stands there before the old bastard, piercing the air with his soul-searching gaze, and the whole atmosphere thickens as if he's exuding some otherworldly aura. My man decides to showcase one of his newfound techniques, the Devour Fragrance. He places his hand onto the old man's head, assuming an authoritative stance. A black demonic aura begins to emit from the use of his power. With each passing moment, this aura cranks up, swallowing the whole place like it's auditioning for a horror movie. Our lad, looking all powerful, lets the old man get a sneak peek at his true cultivation. Meanwhile, the old geezer is losing his mind, screaming like someone just microwaved his brain. He's practically begging to know how the hell our dude pulled off this mind-bending trick. 
Just as the old man bites the dust, a notification pops up again, casually telling our boy he's just notched his first kill, and as a reward, he's gained a cool 300 experience points. One of the lackeys, standing there, is basically having a reality check, grappling with the fact that his master just kicked the bucket. It's a pretty terrifying experience for the poor guy, leaving him completely stunned. Our boy, showing he's seemingly more devilish than the devil itself, turns toward the fear-stricken lackey and lets the trembling dude know that now it's his turn to savor the taste of trouble. In the middle of the night, with the moon shining brightly and bats doing their chill thing, we find ourselves on the outskirts of the Black Moon mountain range. Here, a gigantic boar gets socked with a punch that sends it soaring through the air. As it crashes down, skidding on the ground, it takes out a few poor trees like a bowling ball hitting pins. Turning our attention to the boar, there's a massive hole in its belly, probably pierced by the attacker's punch. And who's the proud attacker in a stance? Well, none other than our boy. Taking a closer look at his face, it's clear that punching that boar took a toll. He's sweating and huffing like he just ran a marathon. And when the scene zooms out, we finally get the whole picture. No wonder he's catching his breath, that boar is massive, practically dino-sized. And the little boars nearby, clearly terrified, do nothing but tremble in their spots as they witness the might of the man standing before them. Our man, seemingly closes his distance and grabs the boar with his bare hands. It dawns on him that he has pretty much run out of stamina. No worries, though. To recharge his batteries, he casually mutters the word devour. Almost instantly, a dark energy starts emanating from him as he absorbs the huge boar into himself. The notification system window, always prompt, pops up again, congratulating the boy for devouring the first order, thick-skinned wild boar king essence. As a sweet reward, he gets 100 experience points. And just to top it off, another window slides in, patting the young man on the back for reaching the fifth stage of body tempering. An achievement, not bad for a late-night snack. After chowing down on an entire boar, our man is standing there, exuding a transparent aura. Turns out, he's been diligently practicing for two days straight, and as a reward, his current physique has progressed from the third stage to the fifth stage of body tempering. Not too shabby for a couple of days' work. As he stands there, contemplating recent events, he also reveals a few things. First off, after slurping up all the power from the old man, it becomes clear that the system can devour not only a cultivator's cultivation but also pills, techniques, and spirit stones. Speaking of which, after sucking up the old man, he discovers a bag of stones the geezer was carrying. And of course he pulls out those stones, grabs them in his hands, and uses the exact devour technique to suck those balls up. And by sucking balls, I mean devouring the stones. During this process, the stones can directly fuse into higher grade pills within the body, ultimately increasing cultivation. And, of course, the system notification pops up again, celebrating the successful devouring. The first order gathering spirit pull has seamlessly fused into a second order one, and in return, our lad scores a generous amount of experience points, a whopping 500. Now, on to the next revelation about the devouring system. Besides cultivators' cultivation, demonic beasts are also a prime target. Furthermore, it becomes clear that demonic beasts from the first to ninth rank correspond to the nine great realms of cultivators, and munching on these beasts can rapidly enhance cultivation. Without wasting any time, our devilish boy starts squashing those poor little boars, each kill adding a neat 50 experience points as the system windows keep popping up like a massacre scorecard. But the reason behind his ruthlessness toward these creatures becomes clear when he learns that, just like devouring cultivators' cultivation, the system detects that the target is critically injured or near death. And, of course, he made sure to finish off every single one of those little bastards to get their sweet experience points all for himself. In his exploration of the system's perks, our boy stumbles upon another interesting tidbit. Fortunately, as long as he devours non-living beings, the system can restore a certain amount of stamina. His hand, engulfed in dark and greenish energy, serves as a telltale sign of his healing ability. In a matter of seconds, his hand heals effortlessly. Another noteworthy feature he recalls about the system is its perception and detection capabilities. It's like having a built-in radar, saving him a lot of trouble. The system alerts him whenever there's a looming threat nearby. After ensuring he's slaughtered enough wild boars to reach the fifth stage of body tempering, he finally puts a halt to his slaughtering spree. However, his hunger for more power doesn't end there. He desires even greater heights, still considering himself far from satisfied. So, he continues his onslaught, casually walking through the forest as those poor creatures meet their toasted demise. The scene transitions, and later at night, we find ourselves in the Yu family courtyard. The air makes whistling sounds as our boy walks down the courtyard. While walking and snapping his neck, judging by the looks of his satisfied face, it's clear that he has been quite content with today's grinding. After ensuring to devour most of the demonic beasts in the outer periphery of the Black Moon Mountain Range, we return to the moment where a barrier appeared in the outer periphery of the Black Moon Mountain Range, halting his plans of enhancing his strength quickly. He reveals that the barrier's restoration in the inner circle requires the combined efforts of the three major clans to open it, so he had to get back. 
But, of course, that is not enough for him to just give up on grinding so he decides to think of other cultivation methods tomorrow. As he is about to enter the house, his satisfied look suddenly turns into wide-eyed alertness after sensing something's off. It turns out a blade, moving at the speed of light, passes through him. Thanks to his quick reflexes, he manages to dodge the oncoming blade. Immediately, he turns around, locking eyes with the audacious assailant. With a fierce gaze, he scans the surroundings. When he turns back, a bunch of lackeys in red hoodies, armed with sharp weapons, confront him. The person in charge, probably the one who ordered the attack, addresses the young man, Yi-Yun, questioning his audacity to harm their people. And with this abrupt intrusion let me tell you one thing the night just got a whole lot more interesting. As the scene shifts and we get a closer look at the intruder, he wears a confident grin, seemingly assured by the presence of his lackeys. He warns our handsome young man, Yi-Yun, not to get too cocky. This man happens to be yi Kun, the son of the elder, and he proudly boasts the sixth stage of blood tempering. Seeing yi Kun instantly raises the guard of our young man. And later in the moment it becomes apparent that, besides yi Kun, all the other cultivators with Yi-Yun have reached the seventh stage of body tempering. The lackey leader taunts our young man, reminding him of the poison and inquiring whether the soul-eroding corpse poison, specially obtained from the southern frontier, wasn't enough to finish him off. However, despite his confident face, in the back of his mind, he's well aware that not only did our lad survive the poison, but in just two days, Eon has also broken through to the fifth stage of body tempering. Despite that, the lackey leader dismisses any notion that our young man poses a threat. He sees this encounter as an opportunity given by the heavens to eliminate our lad by his own hands, and he's standing right there ready to seize it. The lackey leader stands tall, a confident grin etched on his face. In a sudden burst of energy, he marches towards the young man with fierce speed, attempting to intimidate him by expressing his desire to torture him personally. As he stretches his hand, holding his sword, it is instantly grabbed by the young man. The lackey leader is shocked out of his mind, trying to comprehend how the fuck did he move so fast. Meanwhile, looking at our young man's face, it's clear that he's enjoying the attention given to his prowess. In that very moment, a resounding crack echoes in the area, leaving the lackey leader writhing in pain. Our handsome young man has twisted the man's wrist, rendering him paralyzed and screaming in agony on his knees for his arm. As the lackeys charge with their swords to see their master getting fucked, our young man doesn't bat an eye. He twists the leader's wrist even more, snapping the bone like a twig. The leader, now in intense pain, shoots daggers from his eyes. Despite the leader's threats and curses, my man isn't done. With a swift move, he swings the man around, bringing the broken leg into play along with the shattered wrist. But our boy isn't satisfied yet. The man loses the bones in his other leg as well after a brutal crash to the ground. Tears welled up on the man's eyes as he screamed in agony, resembling a wild animal caught in a trap. Our young man, with a look of piercing determination, tells him that he can't just let those legs off easily. As the lackeys closed in, acting all tough and ordering our guy around to release their master, he decided to play along. With a swift move, he tossed their leader into the air like a ragdoll. My man looking at the lackey's approach, moves like lightning, leaving a shadowy blur behind him. No words needed, each one of them goes flying as he walks through them like a runaway train. But there's always that one stubborn guy, right? Despite looking scared out of his wits, this lackey stood his ground, sword in hand. He couldn't figure out how this seemingly ordinary dude was pulling off such crazy moves, but he wasn't about to run away just yet. The showdown was still on. In the next moment, it's like the lackey's eyes widens as if he had been caught red-handed stealing cookies. The young man effortlessly reaches the lackey, grabs him with intense vibes, and throws him away like yesterday's trash. Meanwhile their leader's brain seems to have taken a vacation as he watches his lackeys get schooled by this dude. Mouth agape, eyes wide open, he's on the ground grappling with the harsh reality. It's like he's wondering if he accidentally stepped into a superhero movie or something. The handsome young man stands tall amid the lackeys thrown around like discarded toys. The leader, nursing his broken body, sits on the ground, desperately telling our guy to stay away. But our man isn't one to follow orders. He keeps walking, grinning, and casually asks if the guy always had a thing for poisoning people. With the looming threat, the leader shouts at the young man to stop, warning him not to come any closer. But our boy has no intention of listening. He reaches the man, unleashing the same fire poison palm as before, intensifying the flames. The guy is left screaming and moaning as fire and smoke engulf the surroundings, with the echoes of screams resonating through the courtyard. The leader, now a walking bonfire, still clings to his cockiness, threatening our young man. With his mouth wide open and eyes bulging out, he declares that if not killed now, he'll seek revenge for today's shame. Our boy, not thrilled to hear such threats, decides to make sure there's no chance of revenge. Anticipating his impending doom, the leader starts begging. But begging doesn't work against our boy. He simply calls on the system and starts devouring his cultivation. The system window pops up, announcing the successful devouring. It congratulates him for gaining a whopping 15 oh sweet experience points and reaching the sixth stage of body tempering. Completely drained, the poor guy finally realizes that his cultivation has been sucked out and has been taught a tough lesson in messing with the wrong dude. 
While brushing his hands, our man casually mentions that he's just repaid him back tenfold for what he did to him back then. Standing as the figure of authority, he orders the now cultivation-less guy to crawl out of his territory like a dog if he values his life. The man, however, is in no position to move an inch. The young man turns toward him, stands tall on the man's face, and asks if he understands. The image of our young man's imposing posture is burned into the man's eyes, a sight that'll likely haunt him for a while. The scene transitions to the U family, the Bayon City Patriarch's mansion. A bunch of lackeys is strewn on the ground, trembling. One of them, with his remaining strength, gathers words to urgently summon someone. The message is clear, an immediate call to the Grand Patriarch of the House. As the camera zooms out, the desperate call of the lackey becomes evident when we see the courtyard filled with dead and injured lackeys. At the top of the stairs stands a man, none other than our handsome young man. He appears exhausted after devouring a lot of cultivation, and to top it off, he has found the key to the Grand Patriarch's private treasure trove. Our guy is low-key sweating about the aftermath of beating up the lackey leader. I mean, who wouldn't be worried when your dad is not just your old man but also the Grand Patriarch with some serious key blood realm mojo. He's fully aware he's not ready to throw down with his dad. Like, he's at the sixth stage of body tempering, and his old man is at the level where he's basically bending the rules of physics. Even with a threefold attack speed, it's like bringing a water gun to a flamethrower fight. His primary focus now is to raise his cultivation. He got a level up before dad gets back and unleashes the key blood realm lecture on him. So, our dude gets a hot tip from the system about some treasure nearby. Following the coordinates like a GPS, he arrives at the spot, and surprisingly, there's a locked door. No worries, though. He pulls out the key he snagged earlier, shoves it into the lock, and voila, the door creaks open. As the door swings open, he steps into what's basically Aladdin's cave. Gold, artifacts, scrolls, ancient papers, it's like he walked into the jackpot of treasure rooms. The guy is probably doing mental calculations on how to fit all this loot in his pockets. You can practically see the gears turning in his head as he gears up for some serious looting action. Our protagonist is in the midst of a treasure feast, absorbing the artifacts left and right. The system notifications are on a relentless spree, announcing each successful devouring with a symphony of digital chimes. Amidst this cascade of information, a pivotal moment unfolds, he achieves the illustrious ninth stage of body tempering. With newfound power coursing through him, he delves into the specifics. A modest requirement stands between him and the first stage of the key blood realm, a mere 5,200 XP. As he contemplates this, his expanding skill set catches his attention. Alongside his already impressive skills, he gains a formidable martial arts spirit glow sword technique. In the midst of his elation, something else captures his gaze, a treasure trove of third-layer spiritual weapons, with the spirit execution sword shining prominently. It's as if the universe conspired to shower him with unprecedented fortune. He extends his hand adorned with a shimmering light robe, effortlessly grabbing hold of the legendary spirit execution sword. As the third-layer spiritual weapon now rests in his hand, his joy radiates through his expression. He's well aware that this potent sword can stand against martial artists in the Grandmaster realm. Swiftly concealing the sword, he uses the hide command, making the weapon vanish into his inventory. A notification promptly appears, confirming that the spirit execution sword has been stored in the system's storage space, ready to be summoned at his command. In the system window, the young man joyfully observes the spirit execution sword and various other artifacts safely tucked away in his inventory. The system, offering unlimited storage space, allows him to hoard all these treasures for his convenience. The mischievous grin on his face grows wider as he contemplates the potential poetic justice of seeing the old fart meet his demise at the hands of the very weapon now in his possession. The thought of the old man having no one else to blame but his son for the impending downfall adds an extra layer of amusement to the situation. As he strolls down the mountains, the young man revels in the satisfaction of having devoured everything in his vicinity. With nothing left to consume in this location, he decides to make his way back. His thoughts are interrupted when he hears urgent calls from behind. Furious, he turns back and sees Wumo, the butler of the Yi family, rushing towards him with sweat and exhaustion evident on his face. The old man questions why he is wandering around instead of recuperating in his room. The young man, intrigued, inquires about the reason for his visit. The old man, clearly up to something, warns him not to talk about it. Without much explanation, he grabs his hand and starts to drag him, emphasizing that the master has just returned and has been searching for him everywhere. The scene transitions to a man coughing up a considerable amount of blood. Despite his age, the man is impressively robust. This man is Yi Wushuang, the master of the Yi family. A concerned young boy rushes towards his blood-coughing master, urging him to rest and assures him that nothing will happen to our young master Yun. However, the stubborn old man insists on seeing his son with his own eyes before resting. At that very moment, our boy arrives, addressing him as father, and their gazes meet. From our boy's perspective, he sees an old man who is severely ill, covered in bandages, appearing frail. There's a visible concern in his eyes for his son. Our young man reaches his father, providing support to his frail form. With a concerned expression, he turns his head towards the butler, questioning what's going on and why his father is so badly injured. 
In response, the butler spills the beans, spills them all over the floor, about how the old man went on a crusade to find an antidote when our lad got poisoned. Like, come on, it's the dad of the year award right there. But wait, there's more. The old man further discloses that his father's sickness is a result of entering the dangerous misty swamp to decimate the demonic beasts, showing a complete disregard for his own well-being. The struggling, coughing father plays boss and shuts down the butler's storytelling hour and instructs him to bring out the mysterious elixir quickly. Moments later a green orb materializes before us, containing a mysterious elixir. The old man carefully cradles the box carrying the orb and urges his son to take the elixir promptly, revealing that it should manage to remove 30% of the poison upon consumption. Holding the orb in his hand, the young man recalls the elixir's properties, a second layer potion with effects on life poison and raises cultivation level. With clear concern in his eyes, the old man reassures his son that he'll figure out a way to eliminate the remaining poison. Witnessing his father persistently coughing out blood, a wave of sympathy washes over him. The old man has literally staked his life on this mysterious elixir, which, for now, only tackles 30% of the poison. Despite being sick himself, his father urges him to gulp down the elixir before getting dazed. Touched by a surge of compassion, the young man reflects on the fatherly love bestowed upon the original owner of this body. Moved by this emotion, he gently places his hand on the man's chest. In that instant, the old man becomes alarmed, sensing a profound change in the energy around him. Observing his hand channeling an incredible force, the old man speculates on the surge in the young man's cultivation, contemplating if true healing is taking place. Still enveloped in shock, the old man witnesses the miraculous scene that left him and the onlooker speechless. The young man while hiding the reality reveals that he has been enlightened by a master, and the poison in his body has already been eradicated, and he has successfully reclaimed his cultivation. He discloses to his father that he has already reached the ninth stage of body tempering, reassuring him not to worry anymore. He then hands his old man a bottle with some healing stuff, saying he's got plenty and tells his dad to chug them for a quick recovery. The old man holds the bottle of healing juice like it's some precious gem. Both he and the butler, confused yet surprised, inquire if the master he met also gave these to him. Our boy, pretending to clear his throat, casually spills the beans that he snagged these from Yi Chang's stash, leaving the butler and others freaked out. To amp up the drama, he drops the bomb that he had also wrecked on Yi Kun's danshan, so the guy can't level up in the cultivation game anymore. The butler and the young boy, both left in terror, couldn't help but wonder how the fuck he raided the Grand Patriarch's treasure. Not only that, he messed up young master Kun's danshan. The shock terrifies them, thinking their master just picked a fight with the big shots without considering the consequences. But to everyone's surprise, his old man just bursts into laughter, leaving everyone present bewildered. With a grin on his face, surprisingly the old man praises his son for what he's done, expressing that he didn't expect such audacity during his time away and continues to boast about his son. Meanwhile, the butler and the young boy are just scared, urging their master that there's no time for praise and worrying about the repercussions. However, despite his father reveling in his boy's achievements a moment ago, he was also afraid by the fact that he had turned Yi Chang's son into a cripple and was worried about the severe consequences ahead. His father stressed the fact that despite being the head of the Yi family, he had been ostracized by Yi Chang over the years because his cultivation had stagnated at the first stage of the Qi blood realm. He spills the beans that five out of the eight patriarchs are on their side and might be up for overthrowing the old man as the head of the Yi family. And, of course, his dad throws in a warning for his son to always watch his back in case those treacherous folks decide to pull an assassination move. But our young man, with eyes gleaming like a devil, assures his dad that if they dare to step up, he'll make sure they come in alive but leave wishing they hadn't. Right at that moment, all hell breaks loose outside the entrance door. Three figures, like total wrecking balls, bust through the front gate, sending planks flying. They grab everyone's attention and yell for everyone inside to pay attention. The young man, with a serious look on his face, turns his head to see who the heck just crashed the party. The dude standing outside cuts to the chase, asking if he's the big shot either looking for. As the scene shifts, we get a closer look at the three men. One man stands above everyone with a cocky expression, wielding a giant sword. Then, there's a tall guy who appears buffed on the outside but his head seems empty inside. And, of course, there's another nut job with purple hair and his tongue doing its own weird dance in the air. The guy with the sword announces that the Grand Patriarch ordered the entire clan to attend the council chamber immediately, and no delays would be tolerated. Checking out our young man, it's clear he's not thrilled about these guys crashing the party. He just shoots him a stern look. In the next scene, we're suddenly in the council chamber, where everyone's huddled up in front of this dude in red who's practically oozing authority vibes. There's another guy in green basically begging this authoritative figure, filling him in on how our guy not only beat up his crew but also messed with their young master Kun. The rest of the folks around are just gossiping and whispering about our boy, saying he's basically stuck his hand in a lion's mouth this time. Some are even betting he's done for. Meanwhile, Green Suit keeps pleading, throwing in that our lad swiped the key to the treasury, and now it's been completely raided. While the big shot listens to all the antics of our boy, his aura is just getting more intense with each passing moment. The poor dude pleading in front of him is practically shaking, 
begging the patriarch to avenge his young master. Finally, we get a good look at the authority figure. He's this old dude who looks like he stepped out of Tekken 7. You know, like Akuma. And man, he's beyond furious hearing about our young man's escapades. Being Yi Cheng, the grand patriarch of the Yi family, he just declares he's gonna break our guy into pieces. Meanwhile, we get a look at the two people standing in hoodies, seemingly doing nothing. Right then, Yi Ming, the second big shot of the Yi family, starts throwing shade, calling our guy worse than a usual troublemaker for messing with his peeps. Just when things are getting tense, an explosion rocks the joint, stealing everyone's attention. The second patriarch, in shock, exclaims, who the fuck has dared to make mess around here? Onlookers are just trying to make sense of the chaos, seeing some injured dude lying on the ground. Our young man, all fired up, stands there and declares they're the ones who attacked his crew first, kicking off the whole mess. And of course, the patriarch, witnessing our mischievous young man's audacious move, is beyond ticked off, asking if he doesn't even know how to bow when meeting a patriarch. Our boy ain't one to back down. He throws his hand up, points a finger right at the Grand Patriarch, and straight up accuses him of not playing by the rules and now acting like he's the rulebook. No respect whatsoever, he fires off questions about the Patriarch's qualifications, asking if this Walmart version of Akuma even deserves to be standing in his dad's place. The old fart, clearly ticked off, starts exuding this fiery aura, turning the heat up in the room. Just to mess with the Patriarch even more, he throws in a cheeky question, asking if he is speechless because our handsome boy might actually have a point. Right then, some folks start marching in toward our lad. And behold, it's his dad, casually dropping the F-bomb about being late, like it's no big deal. The young man, cool as a cucumber, reassures his old man that he's not late at all. In fact, the real show is just getting started. The patriarch, steaming with anger, stands there like a ticking time bomb. And then, our lad's dad drops a question on him, asking what the fuck he thinks he's doing today, questioning if he's trying to start a rebellion with all this blatant partiality. But the patriarch, under that massive mustache, just widens his grin and starts laughing like he's at a comedy show. As the scene zooms out, everyone's standing around, tense as heck, watching the drama unfold. Meanwhile, the patriarch is burning like a candle in the middle, telling the young man's father that his qualifications are mediocre, and with no fancy background, there's no way in heck he can lead the family. The old fart's strutting around like a human torch, ready to flex his muscles. He throws his hand up, about to unleash some power, and boldly declares that the head of the family gig should go to someone who's actually got the chops. Turning around, he looks for some nods of approval to back up his statement. One of the guys, standing there in the line, looks like he's lost in the Matrix but reluctantly agrees with the Grand Patriarch, saying it should be someone capable like the current Patriarch. Everyone else, appearing as if they're forced at gunpoint, begrudgingly acknowledges it. Our hero's dad, smelling something fishy, straight up questions their sanity, wondering why these three idiot patriarchs suddenly decided to join the Grand Patriarch's fan club. But after taking a peek at those poor folks standing there, it's pretty clear they didn't sign up for this. One guy's got his wife and kids held hostage in the old fart's hands. The Grand Patriarch throws out his hand, conjuring up some energy blob while his hair goes all crazy due to the thickened aura. He threatens our lad's father, saying if he offered his own son now, he might let him walk away with a hint of mercy. Our handsome boy, looking all set for the showdown, casually asks if the Grand Patriarch is that eager to snatch the family crown. Without missing a beat, he makes his move, appearing behind the Patriarch and throwing down a challenge, wanting to see what the Grand Patriarch's got. The old fart, though acknowledging the young man's speed, keeps up the bravado, yelling that he's way out of his league. Our boy, right in front of the old fart, pulls out his fire poison palm, and in retaliation, the old guy whips out his dark wind palm, creating a fiery tornado around them. In the next blink, it seems our lad is dominating this old dude, his fists connecting with the patriarch's palm. Onlookers are practically stumbling over each other, struggling to stay upright because of the intense aura. They're in shock, wondering how the fuck this guy managed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the grand patriarch, who's in the second stage of the Q1 blood realm. And from the look on the old man's face, it's clear he's not thrilled about it either. He's just ticked off that this good-for-nothing Brad is pushing him to the edge. The young man, wearing that mischievous grin, decides to mess with the old fart, so he suggests him to save some of his powers because there are plenty of surprises coming his way. And then, my man just goes all serious, yelling at the system to summon the sword. Lo and behold, the sword pops up in his hand, and he swings it so damn fast that it leaves a trail behind. The old man's eyes widen as he watches this brat holding onto the sword. Without giving the old man a second to react, our guy thrusts the sword right through the old fart's chest. The old guy's face goes pale, muscles tense up, realizing his own sword has skewered him like a melon. Suddenly, the old fart starts coughing up blood. As the scene zooms out, we see the old man kissing the ground, blood splattering around him. Voices start echoing that this young man just killed the damn patriarch. The young man, even more evil than the devil, leans in and asks the old man how it feels to die with his own sword. One of the masked lackeys, loyal to the patriarch, decides to take a swing at our boy from behind. 
But our guy isn't fooling around, he senses the incoming threat with those devilish eyes of his. The lackey's hit smashes into the ground, leaving a crater, but our lad had already dodged the imminent danger. The lackey, now completely ticked off, turns to him, pointing out that not only did he wreck your family's golden boy, Yi Kun, but now he's gone and killed the freaking Grand Patriarch. The guy stands tall in the settling dust, giving off this important aura. He looks at our lad and asks, with a stern tone, if he's completely trashed the values of their Yi family. Meanwhile, our lad's dad, standing behind, is clearly terrified, asking if his son is okay. In response, our lad gives the reassuring nod his dad was desperately hoping for. Now, a bit of backstory. Our lad spills the beans that the Yang family is one of the big shots in King Yang County, holding a powerful position. He goes on to explain that not too long ago, Yi Kun wanted to tie the knot with the Yang family. However, the Yangs had some high demands. Not only did they want the Yi family to join their ranks, but they also insisted that the entire Yi family change their original surnames and become a subsidiary family of the Yangs. Back in the present, our lad, flashing a confident grin, casually swings his third grade sword over his shoulder and struts through the settling dust like a pro champ. The lackey, seemingly seething with anger, vents his frustration by suggesting that if our boy cuts his own throat, he might think about sparing his old man. While this masked lackey is all amped up with an intensifying aura, one of his partners jumps in, telling his brother to let him handle this brat first. He suggests beheading the father afterward, and then they can head back and report the whole situation to the head of the family. So, with the master plan in motion, the second brother does some chanting magic thing, and his giant sword is immediately engulfed in this greenish, intensified aura. With determination and malice, he lunges at our boy with that enormous sword. But our boy, cool as a cucumber, just grabs that incoming sword with his bare fingers. The lackey looks like he's been frozen midair, staring dumbfounded as our lad stands there, holding the sword with just his fingers. It's like a giant fuck you moment for those brothers. The big sword guy grapples with the harsh reality that he can't even move. His terror level goes through the roof. Our lad, showing them who's boss, casually remarks that it seems like the third stage of the key blood realm isn't all that powerful. Just another day in the life of our mischievous hero. In that very moment, he whips out his sword with his other hand. The strike so fast it leaves a trail of black matter following the sword. The guy with the big sword, once all cocky, now looks like he's been sliced in half. Onlookers are now getting cold feet, probably regretting their life choices right then and there. Our boy just stands there, his sword covered in a black aura. Someone from the crowd can't hold back and asks him why the fuck he killed the Grand Patriarch and the Yang family's emissary. Our boy, looking stern, rests his sword on his shoulder and makes it crystal clear that he's just giving back exactly what they tried to do to him. He raises his fingers and declares that if someone wants to kill, they'll be killed right back. Just like that, with a casual finger gesture, hundreds and thousands of swords surround the entire area, like he's some kind of Gilgamesh with his Gate of Babylon. Onlookers, along with the second patriarch, stand there with their mouths wide open, as if they've just seen the devil himself. Next, our boy decides to flex his boss moves and gives the folks present two choices. Option 1. They all can pledge their allegiance to his father and follow his lead. Now, for the second option. Well, turns out there's no freaking second option. It's either swear allegiance or get ready for the impending doom that awaits them all. The atmosphere thickens as everyone grapples with the reality of their impending fate. After dropping this bombshell, he locks eyes with the other brother. With a devilish grin, our boy asks him, being the loyal dog of the Grand Patriarch, if he's willing to surrender. As expected, the masked lackey denies surrendering, even though he's probably sweating bullets. He's all about that loyalty, even if it means sticking it out till the bitter end. Our lad, recognizing this undying resolve, decides to seal his fate right then and there. He directs his swords toward the man, bombarding him with an unlimited blade onslaught. But, turns out, the lackey's got some tricks up his sleeve. He whips out the ultimate barrier to dodge the incoming blades. It's pretty clear, though, that he can't withstand that relentless onslaught, as his shield starts shattering like it's made of glass. In the next moment, just as expected, the man is pierced by the thousands of blades raining over him. All of this happened, under the command of our evil hero who chose this blood-filled fate for that poor guy. Finally, after pinning the guy into the ground with that relentless assault, our lad decides to take a breather. Standing there, he calls for the system. Then, like a true cultivator gourmet, he starts devouring the cultivations of the trash lying before him. The system window pops up as usual, and after scooping up all that cultivation from the trash, he's got a whopping 60,000 experience points. Just like that, another system window appears, congratulating him for reaching the second stage of the Kai Blood Realm. After slurping up the remaining ounce of energy from both brothers, he goes on to gather skill points, bumping up his speed and attack techniques by fivefold. Our young lad, getting all excited to check his stats, realizes he can boost his attack speed once he breaks through a realm. This sparks a crazy idea in his mind. He looks back at the second patriarch and the other guy on the ground, both scared out of their wits. The patriarch, still grappling with the reality of witnessing the demise of Yi Chang and the two emissaries of the Yang family, can't believe how powerful the boy has become. For the time being, the scared patriarch has only one thing on his mind, saving his own skin. 
So, he immediately drops to his knees and bows down, showing respect to our lad. He declares his loyalty and willingness to serve his father. Although it might be a cowardly move, it's the only thing that could save him from getting killed by that young man. However, reality still looks pretty grim for the second patriarch, as our boy already has other plans in mind. He announces that those who were forced to do the Grand Patriarch's bidding can clear their names if they help completely eradicate the remaining party of the former Grand Patriarch. As for the five traitors, he declares that he wants them stripped of their cultivation, thrown into the dungeon, and not released until they're dead. Despite the second patriarch pleading his loyalty, it seems his plan backfired. All five members grapple with the harsh reality of their impending fate. Gotta say, though, they've got a tough look. With the green light given by their new master, the folks spring into action and immediately apprehend the second patriarch along with the other people. The second patriarch, finding himself in a tight spot, threatens the young man, claiming he'll face punishment one day for his arrogance and the new enemies he's made. He goes on to predict doom for the Yi family sooner or later. Our boy, on the other hand, couldn't care less about these empty threats. His father places a reassuring hand on his shoulder and asks if he's hurt. With a firm smile, he reassures his father not to worry about anything because he's made sure to clear out all the men of the Grand Patriarch, and no one will come after them anymore. Dad leans in and lets out a sigh of relief. He's stoked that his son is finally growing up and taking on the responsibility of leading the family. It's like a dream come true for him. But, our boy seems to have different interests. He's not into all that politics and power stuff. He cuts to the chase and asks his old man when the secret black moon will be unsealed. Dad, a bit thrown off by this sudden shift in conversation, spills the beans. He reveals that there are still ten days left until the three great families join forces to unseal the secret black moon. Curious as ever, he shoots back a question, wondering why his son is suddenly interested. Upon learning that, our boy, without giving any response to his father, falls into contemplation. Apparently, the secret black moon is located in the deepest part of the Black Moon mountain range. It's like a hidden gem left behind by powerhouse folks from a long time ago. It's guarded by the three great families of Bayun City. He is aware that the secret cave is full of spiritual aura, and many strong demonic beasts exist there. There are also many precious rare treasures inside, making it an excellent sanctuary for martial artists to cultivate. In order to prevent the endless scavenging of martial artists that would deplete the resources, the three great families of Bayun City sealed the cave a hundred years ago. They agreed that it could only be unsealed once every three years. During that time, the three great families could send out powerful disciples to enter the cave, cultivate, and grab treasures. He is afraid that the current young family has multiple key blood realm masters, and it's also rumored that the eldest young master, Yang Longjin, is a peak key blood realm master. He is aware of the fact that, in order to fight that guy, the only way is to raise his strength. And the only way to do that is by taking a mandatory trip into the secret black moon. In the midst of a bustling day, there's this massive waterfall stealing the scene. Our boy, for some mysterious reason, takes a dive right into the heart of it. Turns out he's on a treasure hunt, deep down on the seabed. A nifty system window pops up out of nowhere, tipping him off that there's some treasure scent lingering in the south direction. The lad extends his hand towards a glowing plant. This plant, my friend, is no ordinary fern. It's a powerhouse treasure tucked beneath the spirit pool. Hand closing in, he starts devouring the thing. And, as per the usual routine, a notification pops up telling him he's just bagged a whopping 4,000 XP points. Swimming back up to the water's surface, our lad, thanks to the spirit pool magic, has just leveled up to the third stage of the key blood realm, all in a day's underwater adventure. So, after a quick check on his new stats, it's crystal clear our boy has indeed hit the third stage of the key blood realm. And now, the tantalizing option to break through to the fourth stage is on the table. With a triumphant splash, our lad finally emerges from the water, taking in a big, satisfying breath. But what's this? His eyes lock onto a woman at the pool's edge, a vision in white, seemingly enjoying a tranquil bath. As their gazes meet, time freezes momentarily. Suddenly, reality hits. The woman, feeling caught off guard, exclaims pervert and clutches her chest, a blush painting her cheeks. Our quick-thinking lad, sensing trouble, takes off like a lightning bolt through the water. Mid-sprint, he shouts back, claiming it's all a misunderstanding. The girl, clearly angered, assumes a fighting stance, ready to take on our dude. But our lad, being the quick thinker he is, swiftly grabs her by the wrist and pulls her down. Unfortunately, she stumbles, begins to fall, and, mysteriously, coughs out a ton of blood. Down she goes, landing safely in our boy's grasp. Now thoroughly confused, he checks on her, asking if she's okay. Despite her weakened state, she insists he gets off her. It's then our lad notices a severe wound near her collarbone. In the midst of this confusion, a group of horse-riding hobos, armed with sharp weapons, comes into view. It seems they were on the hunt for this very woman. And it's clear that trouble has officially arrived for our lad. One of the bald members of the wild horse gang, sporting a broad grin, reaches for his sword upon seeing the girl. Grasping the gigantic sword while still on his horse and observing our boy with the girl, it's evident that this woman is their target. The gang, known as the wild horse gang, issues a warning for our lad to scram if he values his life, otherwise, he's in for a world of trouble. 
Our boy, holding the woman in his grasp, stares sternly at the hobo. That's when it hits him that the Wild Horse Gang is the notorious band of thieves that prowls around Bayon City, known for their city looting and all sorts of criminal activities. The man, soaked in overconfidence, begins drawing his sword from its scabbard. With arrogance oozing from every pore, he proudly declares that once his saber is unsheathed, there's no escaping their fate. However, our young man remains impervious to such threats. Without hesitation, he reciprocates the sentiment of the confident Baldi. In the blink of an eye, the Baldi realizes he's in deep shit. Before he can execute any move, he witnesses his treasures, weapons, and, of course, the hand he used to wield the blade soaring into the air. His horse, feeling the imminent danger, bolts away, leaving him stranded. The lackeys arrive just in time to witness their boss lying defeated on the ground. Holding the woman delicately in his hands, our man issues a fearless challenge to the approaching lackeys, urging them to come at him with all their might. The lackeys, fueled by rage over their leader's demise, decide to avenge their fallen comrade. Our man remains unfazed, knowing that these poor souls are utterly outmatched. He stands there stoically as the lackeys, along with their horses, soar through the air, their limbs cut like vegetables in a skilled display of combat prowess. And of course a notification pops up on the system, revealing seven potential meals and a load of treasures on the menu. This is where he finally discovers that the system can feast on the entire bunch at once. Not wasting a breath, he dives right into the feast, grabbing both the poor souls in their loot. With a devilish grin, he finishes the buffet, and just like that, he's 220,000 experience points richer. As if that's not enough, he levels up to the fourth stage of the Q1 blood realm. After polishing off the unsatisfying meal, the young man leaves them sprawled on the ground, content with the breakthrough to the third stage of the blood realm. As he heads back, the lady he saved catches up and calls out to him. The pretty lady, Kin Yao, expresses her gratitude, apologizes for the misunderstanding, and introduces herself. She then eagerly asks for our boy's name. With an indifferent expression, our lad reveals he's a young from the Yi family in Bayan City. Accepting her thanks casually, he explains that the Wild Horse Gang was asking for trouble with all their crimes, and they got what they deserved. Upon learning about his prominent family background, the young lady aims to recruit him into the Kaiyun sect. She explains that she and the sex elders are in Kingyong County scouting for outstanding disciples. Just as she's about to extend an invitation, their attention is abruptly diverted by something else. As the scene zooms out, we get to see the sky adorned with fireworks, giving the impression of a New Year's celebration. However, the look on our lad's face suggests that these fireworks are no cause for celebration, and something fishy is happening. Without hesitation, he bolts away at incredible speed, leaving the young women behind who urges him to wait, but it seems the young man is not one to stop easily. Upon reaching the family's courtyard, instead of a festive scene, he's met with a grim sight. The servants and guests of the Yi household lie on the ground, seemingly lifeless victims of a catastrophe. Approaching an injured lackey in concern, he inquires about the events and the identity of the attackers. However, the injured man is too weakened to respond. In the following moment, his attention is drawn to a figure standing before him. As the scene shifts we see a man in green, accompanied by his lackeys, who addresses our lad with a cocky tone. Without beating around the bush he straight up accuses the young man of ruining the marriage between the Yi and Yang families as well as killing two of his deacons. Later in the moment, we learn that the man in green standing before us is Yang Kingmu, a powerhouse at the sixth level of the Qi blood realm, emerging as the chief steward of the Yang family. By the looks of his face, it's clear that the guy is pretty pissed at our boy. As the lackeys forcibly drag out our boy's injured father, the urgency of the situation hits hard. The father, in a desperate plea, urges his son to escape the impending danger. However, instead of succumbing to fear, our boy is fueled by an intense rage. His eyes glitter with malice, mirroring the fury within him at the sight of his battered father. He doesn't waste a second, summoning his sword in a flash and shooting a warning glance at Mr. Stewart, as if to say, get ready for the show, pal. In one smooth stroke, his blade releases a surge of dark energy that spills out, shrouding the surroundings and making a beeline for the overconfident Mr. Stewart. The masked lackeys, caught off guard, stand frozen for a moment, overwhelmed by the sheer intensity of the unfolding spectacle. The atmosphere becomes thick with malice and evil vibes as the sinister force unleashed by the sword follows the lackey like a precision laser cutting through a cucumber. Just as the lackey is about to react, the realization hits him like a ton of bricks, his legs are toast. Panic sets in, and beads of sweat start pouring down his terrified face. In a split second, the lackey finds himself in a nightmare, realizing that his legs are no longer his own. A symphony of agonized screams echoes through the courtyard as he crumples to the ground. The once cocky Mr. Stewart, faced with the stark reality of his lackey moaning in pain and legless, grapples with the shock. Meanwhile a mischievous grin spreads across our hero's face, finding amusement in the shattered confidence of his adversaries. Just to mess with them a bit more, he taunts Mr. Stewart telling him how the Yang family is filled with a bunch of mindless hobos. As the terrified lackeys anxiously await the inevitable, their master seethes with frustration and anger. He's downright pissed witnessing a once-dismissed underdog transform into an unstoppable force. Amidst the chaos, the young lad rushes to his injured father's side. 
With genuine concern, he asks in a worried tone if his father is all right. Despite the injuries, the father manages to give a reassuring nod, a silent affirmation of the safety the young man hoped for. Meanwhile, Mr. Stewart, standing at a distance, can't help but ponder the unrivaled powers displayed by our young hero. He contemplates the remarkable martial prowess of the young man. Although only at the fourth level of the key blood realm, our protagonist's martial arts skills are nothing short of genius. Mr. Stewart can't shake off the feeling that this young upstart might even surpass the formidable figures of the renowned young family. As our dude is busy patching up his old man, Mr. Stewart decides to shout and throw some insults, calling him a bastard. No biggie, though, our guy just shoots him a look that could burn through walls. Now, this cocky dude, living up to his name, hasn't dropped the whole arrogant act. In his mind, he believes he's doing our lad a favor by presenting an option and goes on proposing that if our hero agrees to replace Yi Kun and joins the prestigious Yang family, he might graciously spare the lives of the Yi family. Our lad, finding the whole thing a comedy goldmine, hits the cocky dude with a stare that practically screams, dude, do you even know who you're dealing with? So, Mr. Stewart, not exactly a fan of our guy's sassy tone, gets all worked up and in a fit of frustration, whips out his sword. He extends his hand, and suddenly, his sword starts emitting this weird green glow from the tip. Our dude, not one to back down, gets into stance, activates the spirit sword execution move, and invites him to come. But before these two can throw down, out of nowhere, there's this dramatic entrance. Out of nowhere, a dude drops from the sky, crashes into the ground so hard it probably left a dent, and commands them to chill for a hot minute. Taking a closer look, the guy before them seems ancient, carrying a sword that could probably double as a skyscraper. He tells the young guns to cool it and lend him an ear. Looks like our lad's face-off party just got a surprise guest, and this old man is about to spill some wisdom or drop a truth bomb. While Mr. Stewart's anxiety levels shoot through the roof, he quickly adopts a posture of respect. It's crystal clear that the dude dropping from the heavens is no ordinary Joe, he's the big shot, Elder Q. Not only is Mr. Cocky Pants taken aback, but even the lackeys are in a state of shock. Turns out this skydiving elder is no small fry. He's Elder Q Kangyun of the Kaiyun sect, a grandmaster at the first stage of the Grandmaster realm. And hold on to your hats, the Kaiyun sect is no backyard club, it's a high and mighty sect with a bunch of top-tier martial king realm powerhouses. Casually playing with his hair, this old fart spills the tea on why he's crashing the party. Apparently, he's here to cash in a favor for our lad, not to mention he's got a serious offer on the table. So he drops the serious bomb, he's wondering if our lad might be keen on joining the Kaiyun sect. In that instant, the cocky guy and his lackeys find themselves in a state of total dismay. Their shock is justified, though, because it's believed that the Kaiyuan sect only takes in disciples once in a century, and getting through the entrance exam is like trying to squeeze through a needle hole. The common belief is that Elder Q wouldn't just drop by for a casual recruitment drive, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Yet, amidst the general dismay, the cocky guy clings to the idea that this is a golden opportunity, and no one would dare to turn it down. Much to his surprise, our hero goes against all his expectations. Without a second thought, he turns down the offer, making it clear that he's not interested. He casually mentions how he's always found joy in disciplining not only people but dogs as well. The cocky guy, hit with the reality of being compared to a dog, loses his cool completely. He snatches his swords and lunges toward our lad in a fit of rage. But just as the clash seems inevitable, the elderly figure steps between them, bringing the whole show to a screeching halt. He firmly stops the cocky guy's charge and asks if he failed to comprehend what he has just said. With a gaze that could turn stone into dust, the old-timer goes on to inquire if the motherfucker before him has any intention of becoming an enemy to the Kaiyun sect. The cocky bastard, clearly overwhelmed by the intense aura that the old-timer is radiating, starts contemplating if this is the genuine presence of a Grandmaster Realm Master. Fear creeping in, he hastily conveys that he's not looking for any trouble. Swallowing his pride, the cocky guy puts his sword back in its sheath, deciding it's wise to call it a day. Before parting ways, though, he throws a warning at our lad. With a scowl, he threatens that if our hero ever sets foot in Kingyong County again, he'll be gunning for his head. After delivering his ominous warning, the cocky guy sternly orders his lackeys to move along. But just as he's about to make a swift exit, my man, exuding an aura of authority, throws a curve ball. In a moment that redefines surprise, our hero, surrounded by an enigmatic energy, starts fading from his current spot. In a blink, he reappears behind the cocky bastard. Before the guy can even react, our lad, standing poised, coolly states that before leaving, he should offer the hand that caused harm to his father. The cocky guy whirls around, only to realize he's already fucked. In an instant, our hero grabs the offending hand, swiftly twisting it around. The sheer force is overwhelming, shattering the ground beneath the cocky bastard as he writhes in pain. The bastard does nothing but clench his injured hand, unleashing screams that could rival a donkey's braying. In his fury, he swiftly turns toward our boy, a wild animal fierceness in his eyes. Unfazed, the lad remains cool and offers a sincere apology for any misunderstanding. Seeking to rectify his previous mistake, our hero decides to balance the scales by taking the other hand. 
In the blink of an eye, he lunges forward like a flash, and before the dude can comprehend it, he's already lost his second hand. With both hands now acquired, our hero casually gives the go-ahead for the cocky guy to leave. Stuck in a humiliated stupor, the poor guy is frozen in the same posture. The old-timer, standing by, offers a piece of advice, suggesting it would be wise for the cocky guy not to fight back unless he's eager for another round of pain. Trembling in both pain and fear, the poor guy manages to summon enough strength to issue a feeble warning. He vows to etch the shame of today in his memory. With the support of his lackeys, he struggles to stand and declares that he'll repay our lad twice as much in the future. Unfazed by the threats, my man stands tall, calmly reminding the cocky guy of his position and asserting that he's not qualified to do any harm. And so, the lackeys, along with their master, take flight, hastily departing from the E family household. His father, still standing and supported by a servant, turns to his son, expressing relief that he returned in time, sparing them from unimaginable consequences. Grateful, he then turns to the elderly figure, thanking him for timely intervention. The elderly gentleman, ever modest, dismisses the need for formality. In a surprising twist, it turns out that the lady our lad saved earlier is an acquaintance of the old-timer. He's here on her behalf to express gratitude to young Master Yi for saving her life. The old-timer extends his hand, holding a badge of sorts, and offers it to our lad. He explains that it's a token, and if our hero ever decides to change his mind and wants to join the Caillou insect, he can use this badge to exempt himself from the test and directly become a member. Considering the opportunity to train with such a formidable sect, our hero contemplates the upcoming unsealing of the secret Black Moon. The idea of exploring the forest before departing becomes increasingly appealing. After careful consideration, he accepts the badge, expressing gratitude to the old-timer for the token and the potential change of mind it represents. Deep down, he realizes that to increase his cultivation quickly, he'll need to accumulate more experience points. With this badge, he sees it as an alternative path for the future, a potential option when the time is right for his journey to take a new turn. With a subtle announcement of his departure, the old-timer is surrounded by an arcane blue energy that gradually engulfs him. In the blink of an eye, he vanishes into the ethereal blue energy, leaving our lad alone in its wake. In the aftermath, one of the household servants, still on his knees, reports to his master. He reveals that there were no casualties among the clan members during the incident. However, those who intended to join the secret Black Moon before are seriously injured, and at the moment, they're in no position to participate when it opens seven days from now. Just when everyone thought it was over, our boy extended his hand with a confident grin. A shimmering aura starts to glitter on his palm, and out of nowhere, a box appears, leaving onlookers astounded. As if that wasn't enough, he summons numerous giant boxes containing elixirs, once again leaving everyone utterly astonished. His dad, all curious, asks where the heck he got all this stuff. Our guy, still rocking that cool grin, says it's just a stroke of luck. Little does everyone know, he's practically the elixir hoarder from the horse riding gang. He stashed them in his system inventory like snacks for later. Standing tall like the elixir wizard he is, he spills the beans that these potions aren't just for patching up bruises. They're like turbo boosters for breaking through realms. The whole household goes nuts, cheering for their master because, finally, everyone's getting a ticket to the secret Black Moon party. Fast forward seven days, and here we are, in the midst of the Black Moon mountain range. The first thing catching our eyes is a massive crack in the ground, shrouded in mist like smoke. Amidst that mist, there's our lad, leading his crew toward the entrance of the secret Black Moon. The entrance itself feels like the mouth of a black hole, ominous and intriguing. Our guy marches forward with his crew, and they finally come to a stop right before the entrance, standing at the threshold of the secret Black Moon. Just as they're about to step into the entrance, a sudden voice halts their movements. When the scene shifts we get to see an old-timer with a dick-like hat, Zhu Yanlei, a sixth-stage key blood realm master and standing beside him is Zhu Xin, the young master of the Zhu family and Zhu Yanlei's son. With a sly glint in his eyes, the old-timer questions why the Grand Patriarch of the Yi family isn't present. With a firm stance, my man's father steps forward and casually informs him that the trash has been removed from this family. Amidst this tense encounter, a hulking figure resembling a gorilla steps forward, challenging the assumption that the great Yi family is on the decline. This giant is Zhen Yinfeng, a seventh-stage key blood realm master and the head of the Zhen family. Beside him stands a man who seems to have the demeanor of a mouse, Zhen Tianlong, Zhen Yinfeng's son but the old-timer casually fires back, saying they've upgraded the team this time and don't need the special care from before. And then, to spice things up, the old-timer brings up some past drama where the Zhen family's goons supposedly beat up the Yi family members. But here's the twist. He spins it like the Yi family was under a beast attack, and if not for their help, it would have been game over for the Yi crew. The secret Black Moon is turning into a mix of showdown and drama, and we're just getting started. Then, the old-timer goes on about some past drama where Zhen's lackeys supposedly handed the Yi family a beating. But instead of spilling the real tea, he spins it. According to him, the Yi family faced a beast attack last year in the secret Black Moon, and if it weren't for the Zhen crew, they'd be six feet under. However, my man isn't the type to get all worked up over some seemingly tasteless teasing. 
Instead, he fires back with a confident grin, telling the old-timer he's got it all wrong. They still need that special care. But here's the twist. Our lad and his crew start radiating this intense aura, hitting those standing in front of them like a tidal wave of surprise, leaving them totally dumbfounded. That's when our boy drops the bomb. This year, it's the Zhen family that's in for some special care. Those fellas, one with a dick-like hat and the other a buff gorilla, are totally overwhelmed. Turns out, the motherfuckers standing before them are all at the third and fourth stage of the key blood realm. The gorilla's jaw practically hits the floor, processing how the Yi family members busted through the realms in just a few days. Our lad, rocking a mischievous grin, casually asks why these two numbskulls are so surprised, throwing a reminder their way to just unseal the secret moon already. Gorilla guy, clearly not thrilled about being looked down upon, issues a cautionary warning. He makes it clear that after entering the secret black moon, we'll see who's the real deal. Our lad, always up for a challenge, casually accepts and tells them to proceed. Right then, the gorilla, our lad's father, and the old-timer with the dick hat start prepping their keys to unseal the black moon dungeon. With a unified aura, they throw their energy towards the black moon gates, enchanting the word unseal. Suddenly, a giant hole, glimmering with light, unfolds before everyone, making them look like pebbles in a grand fountain. Blue Boy Zhuxing, the young master of the Zhu family, a fourth-stage key blood realm dude, eagerly takes the first step, along with his lackeys, into the gate. And, of course, there's another gorilla guy, Zhen Tianlong, master of the Zhen family, rocking the fifth stage of the key blood realm. Eager as ever, he makes it clear he won't let anyone get a head start and marches towards the gate with his lackeys. Meanwhile, our lad, maintaining that disciplined vibe, doesn't charge forward like a thirsty hound. He calls his party firmly, signaling them to move. Following his lead, everyone jumps into the hole, shimmering with a bright light. Finally, they all arrive in the interior of the secret black moon. The first thing that catches their eyes is a peculiar moon hanging in the sky. Our young man, along with his lackeys, takes their first steps on the surface of the secret black moon grounds. They quickly notice that the atmosphere here is saturated with abundant spiritual energy. The lackeys are pretty amused, realizing that if they use those special spirit herbs to aid their cultivation, their strength is bound to shoot through the roof. They're all genuinely thankful for their master, who paved the way for them. Without him, they couldn't have reaped such a full harvest today. And just by looking at our man's face, it's clear he's satisfied seeing his lackeys happy. Suddenly, our boy's attention is caught by an abrupt notification that pops up, saying there are many sacred treasures a kilometer to the northwest. Intrigued by the guidance of the system that promises an easy treasure hunt, our lad immediately signals his party to follow. They've got to reach the treasures before sundown, and his lackeys eagerly agree. In the next moment, the lackeys part ways, each on their path for the treasure hunt. Meanwhile, the purple dude, standing at a distance and watching our lad's party move away, finds it amusing how fast these guys are. One of his lackeys suggests they should speed up, or the Yu family might snatch the treasure. But the purple dude has a different plan. Instead of hunting treasures himself, he wants to use these guys as scapegoats to scout ahead. If there's danger, they deal with it. And as for the treasure, he believes that if he waits until the last minute, and then takes them out, the loot will be all his. However, one of the lackeys raises a question that requires valid attention. He wonders if, if they kill their master here, won't the Yu family go after them? With an evil laugh, the purple dude explains that this secret territory is filled with crises and beasts, and there would be no proof for anyone if they had killed their master. The entire crew, finding their seemingly dumb master's words surprisingly wise, immediately gains a posture of respect. Meanwhile, the idiot thinks that as long as they claim a beast did it, no one would know they killed him. The thought gets immediately interrupted by our man himself, who is now standing behind the purple head with a sword at his neck. The lackeys, all worked up and ready with their swords, demand our boy to release their young master. Now, here is where it gets interesting. This poor guy, thinking his fancy title as the young master of the Zhao family makes him untouchable, remains cocky as ever. But our lad's got a different script. He casually swings his sword, leaving the poor bastard stumbling and falling with a severe cut on his throat. His sword goes flying through the air as he crumbles, leaving the lackeys bewildered by the sudden turn of events. My man just stands there, calling them a bunch of weaklings, and casually whips his sword around. The impact of his whip, without breaking a sweat, sends everyone flying back, just from the sheer force. The purple head gets his first lesson, but despite the dose of humiliation, it appears that he is not satisfied. On the ground, he confronts our boy, demanding to know who he dared to hurt. But our man could not care less about the purple head's social status. With a stern tone, he makes it clear that he not only dares to hurt, but also has the intention of killing him. And just right there those words hang in the air, surrounded by a thick aura of malice. However the poor bastard, asking for more beating, starts to stand up with his sword in hand. Despite his neck oozing blood, he makes it clear that if our lad dares to kill him today, his father will never spare him and when the time comes, he will want the entire Yi family six feet under. Our boy, hand on chin, pretends to mull over the danger the purple head mentioned. But, you know, he is quick to clear the air, so he reveals that Zhu family will not have proof he offed him. 
And there it is, Purplehead's grand plans backfiring, leaving him sweating bullets. Although, let us be real, by the looks of his face his tough guy act still intact. Our lad, towering above him, casually brings up his earlier words. Secret territory, full of crises and beasts. As long as he says it is the beasts who did the deed, no trouble for him. Nobody will know who pulled the trigger. And right there, the purple head's muscles tighten up like he has got some serious constipation going on. In the following moment, he starts crawling, horrified by our man's not-so-friendly intentions. Unfortunately for our crawling friend, the writers decided to wrap up his tail right then and there. Our man grabs him by the head, evil grin in place, and channels some dark energy straight into his brain. The poor guy's tormented, blood gushing from his agape mouth like his mind's melting away. In the following scene, we are somewhere in the secret moon's interior, and the first thing we see is a wolf-boar hybrid, basking under the moon and letting out a howl. But unfortunately, there is someone else around, slashing those poor bastards like they are cucumbers. As the scene zooms out we see a bunch of ponytail guys, surrounded by a ton of wolf corpses and after dealing with the last one, they decide it is loot time. One of the lackeys turns to our boy, mentioning that the second grade demonic wolf pack's beast crystals are all collected, and they are good to move forward. Meanwhile, his master's lost in thought, contemplating his progress. Despite devouring the Zhu family's team, breaking through to the fifth level of the Key Blood Realm, he feels like his advancement speed is a tad slow. Suddenly, he checks out his profile and realizes he needs more experience points. Just then, a system notification pops up, surprising him. It spills the beans about a third-grade sacred material nearby, a treasure only obtainable by a Grandmaster Realm Martial Artist. Without wasting a golden opportunity, our man dashes away, leaving his lackeys on standby until he returns. Because, you know, sacred materials wait for no one. Anyway, while our man is dashing, it becomes pretty clear why he left his lackeys behind. Sacred treasures tend to be guarded by ferocious beasts, and he figures it is better for them not to waltz into danger with him. Finally, we have arrived at the secret black moon's bottom cuff. There, we witness bat-like creatures gracefully flying around a tree, as if it is dripping honey. A closer look reveals verdant sacred fruits containing third-grade spirit elixirs. Upon closer inspection, it appears that this is a sanctuary for the bat-like creatures, diligently guarding those fruits from everyone. Our man, standing afar and observing, reveals that these creatures are called gloomy wild bats, a third-grade demonic beast. And of course he is curious about how strong these so-called interior demonic beasts are. Without wasting a moment, he leaps into the air, diving directly toward those sweet experience points dangling in the air. But, of course, upon sensing an oncoming threat, the bats get alarmed and immediately start making waves by screaming their mouths off. Watching those birds doing their sonic attack, our boy decides to counteract. With his own overwhelming screams, he finally manages to momentarily stun them. Sword at the ready, he orders the bats to just die, and starts whipping his sword around, creating waves of dark energy that leave the bats momentarily astray. Taking the opportunity at hand, he dashes straight towards the tree to grab the prize position. However, in a sudden turn of events, the ground starts to give way, and suddenly, a giant coracoid jaw appears before him, seemingly ready to take a bite. Not one to go down easy, my guy dodges the whole getting eaten scenario like a boss. As the scene pans out, it becomes clear that he is smack in the middle of a bunch of third grade demonic gators with black scales. Without wasting a beat, he ditches his sword and grabs it with his feet, launching himself forward. Using his time stomping move, he crashes down on those poor gators like a meteor, leaving chaos behind. He jumps back up, taking flight on his sword, and tosses it down at the monsters with the speed of light. The thing slashes through them like a missile, and like a boss, it comes right back to his hand. Then he busts out his glow sword technique, summoning a bunch of artificial blades. These swords whip around him so fast that he starts floating in the air, turning into a practical drill that blows the monsters away with just a touch. All the creatures around him get trapped in this tornado of swords, and as it devours more of them, it just keeps getting bigger and badder. After a good dance with his sword, he swings it, putting an end to the show, and now those individual swords start piercing and cutting through the poor creatures. Once the job's done, my man casually lands on the ground, not a scratch on him and a satisfied look on his face. Meanwhile, the dead creatures rain down around them, brutally dealt with. After making sure they are good and dead, he decides it is snack time. And of course, immediately, the system window pops up, notifying him that the system is gearing up for a mass devouring. In just a blink, the mass devouring is completed, and my man scores a whopping 500,000 experience points just like that. Hitting that half million XP goal surprisingly triggers another pleased response from the system. It announces that my man has broken through to the seventh stage of the Key Blood Realm, standing tall on a high rock, surrounded by a bunch of system windows. While gazing at those windows, a satisfied grin spreads across his face, making it clear that my man is quite pleased with his snack that helped him cultivate two levels simultaneously. Finally, he stands before the verdant sacred fruit tree, convinced that they are all his for the taking. However, it does not look like it is going to be that easy. We can clearly see there is a giant, weapon headed his way from behind. A giant ball drops straight to the ground before our lad's feet, shattering the ground beneath it. 
When our boy turns around, it becomes clear that it is one of the barbarians, holding onto his weapon and getting all cocky. He brazenly threatens our lad, claiming that they are all his and orders him to scram. My man, confidently grinning, asserts his authority and asks if the barbarian knows who he is dealing with. Clearly not pleased by the arrogance, the barbarian marches towards him with fierce speed, brandishing his weapon in a fit of rage. Unfazed, our boy stands still despite the oncoming threat. But as it appears, the weapon has halted its movements, and there seems to be a shield protecting the lad and this is where he asks that motherfucker if this is all he has got. Meanwhile, the guy on the other side remains motionless, wondering what the fuck is happening. In that very moment, my guy moves so quickly that it feels like his shadow is the one in motion. Approaching the guy, he gives a slight tap on his chest. And with that, the guy and his weapon go soaring through the air, surpassing the speed of sound itself. Blood spills from his mouth as he takes an unplanned flight, directly hitting the wall and shattering it upon impact. His lackeys, standing at a distance, are left dumbfounded, witnessing their master soaring through the air with just a single push. Just then my man, exuding an aura of authority, makes it crystal clear that anyone messing with his stuff is signing up for an express one-way ticket to the afterlife. On the flip side, our tough guy, despite tasting the dust, surprisingly remains on his senses. And by the looks of his face it's clear that he is determined to send our boy into the afterlife. He starts to stand up, visibly pissed off. In his hand, he holds some sort of red glowing candy with the potential to turn the tides. In the following moment, he swiftly gulps down the candy. Suddenly, our boy's attention is grabbed by something, and from the look on his face, it is evident that whatever he is witnessing is not quite pleasant. Of course, it is the bastard who just took a boost from the pills. Now, his veins popping out and a broad grin etched on his face clearly suggests that the dude has undergone some serious buffing up. Standing there, he intensely emits a red aura, his body seemingly on the verge of exploding at any moment. The sheer aura he exudes makes the surroundings crackle, and debris levitates. The once beaten up puny bastard, now jacked up, stands defiantly in front of our boy, and confidently makes it clear to our lad that he will surely meet his end today. The lackeys, clearly pleased by their master's sudden buff, wear grins on their faces. One of them wonders aloud if their master has just devoured that thing. The other chimes in, explaining that their master consumed a second-grade key blood elixir, which briefly boosts strength by three times. With this newfound confidence, they are convinced their master will emerge victorious. The gorilla, wielding his gigantic weapon, swings it to build momentum. Positioned menacingly before our lad, he assumes the role of a devil poised to deal a lethal blow. However the gorilla generously offers one last chance for mercy. If our boy were to kneel and acknowledge him as father, his life might be spared. However, the young man, fearless and brimming with confidence, dismisses the offer and encourages the gorilla to savor his last moments, as he is destined to face his father in the depths of hell soon. Meanwhile, we are back outside the secret black moon, where three masters from their respective families stand before the gate, eagerly anticipating their party's arrival. As the camera shifts, we catch a glimpse of our lad's father, and the worry on his face is evident. Of course, the old-timer chimes in, cheekily asking the father if he is concerned about his son's safety. And to make his father further worried, the dickhead expresses that there are many monsters inside that frequently leave people injured. He adds that even without running into demonic beasts, there are still fights between teams competing for the secret treasures. The gorilla standing beside them bursts into laughter after hearing the dickhead talk, and adds that it is indeed true. They're all on their own, and if they get hurt or lose their lives, it is because they are too weak. The dickhead, in an attempt to intensify the worry of our boy's father, gravely adds that the rules were laid down by their old ancestors, and they must abide by them. He expresses fake concern, saying that if our lad gets into trouble, he hopes his father will not hold any grudge. Surprisingly, the boy's father shows no sign of worry on his face. Instead, he reveals that the dickhead is right and admits genuine concern for his son. However, he drops a jaw-dropping revelation that leaves both buffoons staring blankly. The father adds that he is not so much worried about his son's safety as he is about the safety of others. With a firm smile, he reveals his belief that his son is having so much fun lately that he has no regard for his enemies and does not want to stop at any cost. Amidst their heated conversation, their attention is suddenly hijacked by the secret Black Moon's door. The duo, the dickhead, and the gorilla are left in disbelief, as if they have just witnessed a ghost materialize before them. Shifting the camera, we catch sight of a group of guys, clearly on the brink of death, getting thrown out of the door like yesterday's trash. The gorilla guy, spotting his son flying out of the cave, exclaims in worry. Before he can react, his son lands on his feet, visibly injured, with blood shooting out of his mouth. As the other lackeys of his team are being tossed out, his father specifically grabs his injured son, possibly on the brink of unconsciousness. In a worried tone, he asks who did this to him. However, it seems the lad is not in any position to offer much of a reply. With his last remaining breath, all he manages to convey is that he is in pain. Struggling with a stuttering voice, he finally musters the strength to tell his concerned father that it was Yi Yun, our boy, who messed him up. His father gently places his hand over his son's body, only to discover that all of his bones are practically shattered. As our boy enters the scene, a broad grin etching on his face, 
He stands there like the hero of a movie, to get under the gorilla's skin. He cheekily states that his son was crying inside, so he kindly brought him out to see his father. Of course, the barbarian had gone unconscious before his father's eyes, and that left the gorilla burning with the desire to take our boy down. His face etched with anger, makes it abundantly clear that our lad will pay with his life. Meanwhile, the dickhead is more concerned about his own son. Raising his voice, he asks our lad why he is out of the secret realm and where his son is. My man replies, reminding the dickhead of his own words. He points out that he failed to give his boy special treatment because the secret realm is so dangerous that he cannot take good care of them. But the old-timer raises his voice further, accusing the young man of plotting against his son. At that very moment, the he turns to the gorilla guy who is just walking out of the scene, and asks him to join forces to teach this brat a lesson. However, it seems his desperate pleas will not help him. The father turns to the old-timer and reminds him of his own words about adhering to the rules set by the ancestors. The old-timer is practically fuming with anger, and you can see he is on the verge of losing it. He then starts exuding pure malice, and makes it loud and clear that he is planning to end this brat's life today. Sure enough, it becomes clear that the young man will not be the one ending up six feet under because my man has already approached the old fart and grabbed him by the throat. With a death grip on the old man's throat, our lad delivers a crystal clear message. If you do not want to play by the rules, do not expect him to play nice either. Then, he tightens his grip, crushing the old man's throat as if it were a cucumber, blood splattering everywhere, and that neck giving a sickening crack. And just to make things spicier, the gorilla dude, witnessing this horror show, looks totally terrified, probably realizing our lad does not mess around. In the following scene, the once arrogant old timer lies on the ground, mouth wide open, drowned in his own blood. The young man casually turns to the gorilla, thanking him for waiting and making it clear that it is now his turn to taste the sauce. Of course, the gorilla is not a fan of the young man's arrogance. In a fit of rage, he signs up for his one-way ticket to hell, charging at the boy with his weapon ready. He swings his weapon, aiming for the boy, but unsurprisingly, the young man effortlessly evades the attack with just a single whip of his sword. The gorilla, frustrated, attempts another attack from behind, ready to crush our boy. But, predictably, our lad smoothly dodges the incoming strike with his sword. And in the blink of an eye, the young man vanishes from his original position, leaving the gorilla dumbfounded and in disbelief. The boy is now airborne, and the gorilla is left questioning how this seemingly puny brat managed to dodge his attack in an instant. Midair once again, my man whips his sword, producing dark energy that directly clashes with the gorilla's defenses. While doing so, he casually mentions that the reason he dodged that attack was simply because the gorilla is just moving too slow. Meanwhile the gorilla, getting crushed under the pressing force against him, struggles to keep up. The next moment, they come face to face, and my man asks if that is all this giant skulled gorilla's got. At that very moment, some sort of dark energy reaches the gorilla, who is standing on the ground. To his bewilderment, his spear just shatters in his hands, leaving him defenseless. Seizing the opportunity, my man starts to whip his sword around, and the energy waves it produces slice down the gorilla into a thousand pieces, leaving him covered in a bloodbath. As our boy touches the ground again, the gorilla falls, and the lackeys standing there could not help but recognize their master's prowess. Surprisingly, the stubborn gorilla has not died yet. His face etching with frustration, with a trembling voice, he expresses his disbelief that he would be defeated by a brat. There, lying on the ground, kissing the dust, and suddenly, he starts preaching about how the three great families had this century-long harmony in Bayan City, and now the Yi family messed it all up. As our boy strolls over, the dude on the ground is grappling with the impending doom. And to save his skin, he comes up with this grand idea. He suggests that if spared today, he will be the Yi family's loyal lapdog and even promises to pull some strings in the Zhu family for our boy. Well, turns out, our young hero does not need any help in the negotiation department. He calmly agrees that the three great families had their time in harmony in Bayan City for too long. But, he drops the bombshell. From now on, there is only one top dog in town, and that is the Yi family. Despite being on the ground, the gorilla guy cannot help but seethe in frustration at this audacious declaration. To cool this hot-headed dude down, our boy throws a little reminder that the Zhu and Zhang families have been messing with his Yi family for years through secret trails, and he has not forgotten any of it. Right in that moment, our guy raises his hand, summoning the usual dark energy. Given the cozy relationship between Zhu and Zheng, he figures it is best to send both family heads straight to the depths of hell together. The gorilla's eyes widen as he sees the devilish hand approaching. The next thing you know, the entire area echoes with intense screams of agony, and just like that, our once proud gorilla is lying lifeless on the ground. In the following scene, it is the middle of the night, and we can clearly see a towering Chinese architectural building located in Baiyuan City, Zhu's mansion. Outside the gate, we see guards stand on duty, armed with sharp weapons. A voice from inside the door echoes a caution about fire and candles in the hot weather, as it is already midnight. In the next scene, someone violently walks, leaving their footsteps echoing throughout the area. As the scene shifts we see a jacked up guy looking tough, and it appears to be Han Lai, at the eighth stage of the Key Blood Realm and the second in command of the Wild Horse Gang. 
without exchanging pleasantries, he raises his voice inside the courtroom, addressing the person sitting before him, asking how long he has to be on standby. The man being shouted is clad in purple, sits calmly before the jacked up guy. He is Zhao Tianhao, the fifth stage of the Key Blood Realm and Zhu Yuanel's brother. While sipping on a glass, the purple guy calmly asks the commander to calm down and mentions that their master has not given any signal yet. He suggests that they might have to wait a little longer. The jacked up guy, getting all worked up, expresses frustration. He reminds the purple head that since they have hired the wild horse gang, he should know they can easily take down the Zhang and Yi families. He questions if he is doubting their capabilities. The guy in purple makes it clear that nobody doubts the wild horse gang's strength and trusts their martial arts abilities. However, he reveals that to keep things on track, they must wait for their master's plan to succeed before making a move. Though we remain oblivious to what they are plotting, let us hope to soon find out. Later, in a moment, we learn that each family has selected the elites to seize the treasure in the secret realm. Their plan unfolds. Once the secret Black Moon's treasure hunt is over, the Zhang family will let their guard down. At that very moment, the purple-headed guy intends to send his master, who happens to be the dickhead. They plan to deliver a fatal blow to Zhang Yinfeng's gorilla-like master. Simultaneously, the purple guy plans to march with his army. After triumphing over the Zhang family, he believes the Yi family would be no match for them. Then they just need to eliminate the masters of the two families and their main forces. By achieving that, the remaining household members are expected to obediently obey them. Though, regardless of their planning, one thing is clear, the Yi family has already triumphed over every family, and these idiots are just not aware of it right now. Anyway, the wild horse commander, after digesting the idiotic plan, finally takes a chill pill. He then shoots a look at the purple dude and calls out the dirty tricks those so-called prestigious righteous folks are pulling. He firmly believes their schemes are more direct than anything the wild horse gang could come up with. The purple head, with that snarky grin, fires back, saying it does not matter how shady the means are, as long as they get the job done. However, but, he drops a little bomb, expressing worry that if the mayor gets wind of their plan, they might need the wild horse commander to take the fall. The commander, riding high on confidence, smirks and reassures the purple head not to worry, as the wild horse gang is here for the paycheck, and they will handle the rest. However, out of nowhere, he swiftly unsheathes his sword. With a serious tone and a tight grip on his weapon, he declares that his saber craves blood and will not be held back when the killing starts. The purple head responds, saying that if Commander Han can help him take down the Zhang and Yi families cleanly today, he would be more than happy to let the blood flow. No reason to hold back the commander from spilling some. Thinking he is all that, the commander proudly says he is going to show them the wild horse gang's prowess. Suddenly, out of the blue, our boy drops down like he is descended from hell and boldly claims that wiping out the E family is a no-go. Oblivious to the surprise guest, the cocky commander demands to know who the fuck he is. The purple head spills the beans, saying he is the young master of the E family. Both idiots draw their swords, and their faces telling us they are downright terrified because they did not even see him coming. The purple head takes the lead, lunging forward for the first strike. Our boy effortlessly leaps into the air, dodging their desperate attacks. In a swift motion, he whips his sword around, releasing a surge of dark energy that smacks the commander right on his forehead. With the commander writhing on the ground, blood oozing, our lad delivers a swift kick to the purple head's belly, leaving him coughing up dark blood, and sliding across the ground. After both masters bite the dust, why do the lackeys just stay on standby? No, they decide it is revenge time and start lunging towards our boy. Our boy, gliding through the air like some kind of phoenix, makes it crystal clear that no one will live to see another day today. With that, the mansion echoes with screams and the moans of men dying left and right. Revenge does not seem to be on the menu today. The purple head, despite getting beaten, surprisingly starts to run outside, shouting if someone is here. But to his dismay, no one is here to heed his call, and everyone is just laying on the ground like beaten up sacks of potatoes. Another man drops down before him, startling him as he stumbles on the ground. The man, finally getting cold feet, is totally terrified, wondering how the fuck is this even possible. The young man arrives with a sly grin, startling the purple head. With a cunning smile and fierce eyes, he makes it clear that all of the men have gone down to hell. As the scene zooms out, we see the entire courtyard of the mansion filled with the lifeless bodies of the dead lackeys. Still standing tall, my man drops the truth bomb that the Zhu family, the Zhang family, and the wild horse gang messed up big time. Not once, not twice, but thrice. The purple head already scared out of his wits, decides to pull a ninja move and tosses a blade at my man. Cute. But those blades are like tickles to someone on our lad's level. He stops at midair like it is no biggie. With a sly grin, he casually mentions their first mistake. They should not have tangled with the mighty Yi family. The poor boy is just sweating bullets, realizing that his death is inevitable at this point. My man casually crushes the blade with his bare hands, turning it into rubble. While doing so, he schools the guy on his second mistake it was thinking he is entitled to mess with the Yi family. Dropping truth bombs, he highlights the third mistake, crossing paths with the one and only vindictive Yi Yun. 
clearly terrified. In a desperate attempt, the purple head tells him that if he kills him today, the mayor will definitely pursue the matter, and then the E family will be in grave danger. But guess what? My man could not care less. He casually swings his sword, and with that single strike purple head bites the dust, face first, in a pool of his own oozing blood. Once he is done dealing with the purple head, his father, along with other household members, arrives at the scene. His father, visibly concerned, calls out his name. In response, the young man tells his old man that he will have to take care of the rest, as he is heading to the Zhang family to finish the remaining unfinished work. Looking at our boy the entire household is visibly concerned, wondering if this is the same master they once knew. His father in specific expresses worry, noting that lately, our young man seems to be having a lot of fun beating the daylights out of others and shows no sign of stopping. Three days later, we see the young man, along with his father, standing in a grand room. There, household members are gathering treasure in one place. Although it is still unknown how they amass so much treasure, but we hope to soon find out about the treasures they have gathered. While standing there the household butler reveals the news that the forces of the Zhu and Zheng families involved in the assassination of the Yi family disciples have been purged. And nowadays, all the clans in Bayan City are giving a nod to the Yi family, like they are the big shots in town. And later in moment it turns out the mountain of wealth they have got is the result of some intense raids on other houses. Yeah, they went all in. Our dude, with a smirk in his voice, throws some thanks at the butler for his hard work and in response, the old man firmly accepts the gratitude. Then, his father gets serious. He lays a hand on the lad's shoulder and spills about how close they were to biting the dust this time. If not for our boy's quick moves, the Yi family would have been history in Bayan City. Just when things seem to be calming down, some dude comes sprinting their way like there is a storm about to hit. And by the looks of it, there is some crazy shit about to happen. Just as he enters the room, the young lad falls to the ground due to his franticness and immediately spills the news that the mayor has invited our boy to the mayor's residence for questioning. In the following scene, we see flowers blooming into a water pond, and nearby we hear someone guiding our lad to the mayor's residence, who has been eagerly waiting to meet my man for a long time. The first glimpse of our lad reveals guards standing in front of him, making it clear that the mayor is not some small fry. In the distance, the young man's gaze falls on the old man basking under the sunlight. There is seemingly a young girl carrying the old man's wheelchair. She informs her father that the person has arrived. Of course, my man stands in the posture of utmost respect and introduces himself. Before he can finish exchanging pleasantries, the scene pauses. And the next thing we see a bunch of sharp daggers coming his way. But fear not, my man has easily dodged those sharp needles as they pose no threat to him whatsoever. Our boy, startled but with a stern expression and a polite tone, inquires about the meaning of all this. The old man, resting his hand on the wheelchair, seemingly commends our boy for having good martial arts and quick reflexes. As the scene zooms out, we see a striking old man sitting on his wheelchair, his name is Fang Lai. He boasts the first stage of the Grand Master Realm, serving as the mayor of Bayan City. He is seemingly accompanied by a sweet young lady, Fang Yalin, who is at the ninth stage of the Key Blood Realm and is also known to be the mayor's daughter. Meanwhile, the mayor sitting on his wheelchair reminds our lad how he reached the ninth stage of the Key Blood Realm at such a young age and fully acknowledges his abilities, stating that it was no surprise our lad managed to annex the two great families. Our boy, while holding on to the mayor's sharp needles that were thrown at him, sternly inquires if the mayor is raising an offense. The old man, despite sitting on his wheelchair, with a stern tone and expression, replies that what would our lad do if it is true. No nonsense from our boy. He lays out the truth that those two families were plotting against the Yi family and inquires if the Yi family should have stood still and not fought back. The young man goes on questioning the mayor's beliefs and states that single-minded tolerance would only made him an object of slaughter. Our lad, cutting through the tension with a knife, drops the bomb by suggesting that if the mayor cannot catch the drift, maybe it is time for a new mayor. The air gets thicker than grandma's soup with those words. Old man Fang, feeling the sting of humiliation, shoots our boy a death stare that could melt ice. And this is when their eyes lock in a battle of glares that could set the room on fire. In the middle of this eye showdown, it is like they are throwing ninja stars at each other with their eyes. The drama's hitting peak levels. Suddenly, the old man's head starts throbbing, probably from the intensity of their stare off. He calls for the eye drops, revealing it is not a headache but dry eyes. Classic old timer move. Meanwhile, our lad is standing there, clueless about this ocular drama unfolding. Mayor Fang spills the tea, admitting he is too old for power moves because his body cannot handle his real energy. He tells our boy not to be offended, and our man, weirded out but playing it cool, says no problem. The old man, now back to his usual self, commends our boy for his bravery. He wants to make it crystal clear that he never intended to question our lad in the first place. Extending his hands in a gesture of goodwill, the old man, reflecting on recent scenarios, summarizes by stating that he has ordered a thorough investigation into the Yi family's incident with the Zhu and Zheng families. The old man seems to know the score. Those two families kicked off the mess and even teamed up with the Wild Horse Gang to take down the Yi family. With those two families out of the picture, the old man's pretty content. 
and with that the old man is about to spill the beans about the main reason he has summoned our boy and as it turns out, the old timer got a favor to ask, a little mission for our lad. The old man gets straight to the point. He wants our boy to be the knight in shining armor and escort his daughter, Yulin, to the Kaiyun sect in Kingyong County. And of course, keep her safe using those impressive abilities of his. The revelation drops like a bomb, and both our boy and the lady nearby are equally shocked. Looks like this was not common knowledge, and the poor lady had no idea what she was getting into. Our boy's mental gears start turning. He recalls that old man he met recently who dropped some hints about this sect business. Meanwhile, the young lady, not too thrilled with her father for springing this surprise, gives him a stern talking to. She reminds him of a promise he made, not to send her away. And now, she wants to know why he is breaking that promise by sending her off to the Kaiyun sect. Her dad, laying the truth bombs, gently reminds his daughter that she is not a kid anymore. He points out that his health is not on the top charts, and he cannot be her personal caretaker forever. He makes it clear that her talent surpasses his own, and there is nothing more he can teach her. He sees the Kaiyun sect as the path that will expedite her growth. Our Lady seems to be processing this information. Our Lady, grasping her father's words, remains eerily silent, giving the impression that she clearly recognizes where he is coming from. The old-timer reassures her that he has found a reliable partner to accompany her. But here comes our guy, interrupting the heartfelt moment with a question, making it clear he has got queries and he is not shy about voicing them. The old man, playing the benefit yourself card, points out that joining the Kaiyun sect will be a golden ticket for our boy. He emphasizes that our lad's personal strength is top-notch, earning the favor of the sect leader. However, he stresses the point that relying solely on him has its limits, the old man paints a vivid picture. For a short stint, our lad can be the force holding off the two great families, but he firmly believes it is not a long-term fix. He predicts the inevitability of rebellious families cropping up, akin to the Zhao and Zheng families, causing more trouble in the long run. He forces our lad to face the harsh reality that he cannot be the guardian angel of his family forever. Meanwhile the young man remains silent, that clearly suggests that deep down, he understands the logic behind the old man's words. The old man continues, pointing out that there is a variety of martial artists out there, and with our lad's strength and talents, he should not confine himself to the small bay and city. The family might become a hindrance to his personal growth. He emphasizes that the only way to surpass these limitations is by agreeing to his request to protect his daughter during her training. The old-timer vows that, during our lad's time in the sect, he will ensure the Yi family faces no threats or attacks under his mayorship in Bayon City. Our lad, standing firm, expresses his disagreement with the old-timer. He makes it clear that the current Yi family is no longer what it used to be and does not require anyone's protection. He boldly declares that this includes the protection offered by the mayor's mansion itself. Transitioning to the old-timer, a closer look at his face reveals that these words seem to have rattled the very foundation of the old man, leaving an air of tension between them. Following that, the only thing that catches our attention is my man snapping his fingers, conjuring a sword right before the throat of one of the guards at the mayor's mansion. As the scene widens, it becomes apparent that all the guards, caught off guard, are now prisoners of the Yi family. This is where my man starts emanating an aura of authority and offers a casual apology to the old timer, stating that it is just the way things are. And of course the father's princess steps forward in a fit of rage, brandishing her dagger. However, her abrupt movement comes to a halt when one of the young man's lackeys reveals that they have taken control of the entire mayor's mansion. Of course, the lackey earns a nod of appreciation from the lad. Now, we find ourselves outside the mayor's mansion, where the young man and his household members have been patiently waiting, ready to follow the young master's command. They stand prepared, to mess up with their remaining dignity that left he questions the mayor about his thoughts on the strength of the Yi family. He further inquires if they still require someone else's protection and of course the weight of these words leaves both the father and his princess momentarily speechless. This is the moment where the old man finally realizes he is in deep trouble. To his surprise and dismay, all of the young man's lackeys reveal themselves to be at the seventh stage of the key blood realm. The old man starts to feel the chill of fear, realizing their auras were so well hidden that even he failed to notice. My man confidently declares that the former Yi family, which was constantly in infighting and disunity, is no more. He firmly believes that the current Yi family will no longer tolerate being bullied and is determined to become stronger. Well, the old man finally admits he is in deep trouble, letting out a big sigh. So, the young guy turns to the old timer, saying he was right about one thing. The old man, looking all alarmed and curious, jumps in, asking what he is talking about. With a slight head turned toward the old man, the young guy spills the beans. The old-timer was right about there being a bunch of martial arts out there, and it is high time he checks them out. Infuriated, the mayor does not waste a moment. He bluntly declares that since he cannot convince him verbally, he will just have to resort to his trump card. By the looks of our lad's face, somewhere in the back of his mind, he seems quite terrified of the upcoming onslaught. Despite that, he keeps up a tough guy act and just tells the old fart to bring it on. Sure enough, the old-timer uses the world's most dangerous card up his sleeves. Sympathy. Out of nowhere, the old-timer, tears streaming down his cheeks, grabs our man tightly in his grasp. 
to guilt trip the boy. He asks why a strong young man like him is bullying a weak, handicapped person like him. He further adds that he had worked so hard to raise his daughter and questions if he thinks that this is quite easy. He makes it clear that he just wanted to protect her, nothing more, nothing less. Caught off guard by this assault, our man feels embarrassed. But as you know, he is stuck in this emotional ambush and cannot do much about it. To amp up the guilt game, the old man pulls another move, throwing in a shallow threat. He makes it clear that if he cannot promise to take care of my girl, then he will cry to death and hang himself every darn day. Gotta say though, everyone deserves this kind of father-in-law. With no real choice, our dude just goes with the flow, gives the response the old man's fishing for. Then, out of nowhere, the old man pulls a superhero move, zooms back with lightning speed like nothing happened. Our guy's left wondering what kind of superpower juice this old man's sipping. And, of course, the old man casually reminds him that a man's gotta keep his word, and he is banking on him to look out for his girl, yeah, in the future. The old man, feeling generous, whips out a notebook containing his family's internal martial arts secrets. He reveals that each move uses a masculine and domineering aura, like they are ready to conquer the world. In a flash, the old man tosses the notebook over to our guy, who snags it with ninja-like reflexes. The old man spills the beans that since his little Yalin is a girl so she cannot dive into these moves. So, he is passing the torch to our lad today as a token of gratitude. Flipping through the book, our man spots his name, Vajra Glay's physique. This is where the system notification pops up, throwing a virtual confetti party, congratulating him on snagging the primary martial arts of the earth grade, the Vajra Glay's physique. With a smug glance at his updated profile card, our guy adds this new technique to his martial arts arsenal, racking up another achievement in his ever-expanding list. Our guy, securing his sweet prize, throws a respectful pose and assures the old man that he is all in. He promises to guard the precious martial arts notebook with his life and, no doubt, he will be the impeccable escort for the young lady to the Cayune sect. And of course the old man, wearing an invisible victory grin, finally achieves his mission of making our man willingly comply. The next scene shifts to Kingyong County, with a lively atmosphere, people strolling down the bustling roads, and carts filled with tempting food lining the streets. In the following moment, two men come into our focus. One, with fiery red hair and an eye patch, savoring his sweet chicken. The other, an ordinary-looking boy who his name is Brother Lai, addresses the red-haired one as Brother Wang and inquires why there are so many unfamiliar faces appearing in Kingyong County lately. Brother Wang replies that it is only natural for him not to know if he is not a local, and explains that they are here because the Cayune sect is recruiting disciples. The redhead, while munching on his sweet chicken, further enlightens his non-local friend that the Cayune sect is one of the strongest sects in Kingyong County and several nearby counties. There are many masters here, and now that the sect is openly recruiting disciples, it is attracting martial artists from all around. He contributes more to the conversation by mentioning the rumors surrounding the harsh conditions and challenging tests for recruiting disciples in the Kayun sect. Despite numerous attempts by young men and women to join every year, he reveals the harsh truth that only a few manage to succeed in the end. He spills the beans that not only do you have to navigate through a maze of tests, but even if you manage to crack the code, you will only be labeled as an outside disciple. The real perks and cultivation goodies will be reserved for the elite inner disciples only. After hearing the tales and rumors swirling around the sect, the one with the ponytail decides it is probably best not to dive into that rabbit hole. Instead, a wise move, raise the glass for another toast. Meanwhile, our dynamic duo, the young man and the pretty lady, wrap up their meal, and she casually signals the waiter for the bill. With a mischievous twinkle in her eye, the young lady turns to our guy, teasingly questioning whether he is shaking in his boots after hearing the tales about the sacred Caillou insect. She wonders aloud if he is fretting over the possibility of not making the cut. Unfazed, my man dismisses any notion of fear, responding with a stern inquiry about what being scared even means. Contrary to fear, he reveals an overwhelming sense of excitement about the prospect. Deep in thought, our man reflects that Cayun City is merely a small town in the northern region, and given the prosperity of Kingyang County, he's convinced there is a whirlwind of exciting things awaiting him, and he hopes the Cayun sect will not be another letdown. The young lady, not one to let his ego slide, fires back, reminding him that he is nothing short of an egomaniac. With a tone of warning, she makes it crystal clear, do not let his grandiosity hold her back in the future. Finally, we have arrived at the foothills of Mount King New in Kingyang County. A majestic sight unfolds before us, where we see stairs winding through the mountains, leading upwards. The eager crowd, anticipating the ascent to the sect perched high on Mount King New, is already making their way up. Surprisingly enough, we come to know that the first challenge for these martial artists is to conquer the stone staircase. Our man, strolling with the ease of someone walking on clouds, makes it abundantly clear that he does not see it as a challenge at all. With a booming voice, he shouts out to the pretty lady, eager to hear her thoughts on the task at hand. Meanwhile, it seems the lady is already feeling the strain, audibly humming and showing signs of exhaustion. When she turns her head up, she is utterly astonished to find our boy casually striding far ahead. The look on her face reveals the struggle, she just cannot keep up but pride will not let her be outdone in front of him. 
Playfully, the guy turns around and points out that at her current pace, she might miss the party before it gets dark. Out of the blue, the man grabs the lady's hand, leaving her bewildered and questioning his motives. With a tight grip on her hand and eyes locked, he casually reveals that he is just doing her a favor. The lady, taken aback, starts blushing, envisioning a romantic scenario where she is swept off her feet like a princess. However, for her the reality takes a sharp turn as the man grabs her more like a sack of potatoes than a princess. On the other hand the lady confused and caught off guard, wonders what on earth he is up to. With a serious expression, the man instructs her to grab his hand. Suddenly, he swings her back to gain momentum, and in the blink of an eye, they go soaring through the air, leaving other contestants on the staircase astonished. However, the lady is far from enjoying this unplanned flight and cannot help but scream. And of course the onlookers, left with mouths agape, are astonished by the lightning speed of the flying duo as they pass by in the blink of an eye, while the lady continues her vocal protest cursing and screaming throughout the unexpected journey. Finally, the roller coaster of a journey comes to a halt as they conquer all the stairs. With a sudden stop, he throws her to the ground, leaving the young lady moaning and still recovering from the bizarre experience she just endured. As the birds figuratively spin above her head and she starts to regain her senses, one thing becomes clear. While feeling a bit giddy, she is relieved that they have at least made it to the top. While the duo catches their breath at the end of their journey, seemingly approaching footsteps draw their attention. The scene zooms out to reveal an elderly man congratulating them on passing the first round of the training. Another robust figure stands silently beside him. Later in moment it becomes clear that the elderly man is Zuo Yan, a deacon of the Kaiyuan sect, and the brawny companion is Guo Gang, the second of the Kaiyuan sect. Cutting to the chase, the old man acknowledges that since the duo has reached the mountain, it implies they are here to join the Kaiyuan sect. However, he drops a bombshell. The Kaiyuan sect is not open to just anyone. He explains that disciples must be under the age of 18 and have reached the key blood realm. In the following moment, the muscular monkey introduces the Kaiyuan sect's strength-detecting stone. This remarkable stone before them is capable of determining the ages and cultivation levels of individuals. The muscular monkey reveals that if they fulfill the requirements, the detecting stone will light up, indicating that they meet the criteria. If it does not respond, it means they do not meet the requirements. The other participants, now arriving at the spot, are struck by this revelation. One comments that such expectations are typical of the Kaiyun sect, while another urges everyone to stop whining and get in line. Finally, two hours later, all the people who successfully climbed up the mountain are standing in lines. The elderly man congratulates them for passing the strength-detecting test and officially declares that they are now qualified to join the Kaiyun sect. However, he emphasizes that they cannot become Kaiyun sect disciples without a certain level of strength. The old man seems lost in thought. He contemplates how there are 40 participants present, and it is written all over his face that he is considering cutting down the numbers. So, he gives the signal to the participants for the second trial and gestures for them to follow him. As everyone lines up, our young lady and lad can be seen right at the front. Walking through what looks like a courtyard, people can be seen training around. Finally, they arrive at the martial arts arena of the Kaiyun sect. The muscular monkey raises his hand and points towards a specific direction, indicating that the martial arts arena is their final trial. The one who triumphs in this arena will earn the title of a disciple of the Kaiyun sect. He goes on to explain the rules. Participants are free to engage in combat within the square arena, and the last 20 individuals remaining on the stage will be declared winners. Weapons are allowed, but causing harm to others is strictly forbidden. He ensures that everyone understands the rules, and the resounding yes from all the participants affirms their comprehension. With everyone on the same page, the guy with the big eyebrows officially declares that the trials will commence. Meanwhile, a mysterious figure stands behind a pillar, observing the newly arrived participants. He sees them as just another group of rookies, though his intentions remain unclear. As he contemplates, we are introduced to this person as Han Feng, an outer disciple at the ninth stage of the Qi Blood Realm. Han Feng's fellow disciple, Cheng Ping, also at the ninth stage of the Qi Blood Realm, joins him. Feeling bored, Cheng Ping suggests making a bet among the new participants on who will successfully become a sect member. His attention falls on our young lad, expressing confidence that the kid over there seems promising and would likely make the cut. To spice things up, he proposes putting five third grade key blood elixirs on the line and challenges his friend to accept the bet. Brother Feng eagerly points out that he has been saving that much for six months. However, he agrees to take a bet on a person standing tall, dressed in brown and gold attire. Amused, Brother Ping confidently accepts the offer, and by the looks of his face it's clear that he is certain he will win. However, Brother Han makes it clear to him not to cry if he loses. Moments later, it becomes apparent that Brother Han's confidence is rooted in the person he has bet on and the person's name is Kao Mayan. There are rumors that Kao Mayan is an extraordinary talent from the Kao family. It is said that he broke through to the fourth stage of the Qi Blood Realm at the age of 15 and has now reached the first level of the Grandmaster Realm. Han Feng cannot help but find amusement in the fact that his friend seems to have bet on someone entirely random from the crowd. That makes him feel quite confident about winning the bet. 
Now, the real deal begins. All the participants have made it to the arena, and the duel is about to kick off. As the scene zooms out we see everyone is standing in a circle, and two individuals step forward, ready to throw down. The guy on the right, striding forward like he owns the place, is none other than Kao Mayan, the Goldie Boy. On the opposite side, our lady is gearing up for the battle. You can tell by the look on her face that she is feeling a bit jittery about the whole thing. She turns to the young man and suggests they cover each other later because, hey, these guys look tough to deal with. However, our boy seems to have different plans. Right there in the arena, he casually raises his hand and calls out to the deacon. Now, everyone's eyes are on him, wondering what on earth he is up to. In the following moment, our man pulls out a token he received from the old timer. The token is his golden ticket to skip all those harsh tests and go straight into the sect. Dropping the token, he confidently states his intention to use it for direct entry. The old man catches the token, looking a bit puzzled and wonders if it is really from Elder Q. On the flip side, Brother Han is standing there with his mouth wide open, utterly shocked to witness the boy just breezing through the tests. Brother Ping, on the other hand, is wearing a smug grin, reveling in his sweet victory in the bet they had placed. Naturally, the old man has no choice but to acknowledge that since our boy has Elder Q's approval, he can skip the trial, and no one else is allowed to make a move on him. The deacon then spills the beans that our man can just chill on the stage and enjoy the show while the battle unfolds. Reveling in all the attention he is getting from onlookers, our boy cannot help but sport a grin of satisfaction. However, the lady is not thrilled to see the young man stepping out. She questions if he is not going to fight alongside her. With a stern expression, our man points out that it is time for her to gain some experience. He makes it clear that she has to pass the test on her own because he cannot be expected to protect her for the rest of his life. Tough love, but hey, he's got a point. All worked up. The lady is not a fan of the idea of being protected for the rest of her life. Now, she is brimming with confidence to conquer this outer disciple trial on her own. Ready and standing in the battlefield, she sternly calls out, Emerge. In the sprawling arena where everyone's out to prove themselves, she summons her whip and throws down the gauntlet, inviting everyone to come at her. Whipping her weapon around, she shows off her skills. Meanwhile, our boy, standing at a distance, watches her newly ignited determination. He believes that the agitation method truly works on someone as self-respecting as the lady. Though he made a promise to the lady's father to protect his daughter, and he is also aware that making her stronger is more important than shielding her all the time. He believes that only a real battle can make her strong, and the determination he has ignited in her is undoubtedly worthwhile. Meanwhile, the duo of brothers is back in the spotlight. Brother Ping, quite amused after winning their bet, gives his brother a slight pat on the shoulder. However, Brother Han cannot help but feel agitated and questions if Brother Ping knew about everything all along. As it turns out, it is true. Brother Ping reveals that if he had not known about it beforehand, he would not have bet with his brother so easily. He believes his brother's arrogance got the best of him, and he did not think things through before entering the bet. Back in the sprawling arena, where folks are going all out to prove themselves, we spot a baldy on the ground moaning in pain after taking a solid hit. The scene shifts, and there is the young lady, whipping the daylights out of everyone in her path. She is on a roll, having beaten five people already, with about 23 others still on the field. Looking back at our boy standing in the distance, she wonders why on earth she does not feel nervous at all after hearing those words from him. It seems like there is something about his attitude that has given her a boost of confidence in the heat of the battle. Meanwhile, the Goldie boy seizes the opportunity while the lady is standing there and hurls a purple lightning whip at her. True to form, our lady gracefully swings into the air, leaving the whip to fiercely shatter on the ground. But the danger is not over yet. The Goldie boy sneaks up from behind, startling her and catching her off guard. Arrogantly, he grabs her by the neck, declaring that she is about to taste the sharpness of his sword. It's already undeniably creepy to grab a woman by the throat. But this guy takes it to another level with his nut job expression. Maintaining a creepy grin, he taunts her, emphasizing that she is weak and no woman is supposed to make it to the Caillou sect. So, there she is, struggling to even get a word out while Mr. Goldie Boy thinks he is the boss, threatening to break her neck if she does not admit fear. Our guy, though, is just standing there, watching the whole drama unfold. The lady, on the other hand, is finding his judgmental eyes annoying as heck. But as you know she is not about to call for backup. She has got her pride and she is not letting anyone look down on her. And then, something changes. It's like a determination switch just got flicked on inside her. The look on Goldie Boy's face says it all, he is taken aback. Our lady's not here to play games. Getting fed up, she starts giving off this vibe that totally throws Goldie Boy off balance. And just like that, Goldie Boy goes soaring through the air with a single push, sliding down and crashing against the ground. The impact leaves a trail of damaged ground, marking his miserable defeat. Meanwhile, Brother Han is left in shock, his mouth agape, watching himself lose his bet miserably. He just cannot fathom how this turnaround is even possible. The lady casually strolls through the crowd, looking like a phoenix with the whip in her hand. Others are left wondering if she just had some kind of breakthrough. As for our man, he is on standby, thoroughly amused by the little display of power. Seems like the lady is not one to mess with. After thoroughly defeating Goldie Boy, the lady starts pondering her next target. 
Goldie, on the other hand, is not exactly thrilled about his unbearable defeat. His face tells the whole story, he is not done with it. As expected, he lunges into the air with beast-like eyes, hell-bent on taking down Our Lady. But fear not, because our man arrives just in the nick of time to save the day. He grabs Goldie by the shoulder, putting a halt to his advance. The grip on Goldie's shoulder is so intense that he starts to crumple down in pain. Before we know it, his legs are shattered, and he is screaming in excruciating pain like a sacrificed lamb. He falls to the ground, but the torment does not end there. Our man steps onto Goldie and starts pushing him against the wall. The lady turns around, witnessing her prince doing the deed. With a stern expression, our man keeps applying pressure on Goldie's back, making him scream in agony, begging to be let go. It's crystal clear, our man is not playing around. He grabs Goldie's hand and starts bending it in the opposite direction, interrogating him about whether he tried to poison her after losing. But Goldie, in pain and desperation, can only scream and plead for release as he lies on the ground. As our man holds onto Goldie's hand, we can clearly see some purple substance floating onto Goldie's palm, making it undeniably clear that he was indeed trying to poison her. Our man, looking at this sneaky cat, firmly states that he does not want to be co-disciples with the likes of him. Meanwhile, Goldie, struggling on the ground and screaming in agony, tries to remind our boy about the rules the deacon mentioned. But our man, not one to be swayed, firmly reminds him that the deacon only said no one could strike our boy. Nowhere did he say that our boy could not strike anyone else. Enduring unbearable pain, Goldie screams again, reminding our man that trying to kill him goes against the rules, they cannot kill each other. Right then, the young man stops, acknowledging the rule against killing. However, he quickly points out that if he nullifies Goldie's cultivation, it will not be considered killing. With that clarified, the young man throws him into the air and kicks him around like a football, sending him soaring through the air and crashing into the wall. Looks like Goldie's got a one-way ticket to Payne Town. Meanwhile, the two seniors of the sect, standing in the distance, are utterly shocked. They acknowledge that the strike Goldie just made was directed towards the young lady's vitals, and if the young man had not stopped him in time, things would have taken a deadly turn. What's even more mind-blowing to them is the fact that they did not even see the boy moving. This is the moment they recognize the true potential of our boy. It's become clear to them that this was the reason Master Fang had his eyes on this dude. At that very moment, the boy turns around towards the elders and tells them that he really does not want to be a co-disciple with a scumbag like Goldie. He questions if he is breaking the rules by nullifying Goldie's cultivation, catching the elders off guard with his abrupt inquiry. In a somewhat hesitant tone, the elders immediately give him the signal our boy was looking for. As the scene transitions we see the lady, standing amidst the battlefield, surrounded by chaos. Thanks our boy for the favor. Our man casually walks past her, telling her not to slack off, as they are already surrounded by a bunch of opponents. Meanwhile, on the other side of the arena, someone is not quite happy about the ongoing battle outcome. We see Brother Han who is clearly pissed about losing his precious five key blood elixirs to Brother Ping, who is just reveling in amusement at the prospect of winning those elixir bottles. Furious and fuming, Brother Han develops a grudge against our boy. About 30 minutes later, we see the sect arena filled with a bunch of guys, fully beaten up and lying on the ground as if they have been thrown out like yesterday's trash. Meanwhile, the young man, observing the last remaining fellas, recognizes that the battle is about to finish. In the battlefield, we get to see a man named Zio wanking clad in blue, holding a folding fan in his hands. From its clean and elegant appearance, it is clear that the man is not one to be messed around with. His opponent, with all due respect, decides to concede, marking the end of their battle. On the other hand, we see another contestant holding his sharp weapon, almost like a cave dweller who came straight out of his cave, standing above his beaten up opponent who is pleading and admits defeat. At that very moment, the old timer calls it a day and announces that the remaining standing contestants have passed the test. From now on, they are officially the outer disciples of the Kaiyuan sect. Sure enough the standing contestants who were able to win the test are relieved to see that the test is finally over, and our lady, by the looks of her face, is clearly tired as heck. On the other hand, my man's gaze falls on the man with the folding fan in his hand, who stands gracefully. His gaze also falls on the other contestant, who why, who looks like a gorilla this is where he recognizes them as opponents to watch out for later. As every contestant gathered around, the elder told them to follow him as he is about to take them to the affairs hall first to collect their jade identity tags and other items. So, there we were, a bunch of hopefuls following the wise elders like a bunch of ducklings on a field trip. The old man was on a roll, ready to drop some knowledge bombs about the Kaiyun sect. He reveals that the Kaiyuan sect has 7 main peaks and 36 secondary peaks, along with 300 smaller peaks. He believes that those 7 main peaks are the cultivation core of the Kaiyuan sect and also the richest in resources. However, Mi makes it clear that only inner disciples can enter there, and if someone tries trespassing into the inner gate, they will be blown away by the prohibitions on the main peaks. He tells them to remember not to get too close. The old guy keeps the info train rolling. Not just the main hall, he reveals that there's a spirit refining hall for all your spiritual needs, a treasure hall for some shiny discoveries, an affairs hall for, well, sect affairs, a gladiatorial arena for some action, and to top it off, an even-tiered pagoda at the heart of it all. 
Diving deeper into the nitty gritty, we find out that the Spirit Refining Hall is not just any old space, but it has got 36 stone chambers decked out with powerful spirit gathering formations. It's like a DIY cultivation spot for all the disciples. Now, Treasure Hall is the sex hidden vault, housing a collection of rare treasures, martial art elixirs, and secret weapons. Basically, it's a repository of the sex most prized possessions. As for the affairs hall we are heading to, it is like the Caillou and Sex Task Central that provides daily miscellaneous items needed by the disciples. Regarding the gladiateral arena and the seven-tiered pagoda, details are still on the horizon as everyone is still journeying. The old-timer promises to unveil more information later. The elder then reminds everyone about the jade tags, storage bags, and the five spirit stones received during initiation. It's like a welcome kit for the newcomers, highlighting a crucial point. The old man reveals that the Caillou insect employs special spirit stones as a currency. These stones are used to activate cultivation formations and will serve as monthly salaries in the future. Further emphasizing, he points out that regardless of their previous social status or wealth, which now holds no significance, becoming a disciple of the Caillou insect unites everyone on equal ground. In the midst of the participant crowd, there is this one dude practically soiling his pants after realizing the wad of cash he brought is now as useless as pebbles. Meanwhile, some folks are grinning ear to ear, psyched about the Caillou insect hitting the reset button and making everyone start from scratch. As they hit the next stop, the old man throws his hand out, pointing like he is giving directions to the coolest party in town. The scene zooms out, revealing this massive rock with holes carved into it. Old Timer spills the beans revealing that these caves are where the outer disciples set up shop. Quick note, though, this spot's a guy's only zone. And for the ladies, he's got some other plans for them, so follow the leader, he says. As it turns out, not everyone in the participant crowd is thrilled with the digs they are handed. Some of them start piping up, airing their complaints. However, the old man is quick to clear things up, reminding them that they are now outer disciples and will only be allowed to stay in Mountain Peak's mansion when they become inner disciples. Listening to that, my man could not help but etch a smirk on his face, reveling in his victory. Now, flipping to the new chapter of our boy's story, we get to see him chilling in his outer disciple cave. Just then, three notifications in a row pop up, clearly indicating that our dude has scored a whopping 6,000 XP from meditating in the cave. At that very moment, my man opens his eyes, already awake from his slumber. While sitting there, one thing becomes clear to him. If he places the spirit stone in the spirit gathering formation, he will be able to obtain three times the aura of the spirit stone. However, he acknowledges that solely relying on absorbing these auras alone is not quite enough. It will not be nearly enough to raise his experience points, and the only option left for him is to find a way to obtain more spirit stones. Fast forwarding five days, we find ourselves in the affairs hall where we see a man casually dozes off in a chair, seemingly at ease. Meanwhile, we spot both Brother Han and his red-headed friend hanging around. The red-headed boy curiously asks his friend what brought him to the affairs hall today, questioning if he is already out of money. However, Brother Han does not seem to be in a good mood and dismisses his friend, reminding him it is none of his business. Shortly after, the reason for his agitation becomes clear. Due to losing his five key blood elixirs in a bet to Brother Ping, he is now unable to improve his cultivation further. The only way out of this predicament is to save up more spirit stones. As he is about to step into the premises of the sect affairs hall, his attention is snagged by a rowdy crowd inside. It's a scene where everyone yelling they came first, like there is some crazy giveaway happening. Brother Han snags his red-headed friend by the collar, giving him a serious what the heck is going on glare. He reveals that it's been a few days since he swung by, and now the affairs hall is a madhouse. Redhead, practically getting strangled, manages to sputter out that a bunch of missions have been snagged by some hotshot new outer disciple. Apparently, this person is blazing through missions faster than anyone thought possible. And yeah, he explains that if they want to pick up a mission in exchange for spirit stones, they will have to queue up early, or there will be no more missions left. But from the looks on Brother Han's face, it is evident he is not breaking a sweat over it. He figures these new disciples are just trying to build up their spirit stone stash due to shaky foundations. In his mind, this hustle for missions is just a passing phase among the rookies. Moreover, he is under the impression that there are only 20 new disciples this time around. And since the affairs hall dishes out around 300 daily missions, he thinks there is more than enough to go around. Reality, however, hits him square in the face. His red-headed buddy bursts the bubble, letting him know it all kicked off because one of these newbies is pulling off almost a hundred missions a day. Turns out, Brother Han might not have the full scoop on what is going down in the affairs hall. In the next moment, our man finds himself standing in front of the affairs ministry desk. He addresses the folks seated there, making it clear he is here to exchange for spirit stones. The table is cluttered with items and mystical beasts he has acquired. As the scene shifts, we finally catch sight of the fat man up front, holding yet another jar of beer. He's far from pleased with our lad nagging him every day during his drinking sessions. To shoo away our persistent boy, the fat man tosses all the stones he is lying around toward our lad, sternly telling him to never come back. 
However, our boy, quick on the draw, snatches up every single one of those sweet spiritual stones into his bag, making it crystal clear he will be back tomorrow. In a fit of frustration, the old man hurls a bunch of wooden cards at the boy and sternly tells him to get the heck out of there. He declares his intention to sleep until he wakes up naturally and makes it clear that he does not want to see him tomorrow or ever again. Not wasting a beat, my man casually swings his hand in the air, and in the blink of an eye, he has got all those wooden blocks in his grasp. Feeling quite lucky, our boy cannot help but express his gratitude to the grumpy old man. The onlookers, including Brother Han, are left in shock as they witness the old man effortlessly handing our boy a grade 7 mission card. Their surprise becomes more apparent when we learn that missions in the Affairs Hall are categorized into grades 1 through 10. Now, the most suitable missions for outer sect disciples typically range from the first to the fourth grade, involving tasks like herb collecting and catching third grade demonic beasts. Needless to say, the difficulty level spikes for fifth to tenth grade missions. The onlookers are left scratching their heads, unable to fathom how this seemingly ordinary man could acquire a grade seven mission with such ease. The old man, clearly not in his sober senses, hiccuping and all, makes it abundantly clear that there will be no more missions for the rest of the onlookers today. They can all go back now. Naturally, the boys standing around are not too pleased, because they have been waiting in the queue for missions for quite a while. Also Brother Han, in particular, is seething with anger. His frustration escalates upon seeing our young man indirectly interfering with his plans. The plot thickens with tension. Now we are outside in the mountains, with the sun shining brightly. Our boy, stationed at a tree's extension, keeps a watchful eye on the surroundings because this is the location for the next mission. To his surprise, it looks rather peaceful at first glance. Without wasting a moment, he swings his gaze toward the red beasts nearby, seemingly resting in peace. However, their seemingly pleasant slumber is disrupted as they sense someone's presence. Alarmed, they shift into a state of ferocious intent to kill. Scouting the area, our man is clearly pleased to discover that there are at least 40 of these beasts available, all at the leader level in terms of strength. In the blink of an eye, our man flashes towards the beasts with lightning speed. Within a split second, he is standing among them, seemingly ready to unleash a beatdown. He also has intentions of keeping two as proof for the affair's hall, so the alert beasts start howling, gearing up for an attack. With no time wasted, our lad's fists are ready, and he flashes around those beasts. In a whirlwind of motion, he leaves the poor soul shredded into pieces with his bare fists. Standing amidst the aftermath, he begins to absorb all the essence from them to further cultivate his powers. As our man sucks up the tasty monster's essence, a system window pops up, announcing that mass devouring has completed, and with that my man has just scored a whopping 360,000 experience points. While he is busy checking out his stats, he suddenly notices something. The scene shifts, revealing a bunch of monsters unaware of their impending doom, heading towards our lad from the back. No sweat on his brow, our man just stands there, unleashing some fancy move that wraps him up in a cool golden glow, boosting his powers. With crackling electricity and a mean look in his eyes, he strolls towards the approaching monsters. Now, he is not in a rush. He casually takes a stance, crosses his hands, and unleashes a wave of energy that turns those poor monsters into melting butter. After melting through the monsters, our boy seemingly scoops up two orbs heading right into his palm. Surprisingly, a notification window pops up, alerting him that the host has broken through to the first stage of the Grandmaster Realm. With this achievement, his skill points get a boost, and surprisingly enough, he can now unleash a tenfold attack speed. Taking a peek at his newly updated stats, we see the tenfold attack speed and the Grandmaster Realm sweetly adjusted into his profile. As the scene shifts, we witness the poor beasts lying lifeless on the ground. Our man revels in the fact that the technique he used to overcome those creatures, the Vajra Glaze physique, is no joke. He's convinced it deserves to be an Earth-ranked martial skill since it is undeniably strong. Checking out his shiny new tenfold attack speed, our man starts mulling over the fact that, at his current cultivation pace, it is high time he asked the old man for some grade 8 missions. While he is deep into his cultivation strategy, a blue streak comes hurtling towards him from the back. Just chilling there, the lightning attack zaps our boy, leaving him totally electrified. But guess what? Turns out our man is unfazed, unharmed, and casually starts strolling toward the bunch of lackeys surrounding him. As the scene zooms out, we get to see Brother Han seemingly leading the charge. He's perched on a rock, demanding our boy to hand over all his demon elixirs. But our young fella, who is laying eyes on this hang dude for the first time, throws a question at him asking if they know each other. Just as Brother Feng is getting ready to whip out his sword, wearing that annoyingly smug smirk, he spills the beans that he not only knows our guy but has been tailing him since the day he messed up Brother Han's bet. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Brother Feng tries to act all sympathetic, claiming he is a forgiving soul, and casually suggests our lad hands over the demon elixir, promising a smooth exit. But our boy, he am not falling for those empty threats. He just stands there, cool as a cucumber, and lets out a casual O from his lips. This showdown is about to get spicy. In the midst of this showdown, one of Feng's lackeys rocking a smug grin, cuts through the bowl and tells his leader to cut the crap. He suggests just ordering a hit on this tough guy so they can snatch that elixir. 
and he further spills the beans about spotting our main man racking up spirit stones from the old man Kai at the affairs department a moment ago. Then, out of the blue, a bald dude speaks up, saying it is not cool to rough up fellow disciples like this. He's all worried about the big shots or elders catching wind of it later. But Brother Wang, pointing his finger at the baldy, shuts it down. He claims that it is normal for disciples to get hurt while on missions, and as long as they do not admit to it, the truth will remain undiscovered. With that much clear, their leader just throws out a casual do it. And before you can blink, those lackeys zip into action with ferocious speed, leaping into the air and practically vanishing. Suddenly, we see our boy is surrounded, and at this point it is pretty clear he is in deep shit. The goons close in, making it look like game over. Zooming in on one lackey, he is grinning like a devil, telling Brother Feng to take a back seat and enjoy the show as they plan to beat this kid till he is begging for mercy. Baldi and the others in the crew waste no time. They whip out their enchantments and start throwing them at our boy. In a flash, chains conjured by their techie techniques grip him tight. Looks like our lad's in for a rough ride. But as we zoom in on our cool-headed lad, he is just chilling there like it is a walk in the park. It's at this moment he recognizes that their formation is absorbing his aura, making him realize that he underestimated their capabilities. The smirking lackey, still holding onto his sword further widens his grin. He's pretty convinced our lad must have caught wind of the infamous Kaiyu insect spirit trapping formation before. He spills the beans explaining how this setup can constantly absorb one's aura, making it downright impossible for the victim to break free. And here's the kicker the more folks casting the formation, the stronger those chains get. Looks like our lad's got a real puzzle to solve. A moment later, we find the young man fully confined within the chains, resembling a butterfly inside its cocoon. However, at this juncture, our hero casually asks if the lackey genuinely believed that such power could trap him. Almost instantly, the chains begin to shatter. The chains surrounding my man start to shimmer in a vibrant yellow energy, leaving the lackey in shock. Moments later, our hero stands there radiating energy like a burning candle, with all the chains already melted down. The aura intensifies further, creating ripples in the air that propel the lackeys in all directions and everyone is sent soaring through the air as a result. As Brother Fang perched on the hill starts to get cold feet, he realizes that this motherfucker has already broken through to the Grand Master Realm in such a short period. So at this point, he himself lunges into the air, ready to pierce our hero with his sword. Witnessing the oncoming blade, our protagonist leaps into the air and effortlessly grabs the tip of the sword with his bare fingers. Instantly, the sword shatters into a hundred pieces, leaving Brother Fang in disbelief. Now, fate takes a wicked turn. Our boy's got Brother Fang's throat in his grip, lifting him effortlessly. And with a fierce glint in his eyes, he reminds him that the moment he laid eyes on his stuff, it was game over. At this point it's quite clear that the tables have turned, and it is evident that Brother Fang's in for a rough ride. Brother Han, finally swallowing his pride, starts pleading with beads of sweat rolling down his face. He's practically shoving down apologies, begging our boy to spare his life. So in a last-ditch effort, he offers up everything he has got. Our man's face lights up with a mischievous grin, wasting no time. He straight up tells him he knows what is good for him. And with that, he casually tosses Brother Feng into the already battered group of lackeys. Fast forward 15 minutes, and hilariously enough, all the lackeys and Brother Feng find themselves on their knees, respectfully offering up their spiritual stones like well-behaved little boys. Looks like our lad knows how to run the show. Amused by their miserable state, the young man holding one of the stones asks them if their lives are genuinely worth so little. He makes everyone squirm when he points out that since everyone here is a senior, they should have more spirit stones. So in a sly move, he leans in close to Feng's ear, whispering about any storage bags he might have. But the brother Feng not so thrilled about giving up everything, lets out a frustrated tongue snapping sound. While our young man stands tall, surrounded by a bunch of bags offered up by the defeated group, they reveal that it's everything they have gathered since they started in the sect, and they hope it is enough for him to forgive and spare their sorry lives. So, after scooping up all those sweet spirit stones, our dude takes a stroll, just casually juggling the bag like it is a walk in the park. Then, with a flick of the wrist, he snags all those stones out of the bags, leaving them hanging there in the air, looking emptier than a Monday morning. No, the poor beaten up boys after robbed of all their money, nervously ask if he is satisfied and if they can just leave. They promise not to spill the beans about today's scene. So after that much cleared they start to pick themselves up, while the dude in his typical casual manner asks them to hold on for a moment. And out of the blue, our man whips out his lightning sword and dashes through those poor souls with lightning speed. Taking a closer look, he is slicing through their ears with swift motions, leaving the battered folks moaning and complaining that he went back on his word. But, while standing cool as cucumber, he sheathes his sword back into scabbard and claims that he never break his promises. So standing tall, he makes it crystal clear that he promised to spare their lives, not necessarily their body parts. Reminding them of their own words, he points out how losing an arm or a leg, as poor brother Han clutches his sliced off ear, desperately trying to stop the bleeding, anger and frustration bubble up within him. Now, with everything settled, our dude does not waste a beat. 
he casually leaps into the air at a speed that would make Superman blush, leaving those sorry bastards withering on the ground, nursing their injuries. After a while, we find ourselves inside his man cave, where we can see him sitting all elegant in his empty cave seemingly cultivating power. The blue shimmering aura surrounds him, and even the air crackles with energy as he dives deep into meditation. Now let us zoom in. As the blue energy clears out, you see five starry thingies shimmering before him. And just like that, a notification hits him, congratulating him on breaking through to the second stage of the Grandmaster Realm. And a moment later his profile card pops out of nowhere, proudly displaying the shiny new title of the second Grandmaster Realm, taking a sweet spot in his ever-expanding profile. As we take a closer look at his face you catch a glimpse of pure happiness. Turns out, he is over the moon because who would have thought those seniors had such a stash of spirit stones and elixirs in their storage bags. And thanks to those motherfuckers because of them he managed to break through to the second stage of the Grandmaster Realm. Regardless of the achievements he starts to feel a tinge of guilt for pushing his fellow disciple to the limit, but he brushes off the concern, telling himself they damn well deserved it. So after a long practice session, he decides it is time to take a break. Suddenly, a voice calls out from the shimmering artifact resting on his stone bed. Curiously turning around, he eyes the artifact. Taking it into his hand, he wonders why the sweet little lady is reaching out to him at this time of day. On the other side of the phone call, we see our purple-haired lady seemingly standing amidst a jungle. She casually asks if he is free, and you know there might be some new adventure in the mix. As the scene zooms out, it becomes clear that our lady is not alone. Standing alongside her is a brown-haired lady. While on the phone call, the purple-headed spills the beans that her friend scored a grade 5 mission, but it requires a squad of four. The only catch is that they only have three members, and they want to rope him in. She adds that snagging missions from the affairs hall has become quite a challenge lately so they do not want to lose this opportunity. Meanwhile, on the flip side, our boy, after piling up hundreds of mission wood, sadly realizes she probably does not know who is behind this mission shortage. Anyway, he drops the bomb that he is about to take a break, so he will not be able to join them. Deep down, the real reason he is turning down the offer is that he does not fancy splitting the rewards five ways in a grade 5 mission. So, he decides to pass on this one. Taking the rejection in stride, the lady tells him to forget it and advises him to rest well. At this point, she turns to another group member lurking behind a tree and informs him that their friend will not be joining as he needs to rest. So she suggests finding someone else. The other brown lady agrees and decides to scout for additional disciples. As the scene transitions, we catch a glimpse of a familiar face holding onto his folding fan as usual. Upon hearing the news, a suspicious aura exudes from him as he comments what a shame. Here we are, surrounded by mountains with the sunlight shimmering brightly and birds just casually hanging out in the air. Meanwhile we see the two ladies find themselves once again chatting. The brown-haired one slyly asks the purple-headed if our lad has a crush on her. Turns out, when our boy figured out that the man in blue was joining them, he promptly changed his mind and decided to join the mission. As the scene zooms out, we see them walking side by side as if trying to appear like buddies. However, the lingering tension between them is a clear indicator that they are not exactly thrilled to see each other. The lady after sensing the tension between them realizes that our lad is quite emotionally reserved. Now, she is starting to wonder if he indeed has a crush on her. The fact that he instantly agreed to join when he found out the blue guy was crashing the party raises some eyebrows. In a moment of contemplation, the lady starts to flash back to all the instances where our boy showed a bit of concern for her. This leads her to entertain the thought that he might harbor feelings for her. However, she remains unsure about what is going on in his head, as his unpredictable behavior has always left her baffled. With a hint of doubt, she tells the brown head that our boy does not have that sort of mindset and could not possibly think that way. So she urges her to drop the topic and keep up with their walk. The next moment, they start running to catch up with the others who have already passed them. Meanwhile, engaged in their own chatter, the blue guy adds a layer to the mission scenario. He mentions that he does not know if the purple head has briefed our boy about the mission, but he emphasizes that it is quite dangerous. Explaining the task at hand, he mentions they need to find a way to reach the dark swamp in the center of the forest and retrieve the erosion flower. This flower is believed to possess great yin energy, but it is extremely mysterious, and very few people can successfully locate it. He further stressed the fact that encountering monsters is one thing they can handle, but stumbling into the poisonous miasma produced by the dark swamp is a whole different kind of trouble. And of course inhaling that poisonous miasma will erode a martial artist's internal organs. Even if by some chance they do not end up dead, they will be left crippled. Our boy now getting the gist of this weird-ass mission, fires back a question to the blue boy. He wonders why the fuck he looked for these ladies to team up in the first place. If this mission is so difficult, it would have been a lot easier for him to go solo or team up with disciples within the Grandmaster Realm. At this point the brown head lady fires back, questioning if their key blood realm cultivation will hold him back. She rants on about how the blue boy did not mention a thing, despite being at the third stage of the Grandmaster Realms. Our boy seemed to make a big deal about it, which she is not too keen on. 
The blue guy quickly jumps in, asking if our boy doubts his abilities. To clear the air, he reveals that the reason he invited everyone here to team up is because he has got a special item that guarantees the successful completion of this mission. So in the following moment, he pulls out a bottle containing some balls, revealing it as the Yang Yuan elixir, which is his family's secret elixir, and if someone takes it, they will be immune to the poisonous miasma for two hours and would keep everyone safe in the dark swamp. To butter up the ladies, he lays on the flattery thick, suggesting it is better to be accompanied by two beauties on a mission rather than a group of men. Lost in the blue dude's flattery, the brown head lady comments on how he is always sweet-mouthed, while the purple lady tries to shake off the uncomfortable feeling by pretending to cough. Meanwhile, our boy holding the elixir pill in his hand gazes at it with doubt. It's pretty clear he is not eager to trust the blue boy. On the other hand, the brown head lady, clearly flattered by the blue boy's behavior immediately gulps down the pill without showing any reservation or a hint of doubt. Our young man and the purple head lady on the other hand are just staring blankly at the pill. So this is where the blue boy chimes in, asking why they are not taking the elixir. And to lure them into taking it he once again starts with his bullshit about the potent poisonous miasma around, reminding them of the difficulty they had passing the outer disciples test. He warns that it would be bad if they were to lose their lives. After persistent persuasion, they both reluctantly gulp down the pill. Meanwhile the boy in the blue exuding an aura of suspiciousness, decides to move on for the mission while the elixir lasts. With that settled, everyone takes the leap into the air, soaring down. Here's our lad, sneaky as ever, hiding his pill behind his back. Right then and there, we witness him shattering the pill with his bare hand, clenching onto it. As they dive into the miasma-filled domain, a small blue flower shimmers into view. It looks like the notorious erosion flower is just a few feet away from them. While gazing at the flower, the brown head lady feels lucky to have found it so easily. On the other hand, the purple lady cannot help but wonder why they have not run into any demonic beasts along the way. Suspicion starts to creep in about how smoothly things are going. So there they are, the both of the boys hanging out behind while the brown shorty pops to question about how the fuck they are gonna cross the deadly swamp to grab that erosion flower. The blue dude always ready with a plan jumps in. He spills the beans that he has got this formation trick up his sleeve where he can turn the aura into spirit stone steps for a short stroll. But, here's the catch this formation needs a babysitter at all times. So, he needs our young man's help to waltz over and pick that erosion flower. No dilly-dallying, our man says yes to the plan. And just like that, they are set for an adventure in the deadly swamp. The blue boy turns to the ladies, expressing that it is too risky for our lad to go alone. He suggests that, since the purple head has the higher realm, she should accompany him and provide backup, while the brown shorty and he himself will stay behind to offer support from a distance. With the plan set in motion, the blue guy takes the lead unleashing a burst of bluish energy. As the scene zooms out, we get to see enchantment patterns popping beneath him, and a trail of stone starts to float above the swamp, creating a perfect path for them to traverse. With a single nod, both the purple lady and our lad jump onto those stones, soaring toward the flower. As they are about to close in, the lady throws a question at our boy, asking if he cannot sense anything strange going on. After landing on the step stones, standing just before the flower the lady expresses her skepticism. There's not a single bird around and the place is eerily quiet. With his sword at the ready, he also feels as if maybe there is something off about the flower. So, my man casually swings his sword through the air, aiming straight at the flower. Both ladies, thinking it is just a routine swing, suddenly shift to surprise mode. Meanwhile, the young man, sensing a plot twist, braces himself for what is coming. And would not you know it, the flower decides it has had enough and its weird bone-like appendages stretch out toward them. Everyone's eyes widen in shock as the seemingly motionless flower suddenly springs into action. But, our cool dude is on it. With a swift move, he dodges those stretchy root attacks with his sword like he is swatting away annoying bugs. So, as the scene zooms out, we are witnessing a full-on massacre unfolding in the swamp. Roots are popping out everywhere, turning the whole place into a chaotic battleground. The blue guy, trying to keep those stepping stones afloat, warns them not to step too far, as his stepping stones can only last for seven steps. Just when you thought it was a beautiful flower, now it's turning into a havoc-wreaking nightmare for these poor souls. Dead creature bones start crawling out of the swamp, but my man stands tall, not giving a damn. This is when something extraordinary catches his eye. As the scene zooms out, it turns out that this beautiful flower is actually a massive one-eyed monster chilling under the swamp. It's so huge that those poor idiots look like ants in comparison. While the lady gazes at the graveyard of skulls and bones before her, she realizes that all the demonic beasts that were not seen along the way were apparently seduced by this behemoth and became its sustenance. While she is dropping truth bombs, a sharp root decides to join the party, marching toward the lady. No worries though, she dodges that attack like a pro athlete. Meanwhile, the blue guy is now panicking, practically soiling his pants as he looks at the creature bigger than his mom. He shouts at the top of his lungs, telling them not to fight it, just pick the flower and withdraw. But our boy has other plans in mind. So ignoring the advice, he does the opposite and lunges toward the beast. While slicing down those overgrown roots left and right, he makes it clear that he will make his own judgment. 
with a swing of his sword. It is like he is in Star Wars or something, sending a blue shimmering strike that directly smacks the monster. As the scene zooms out, we see the blue flower has gigantic eyes, while our man stands boldly in front of it. He extends his hand, and a dark energy starts to gather around while commanding the creature to come closer. Turns out, his dark energy is taking a toll on the flower, causing it to wither down. Before you know it, the flower starts to fall into the swamp. Meanwhile, the brown shorty, caught up in the chaos, struggles to stand on her feet while doing her best to protect the blue guy. On the other hand, the purple head is whipping her whip, creating bright explosions with each strike on the roots. As the scene zooms into her feet, we can clearly see the stepping stone she has been standing on starting to fade. Of course, the lady looks down only to realize she is about to be dropped into the stinky swamp. Realizing the dire situation, the brown shorty immediately screams at the blue guy to build another spirit stone step quickly. But to her dismay, the blue guy clearly suffering, admits he cannot do anything anymore. That's when our man swoops back into the scene to save the day. With his tenfold attack speed, he lunges toward the lady with the speed of light, grabbing her along with the flower they initially came for which is now resting in his mouth. He hands over the flower to the lady, who cradles it in her hands, while he holds her tightly and relentlessly wields his sword left and right. In the aftermath, a gigantic, eye-blinding explosion occurs. To avoid the collateral damage, my man falls back along with the lady. Now, the once mighty flower lies motionless in the swamp, while our boy makes a swift exit out of this mess. As soon as they step on solid ground, he drops the lady immediately, where the brown shorty lunges over, grabbing her into her grasp and expresses her relief that she is finally saved. Meanwhile, the blue dude, feeling the pang of guilt, apologizes to her and reveals that she was too far apart, so he was unable to create the stone in time. The power of the attack was too great, and it strained him, but he is glad our boy jumped in to rescue her, so he apologizes to clear the air for his mistake. However, a moment later the things get dicey when the blue dude greedily extends his hand to grab the flower, but our boy not one to shy away, immediately grabs his approaching hand, bluntly asking if he has finally decided to reveal his true intentions. The blue guy, trying to play dumb, asks what he even means. With a stern look that could pierce through cold walls, our boy reminds him that if Brown Shorty or the Purple had obtained that flower instead, the spirit stone step that failed to be created in time would be under our boy's own feet. With no beating around the bushes, our man exposes the blue boy's malicious intentions. He explains that the blue boy's plan had three steps. First, let two out of the three of them take the risk of picking the flower, then take the opportunity to get rid of one of them. Secondly, he chose the brown shorty since she was the weakest and he party to back him up with the goal of killing her while the chaos was still going on. Meanwhile, the dumbfounded lady standing behind in a state of surprise inquires what he is talking about but our man keeps on rolling, revealing the blue dude's malicious intentions. Lastly, the blue dude wanted to kill the last person who lost a lot of their spiritual power after the battle and snag all the mission rewards for himself. As the camera shifts, we catch a glimpse of the blue dude's face taking a 180 degree turn, a malicious glint present in his eyes as he makes it clear that he never intended to kill them because they were already on the verge of hell from the beginning. At this point the ladies start to cough out shit ton of blood, their breath starts suffocating and chests hurt like hell. The dude stands with full authority, rocking his smug grin, holding onto his folding fan. He reveals that he wanted to take the opportunity to get rid of them as potential rivals before the intersect disciple competition. He further reveals to those struggling ladies that he did not lie to them entirely because this elixir is indeed able to help one withstand poisonous miasma. However, if one unleashes their inner power, they will suffer backlash. The brown shorty, after getting a dose of betrayal, musters some strength to mumble some words, asking why he lied to them. Ready with his sword, our man tells the ladies to stay away. The next thing we know is the blue dude throwing some green daggers while telling him that our boy is indeed a good opponent, and it would be a shame to let him die so soon. Unfazed by these measly threats, with a confident grin etching his face, our man makes it clear that only one of them will be going to live today. With that declared, he whips his sword out again, turning those daggers into confetti. Cocky blue dude, watching his plan crumble like a poorly baked cookie, starts sweating like he is in a sauna. The fact that our lad's realm and strength are clearly below the blue dude's, yet the blue dude struggles to react to his speed on time. While our man is showcasing his prowess with his sword in an open field with swift movements, he swiftly passes through the blue dude leaving him frightened by his sheer power. When the showdown is over, the fan he once gracefully held in his hands falls down on the ground drenched in his own blood. As the scene zooms out, we get to see the blue dude's cocky self, now trembling and entirely drenched in his personal bloodbath. Still clinging to his shreds of pride, he screams at the top of his lungs, rallying to kill our dude. But hold on, another assailant joins the party that left his eyes wider than a pancake. This is where the scene reveals his shoulder pierced by a spear that left his mouth drenched in his blood. And the one who pierced him is none other than the purple head lady who makes it clear that he is not the only one who can use deception. Our victorious dude, grinning like he just won a jackpot, gives Lady a compliment for being all mature and stuff. After taking that last deadly blow, the blue dude falls straight to the ground. She swings her whip back to her leaving his shoulder starts showering blood. 
After that she turns to our boy, inquiring about what they should do with this guy, even though she wanted to kill him but she cannot go against the rules of killing disciples. Meanwhile, the battered guy pulls himself together, trying to stop the bleeding from his shoulder. His inner thoughts reveal that even if they make a scene in front of the deacons and elders, all he has to do is claim that it is the two of them who were trying to take the rewards of the mission and then falsely accuse our boy. The blue dude is confident that everything will be fine as long as he is still alive, because he plans to manipulate the elders and make a grand comeback. While the brown shorty lies on the ground suffering from the poison given by the blue dude, believes that if he says a few more fancy words to her she will definitely obey him when she wakes up. But before he can act on any of his thoughts, our man grabs him by the throat. As if he has read the blue bastard's mind, he asks if he was figuring out how to get out of this mess, making it clear that they also have evidence of him playing dirty. While the blue dude is already loosing his shit, our man assures him that his perfect plan is going to be ruined and this is when he pulls out their version of a smartphone. AMD reveals that he has everything recorded in this device. The blue dude's eyes widen in disbelief to see a recording stone. He shouts back asking when he recorded it. But this is not the only surprise because his shock deepens as he realizes the young man has a recording stone that even he himself was not able to buy so he questions how he got so much money to buy this. My man juggling his spirit stones and possessions in the air casually makes it clear that there is a lot more about him that this cocky dude does not have a clue about. At this point, the purple head lady starts laughing out loud at the injured idiot before him because she knew that with that recording stone proof, even if this dude did not confess, it would not be a problem for them because mutilating a fellow disciple during a mission is believed to result in a heavy punishment of 81 days of lightning strikes. My man stands tall before him, exuding his dark energy that sends shivers down this blue dude's spine. At this very moment, he places his hand on this blue bastard's head, and of course the poor bastard totally terrified out of his wits, asks him what he is going to do to him. So to answer his curiosity my man leans toward his ear. Sure enough he whispers something so downright vicious that the poor dude starts to tremble even further, beginning with his stuttering voice to save himself from this mess. But it seems that there is no help arriving for this poor dude. While our man's hand is on his head, he starts to boil down this bastard's head, leaving him suffering in the pain and agony while sucking out his delicious cultivation. A moment later, the poor guy now stripped of his cultivation mojo, plops onto the ground like a sack of potatoes. Standing tall, our boy gives himself a little pep talk, making sure this loser will not cause any more trouble on the way back. At this point, the lady casually spins around. Her eyes pop wide open in shock as she senses something off. Our dude, being the hero he is, rushes over to her, giving a helping hand while showing genuine concern he asks what is happening to her. But it seems that the poor lady is not in the mood to spill the tea. So while drifting into unconsciousness, she mumbles something about feeling cold. And just right there, she starts to wobble and ends up taking a nosedive. So, a hot minute later, here we are, outside the affairs hall, where we see our young man's got the lady in his arms, playing the hero while standing by the door. But inside the hall it is a whole different scene where we see the receptionist, who is always on the sauce as they're doing his usual drunken thing. He's blabbering about scoring some fancy 50-year-old booze and swearing he is gonna savor it today, and he is dead set on not letting anyone in. However, a bang on the door takes him by surprise, and planks are flying everywhere. The big guy clearly not thrilled about this unexpected entrance flips around totally pissed demanding to know who the fuck just crashed the party. As the scene zooms out, we see the whole shebang where the brown shorty is dragging the blue dude into the hall, and our man still cradling the lady. And of course the old geezer loses his cool, and yells at the top of his lungs, wondering if our boys brewed up another disaster. So while the sick lady rests on the chair, to cool down the old boozer, the brown shorty jumps in, explaining there were some hiccups on the mission and that they need the old man's wisdom. But nope, the geezer shuts it down, saying the affair hall am not no healing hall. Since they signed up for the mission, their fate's in the hands of the gods, and he is washing his hands of it. While holding onto his jar of wine, the old man bluntly tells our boy to buzz off because he does not want any interruptions during his drinking sesh. And just when things could not get crazier, the old fart finds himself surrounded by blue swords. The old geezer, startled by the unexpected sortie situation, drops his beloved alcohol jar. But, this motherfucker old man has turned out to be a champ, as he is not a bit scared and just laughs it off while stating that if they are trying to strong arm him. Out of the blue, the old fart whips out a snazzy crystal tube with some purple potion and asks our lad if he even knows who he is messing with. Meanwhile my man ready with his arsenal of blades, slyly plays it cool, saying he would not dare pick a fight. But it's clear that there is something brewing in his mind. Then, out of thin air, our guy whips out a jar of vintage alcohol, offering it up to the alcohol enthusiast old fart. And surprisingly, the booze-loving geezer caves in so easily that left the brown shorty totally weirded out, thinking this old man went from terrorized to bribed with goodies, all without him realizing it. Anyhow, with everyone gathered round, the old man and the lady perch themselves on the table. The old-timer gets down to business, diagnosing the lady, while the poor beaten-up bastard is tied up on the floor. A moment later the old geezer drops some bombshell diagnosis, saying the lady's got some rare congenital cold constitution. 
Of course, after tossing around some fancy terms, he casually asks if anyone's got a clue what he just said. So, while the both brown shorty and our lad decides to show their ignorance about this illness the old man spills the beans on the congenital cold constitution. Apparently, it is a martial artist's curse, carrying its own cold poison from birth. This nasty poison eats away at a martial artist's body, throwing a major wrench into their cultivation. If the poison goes full-blown, she will not be gathering spiritual energy again in this lifetime. Our young man chips in, mentioning that the purple head always seems normal during cultivation. So in response the old geezer reveals that it is because she has got this super rigid and pure young key safeguarding her and helping her resisting the cold brought on by her birth. While sipping on his fancy booze, he further mentions that this young key needs delicate handling. A smidge too much, and it is a one-way ticket to the afterlife or if it's too little it will be as good as useless. Adding more to the plot, the old man clarifies that the purple-headed gal has been burning her energy like a candle in a hurricane, defending herself against the toxic miasma during her mission. On top of that, she accidentally got hit by the hand key of the erosion flower, triggering the toxins in her body. As we catch a glimpse of the lady who is struggling to even breathe, the old man drops another bombshell. There are now two strands of hand key in her body, twisting her veins inside out. If she does not get a cure pronto, she has got less than three days left on this mortal coil. That's when our boy's light bulb flickers on. He realizes the mayor's sudden generosity in handing him the Vajra Glaze physique technique was not just random luck. It all clicks into place when he remembers the mayor mentioning the purple head's inability to cultivate this technique. In a twist of imagination, our lad envisions the old fart mayor as a sly fox, who orchestrated everything to make sure our boy takes care of his daughter. The generous rewards were not just luck, they were a crafty plan to ensure his daughter had a protector. So feeling a sense of duty, our boy questions if the Vajra Glaze physique he cultivated has the pure yang key to help regulate the lady's energy. Unfortunately, the old man drops a big fat no, explaining that her internal energy is way out of whack, and a regular regulation will not cut it. As we steal another glance at the ailing lady, our young man inquires about alternative treatments. The old man with a hiccup spills the beans that they need to counter poison with poison, and the plan in simple terms is to force out the hand key from her body, turning her into someone with a cold saint constitution. Confused as heck, our lad shoots a curious look, prompting the old man to explain that although the congenital cold constitution is a burden, there is a chance it can morph into a cold saint constitution. Apparently, it is a top-tier constitution that can lead to significant advancements in the martial artist's realm, enabling them to take on enemies at higher levels. The brown shorty, losing it over her friend's plight goes full-blown nuts. She grabs the old nut job, choking him out, and screams at the top of her lungs demanding to know why he has been twiddling his thumbs instead of saving her friend. In the following scene, we find ourselves in the bathroom where a soothing steam wafts out from the bathtub. As the camera zooms out, to everyone's surprise it becomes as clear as day that the sick lady is not soaking in that hot and steamy ambience alone. Behold there is our lad casually chilling in the same bathtub as hers. But as fate would have it, he is not there just for a casual dip. A yellow aura shimmers around his hand, making it clear he is on a mission to save her. Fast forward four days, and we see the lady peacefully snoozing in her comfy white blanket. Suddenly, her eyes flutter open, and in her half-asleep state, the first thing she spots is the brown shorty hovering around with a cloth in hand. In the following moment, she jolts up from her lying position. The brown shorty all smiles is thrilled to see her awake. However, it seems the lady is still in the dark about what went down, so she questions the mission and wonders why they are here. To clear up the confusion, the brown shorty mentions that our dependable lad was the hero who rescued them from the mission. This revelation widens the lady's eyes, and as she hears the brown shorty praising our lad, the purple head is quick to ask why the sudden change of heart for him because as she can recall the brown shorty was not a big fan of him on their mission. The brown shorty, now all lovey-dovey and with heart-shaped eyes, spills the beans. She used to have a not-so-great opinion of our lad when he spoke all harsh and unkindly. However, she had an epiphany that it was her own lack of keen eyes. The purple head is visibly creeped out by this overly affectionate sight of the brown shorty. But the shorty goes on talking and claims that our lad is, in fact, the precious talent of the Caillou insect. To add to the drama, she reveals that while the purple head was unconscious, our lad held her in his arms to seek treatment, all while maintaining his cold exterior. We then flash back to the moment when our boy, still cradling the purple head confirms to the brown shorty that he has successfully cured her poison. He instructs her to take the blue bastard with her as they plan to head back to the Caillou insect. In the following moment, she leans toward the purple head and whispers something in her ear. And once again we find ourselves flashing back, this time to our boy finishing the energy channeling for the purple head. He asks what is next. In response, the old fart pulls out a pill, revealing it as the ice elixir that can activate the cold saint constitution energy. He explains that she will be fine as long as she takes it and regulates her energy for seven days. He emphasizes their luck, stating that he is the only guy in the entire sect with this elixir. The ever-ecstatic brown shorty grateful as ever appreciates the old man and eagerly urges him to save the purple head. However, the old man is not about to hand out this precious elixir for free. 
he makes it clear that he is not foolish enough to use such a valuable item without compensation. He drops the bomb that if they want it, they will have to cough up 500 spirit stones in exchange. The once cheerful brown shorty takes a nosedive into a pit of dejection, realizing that 500 spirit stones is a hefty price tag. To put it into perspective, we learn that outer disciples only get 10 spirit stones per month, while the inner disciples manage 20. It's a rough realization of just how rare and expensive this elixir is in their world. Hold on, our man decides to swoop in, tossing a bag of stash towards the old fart, boldly declaring there is a thousand spirit stones in there. He tells the old man to keep the rest as drinking money, a little gift from him. The old fart, in sheer disbelief, widens his eyes at the sight of this unexpected windfall. Unable to resist, he peeks into the bag, curiosity getting the better of him. He could not help but ask about the reason for such generosity, wanting to know the connection between our lad and the lady. With a firm smile etched on his face, our man spills the beans that he made a promise to someone and, naturally, he intends to keep it. Now, back to the present moment the brown shorty tells to the lady where our man casually tossed 500 spirit stones to treat her condition, handing them over without a second thought. Not only that, he even doubled the amount. The lady is totally taken aback, immediately stating that she will have to return his favor. She marvels at the fact that the ice elixir was so valuable and our lad was so generous. She admits that if she were in his shoes, she might not be as generous. Upon hearing her friend's determination to repay our boy's kindness, the brown shorty urges her to do even more than just a favor. She suggests that she devote herself to him for life, considering they have been in the hot springs together for three days and three nights. Blushing like crazy at the thought of spending three days and nights with our lad, the lady gets caught off guard in this whirlwind of emotions and starts to doze of into the unconsciousness so the brown shorty immediately tells her not to pass out, throwing in a reminder that the booze-loving old man said she needs to regulate her energy for seven more days. Now, in the next scene, we catch the sight of the brother Fang once again but this time he is on his knees before a dude who is sitting in a chair like a Bollywood villain and all authoritative. Brother Fang gives him every gist about our boy and tells him that has been a bit too full of himself since joining the sect. Adding some spice to the mix, he claims that thanks to Elder Q having our lads back, he went around bullying fellow disciples, snagging their stuff, and even grabbing treasures they would've been hoarding for decades. To stir the pot even more, he provocatively states that our lad is trying to challenge this gorilla's position in the Cayuan sect. As the scene transitions, we catch the gorilla fidgeting with those red balls in his hand. Zooming out, we see the frustration is written all over his face. That's when we learn his full name is Han Zion, the sixth elder of the Cayuan sect and rocking the fourth stage of the transcendental realm. He straight up accuses that Elder Q must be blind to accept such an arrogant brat into the Cayuan sect. Brother Feng spills more beans, revealing that Elder Q is the 10th elder who is newly appointed by Master Kin just half a year ago. He also received a grant from Master Kin to pass on his power and has now broken through to the fourth stage of the transcendental realm. The spiky head dude tries to calm down Brother Feng, saying it is just Master Kin showing gratitude for our lad saving the master's daughter. Elder Q is kind of a newbie in his position, so he will not rock the boat. And about our lad, he promises to give him a taste of what happens to those who mess with the Han family in the Cayuan sect. After all the jabber, Brother Feng casually throws a thanks the spiky guy's way. A quick glance at his face shows that he is kinda pleased at the thought that our lad's future in the Cayuan sect might not be all sunshine and rainbows anymore. So here we are, watching our lad stroll down the sect path. It's been a month since he joined the sect, and the word is his realm has been inching up at a slow and steady pace, probably because he recently leveled up. With his hand on his chin, he realizes that if he wants to make a big leap in a short time, he has got to figure out another way to do it. While he is lost in thought during his walk, we catch a glimpse of two disciples passing by. So as we overhear their conversation we learn that someone over at the Gladiator Arena has won four matches in a row today. The other disciple clearly astounded by the news tells his brother they should check it out. Our boy deep in contemplation about the whole gladiator shindig, unveils the grandeur of the gladiator arena. It's a fair battleground where disciples gather to witness epic clashes. But here's the kicker, before the battles kick off, these comrades can throw in their spirit stones, elixirs, and even weapons into the mix. He smells an opportunity to rake in some spiritual stones, and he is all in for it. Not one to let such a chance slip by, he decides to show up for the showdown. And just like that, he declares his presence, and his physical appearance starts doing the Houdini. In the blink of an eye, we find ourselves at the Cayuan Sex Gladiator Arena. In the heart of the spectacle, sparks of light dance in the air, shimmering with intensity. As we zoom in, two formidable fighters take center stage, clashing swords and creating a dazzling display of those sparkling lights. As the scene zooms in, our eyes catch the sight of one beefed-up barbarian emerging victorious over his counterpart. The air is thick with the remnants of a fierce battle and you can practically hear their fast huffing, a clear sign that these guys just duped it out in a serious brawl. Now, let us shift to the defeated party who is a baldy barbarian. He's utterly perplexed by the fact that both he and his opponent seem to be on an equal strength playing field, yet he ended up kissing the dust. And just so we are clear this bewildered baldy is none other than Tianba, the wielder of the fourth stage grandmaster title. 
Amidst the crowd of onlookers, murmurs of admiration ripple through. They're all eyes on this impressive dude, who is on the brink of clinching his fifth consecutive victory. One spectator even remarks on his fierce momentum in the duel, noting how it seemed like he was ready to send his opponent straight to the pearly gates. Then, a juicy piece of gossip surfaces from the gossip grapevine. It's revealed that this dude has a sister battling an incurable illness. To foot the hefty medical bills, he has taken on some rather dicey assassination gigs. Needless to say, he has made himself a few enemies in the martial world, forcing him to seek refuge here at the Kaiyun sect. As the murmurs continues, another spectator chimes in shedding light on the dude's apparent fearlessness in the face of death which is not bravado but an act of desperation that is driving him forward. So there is our guy lost in the sea of onlookers, embracing his blade like it is the answer to all his sect-related questions. He's looking at the brawny barbarian dude in the arena, wondering if this legend in the making is actually him. And the next thing we see the barbarian himself with his blade chilling on his shoulder like it is just another accessory, casually gives the defeated dude the green light to skedaddle. He says you can leave like he is handing out golden tickets to freedom. But, wait there is a plot twist. The defeated dude, instead of looking all sulky, sports a sly smirk that could give the Cheshire Cat a run for its money. The atmosphere thickens with a dance of suspense and you can practically feel the quirky tension in the air. And would not you know it, the bastard makes a sneaky comeback, launching a direct attack at our victorious barbarian from behind. After taking hits on his back, the barbarian turns around only to find the sneaky opponent marching towards him smirking away. This is where the bastard makes it clear that according to the arena rules unless one side admits defeat or steps out of the ring, the game am not over. He also imparts a lesson to him that deception is a fighter's best friend. Meanwhile, we see the dude down on his knees, sword in hand, his entire body trembling and muscles aching because he has been struck with a poisoned weapon. Of course, the poor guy gets a swift punch to the face while that motherfucker after pulling up a sneaky attack tells him to fight back and mocks him about where his arrogance has gone now. The sneaky dude goes all out, raining down a barrage of punches on our poor guy, leaving him no room to fight back. He's practically raining down blows like it is a monsoon of misery all while demanding the one on the receiving end to admit defeat. As our unfortunate friend is about to plant a big smooch on the ground, he is spitting out blood like it is some fountain show. Meanwhile, the crowd is going absolutely bonkers witnessing this savage and shameless act of sabotage. It's like they are watching a train wreck in slow motion. The poor guy crashes down, and the sneaky bastard stands tall, surrounded by some transparent aura like he is the mastermind of a twisted circus. And of course he is ready for round two and got this greenish light shimmering in his palm while chuckling at the dude's miserable state. He throws down an ultimatum speak up or roll off the stage like a rejected potato. Just when it seems like things are heading for a gruesome sequel, our hero decides to drop into the arena like a lightning bolt, placing his hand on the sneaky bastard's shoulder. With one swift kick, he sends him soaring like a misbehaving kite. The poor dude, fully injured on the ground, looks up and asks our boy who he is. With a smirk on his face, our man makes his intentions clear he is stepping in to fight instead of that sneaky bastard. So turning around towards the judge sitting there, he questions how he can challenge this guy. As we zoom in on the instructor, the first thing that catches our eye is his massive eyebrows. Anyway, he turns to the poor dude who just bit the dust, asking if he can still fight. The man, raising his hand while fully injured, forfeits himself from the match. As our hero turns back to the referee, taking note of the injured dude's surrender the ref drops a bombshell. Turns out, the sneaky bastard has a whopping 160 spirit stones to his name. And if anyone wants to take him on, they have got to match that number and of course the winner takes all the loot. Now we see the sneaky bastard again, strutting back into the scene like he owns the place. He's heard whispers about our boy's exceptional skills among the outer disciples. But being the sneaky snake he is, he tries to assert his dominance. He warns our boy not to recklessly join in or he might end up losing even his underwear. But our man is not having any of it. So after tilting his head ever so slightly, he shoots back at the sneaky bastard, giving him a piece of his mind. If he does not admit defeat now, he will regret it later. It's like a showdown of wits and wills and our boys not backing down an inch. The crowd on the sidelines erupts with a wave of confidence rallying behind our young hero urging him to teach that sneaky motherfudger a lesson he will not forget. So with a nonchalant swagger, our man casually tosses a bunch of spirit stones into the mix, raining them down over the referee like it is no big deal. As our hero readies himself with sword in hand, the sneaky bastard cannot resist boasting about his fourth stage grandmaster status. He scoffs at the idea that someone with only second stage skills is trying to take him down. Fueled by this overconfidence, the bastard lunges at our boy with his spinny ninja thingies in hand. But our man stands firm while extending his sword he throws a philosophical curveball asking the deep question, who's the egg and who is the stone? In a blink our man goes past him with lightning bolt speed, not even letting the bastard comprehend what just happened. So zooming into the sneaky bastard's face, it is crystal clear he is sweating bullets and struck with fear all while trying to comprehend the immense speed he just witnessed. Over on our hero's side he is just chilling while casually sliding his sword back into its sheath like it is just another day at the sect. 
Now, let us take a peek back at the sneaky guy where we see his face is basically a blood waterfall at this point which is the aftermath of our man's lightning speed lesson. And of course the crowd goes wild with cheers for our hero's prowess and we also spot the poor dude who recently bit the dust from the sneaky guy, probably rethinking his life choices. But wait, Baldi's not done causing a ruckus. He goes all out, screaming like he is auditioning for a metal band. A greenish aura starts swirling around him and he hurls his ninja-like blades at our boy with all his might. But no biggie though my man just casually snatches those spinny things mid-air with his bare hands, all while dropping some wisdom on Baldi, telling him not to overestimate himself. This is where the Baldi bastard starts to get cold feet feeling as if his body has suddenly stopped obeying him. He senses the immense emitted spiritual energy of our boy making him feel like a tiny ant against a cosmic giant. Of course his jaw practically hits the floor as he contemplates the speed of the sword which was so fast that even the naked eye could not catch it. Overwhelmed by the whole shebang the Baldi bastard attempts to admit defeat. But before he can finish his sentence his own ninja spiny things decide to shut him up by hitting him square in the mouth. As he falls to his knees on the ground our man casually reminds him that he had already told him he would not have the chance to admit defeat. A moment later, to make sure the game is over he punches the bastard on his head so bad that the ground beneath them shatters into pieces leaving mess of rocks and rubble. Baldi's eyes widen with his mouth gapes in sheer impact and the air-piercing screams echo through the arena. As the scene pans out we see the entire place is left in a blue shimmering cloud of dust like the aftermath of a sex showdown that is the stuff of legends. Meanwhile, in the settling dust, we observe the once cheering onlookers whose faces have now gone as flat as wood after witnessing the impressive display of power. Now, the camera shifts to our lad who is can be seen calmly grabbing onto the once cocky but now a beaten up bastard. At that very moment he turns to the judge wanting to know the outcome of the match and how they plan to proceed since the motherfucker has fainted. But the judge not wanting to get tangled up in our lad's affairs swiftly hurls down all of the spirit stones and urges our lad to snatch them up and make a quick exit from the place. While casually snatching up those sweet spirit stones, our lad throws a question into the mix, wondering why he cannot continue to the next round since he just battled that bastard for five rounds straight. On the other side the old grumpy man clearly frustrated points his finger telling our lad to figure it out himself. As the scene transitions, we see the once grand arena is now reduced to rubble that left the onlookers with cold feet. But our lad ever the pensive one starts to mull over the situation. Why did it all go down like this? Especially since by his calculations he apparently used only 30% of his strength. After the arena tale wrapped up, the scene transitions to our boy casually strolling down the mountains under the shimmering moonlight. Suddenly, a voice pierces the quiet night demanding him to stop. Naturally, our boy's alarm bells start ringing. And as the scene shifts, we spot the guy from the arena the one who got sabotaged by that sneaky bastard. So our boy looking at the blade he wonders if the poison has been neutralized and cheekily asks if he is here to express his gratitude. But, surprisingly with the menacing aura surrounding him, Baldi makes his intentions crystal clear, declaring that he is here to kill our boy. With a sly grin etching on his face, our man cheekily asks him if it is acceptable to brazenly murder a fellow disciple like this and questions if he is not afraid of the consequences. However, with no prior warning whatsoever Baldi lunges into the air and unleashes a pink light, which is only inches away before slashing our boy in half. But my man with his circus-worthy moves casually bends his back, letting Baldi's deadly strike pass harmlessly above him. With a cheeky grin, he taunts Baldi, telling him he will need more than that to take him down. Swiftly grabbing his sword our boy lunges into the air while all ready for the next move. On the other side, Baldi ever ready with his sword, unleashes the pink aura once again. This is when it becomes clear that the reason he came to fight our boy not for revenge, but to witness the true extent of our lad's strength. Just as Baldi's sword is about to make contact, the boy mysteriously vanishes into thin air and reappears above in the air. While bathed in a golden fiery aura, he descends upon Baldi with bullet speed. Of course the Baldi turns around only to find out a fiery gigantic palm about to get him. Before he could react, the fiery palm hits the man leaving him soaring through the air and breaking down nearby trees in his wake like a game of bowling. As we zoom in on the man experiencing a rough landing we see his screams of agony echoing through the mountains. And this is where he boldly makes it clear that his strength is more than enough to finish off the likes of him with one slap. So after the showdown was over, he stands amidst the rubble claiming that this is the first time he has used the spiritual energy generated by his Vajra glazed physique. But he did not expect it to be so destructive. Needless to say, if he cultivates it even further it will wreak havoc on these opponents. Meanwhile, the man after having all 206 bones shattered finally accepts the reality and admits that he is not as skilled as our lad, so he gives the green light to kill him. At this point my man towering over this defeated dude, recognizes how this idiot is so quick to accept defeat but nonetheless he asks if he has any last words before he dies. As we close into his face we catch a glimpse of his eye bleeding out blood while says his last wish is that his sister is in Hyolan King New Village and he plead to our man to give her all of his savings from the Caillou insect but do not tell her that his brother is dead and lastly he casually tells our dude to make a move as he does not regret about dying at his hand. 
as the defeated man awaits his inevitable fate, our lad's face tells a different story, hinting at a change of plans. In the following moment, our lad nonchalantly turns around and starts walking his own path while casually tells the defeated man that he can go now. Of course the man confused by the sudden change of heart curiously asks why he has decided not to end his life. So to clear the air, our lad clarifies that while he has no reason to kill him right now it does not mean he does not want to kill the dude. It's just not on the agenda for the moment. With a nonchalant tilt of his head our lad admits that it is easy for him to kill but not something he wants to do right now. The defeated Baldi hears this and for some inexplicable reason he starts laughing like a maniac. As our lad makes his way out of the mess, Baldi asks if his words mean that our lad does not give a shit about him. So in response my man simply tells to him to think whatever he wants. This is where Baldi spills a secret revealing that he does not like owing people favors so to level the playing field he drops a bombshell stating that the sixth elder, Han Zion, is the one who paid him to take our lad's life. Taking a closer look at our boy's face, it is clear that he is not thrilled about the prospect of being assassinated. His eyes widen in realization but nonetheless he thanks the man for the tip. In the following scene, we find ourselves in a shimmering desert where the sun blazes brightly. Our lad, in a resource-gathering spree seems to be absorbing everything in the surrounding area. The reason for his presence in this desolate desert is the abundance of treasures hidden. He reveals that without the assistance of the system resident there would have been no way for him to discover these hidden gems. As he continues gathering the riches left and right, a notification pops up, announcing the completion of the task involving the seven-star salvia grass and mass decoying. In return, our man scores a whopping 3,200,000 experience points. With this much XP gathered he effortlessly breezes through the third stage of the Grandmaster Realm. Taking a closer look at his profile card, we witness the third stage of the Grandmaster Realm securely taking its place in the already expansive profile. It's like our lad is leveling up in the game of life adding another milestone to his sect saga. After the resource gathering buffet, our man stands in contemplation. He ponders the existence of ten elders in the Cayune sect and noting their rare presence within the sect itself. These elders typically make appearances during significant events such as the inner sect disciple competitions. All of them are formidable, residing above the fourth stage of the transcendental realm. To give himself a better perspective, he mentally ranks them based on their martial prowess. Han Zion, the spiky guy, holds the sixth position in this hierarchy. In contrast, he draws a distinction from Elder Q who is ranked tenth. Our lad describes the spiky-headed fellow as vicious and self-centered using colorful language to express his less than pleasing opinion of the character. So while our lad is deep in his thoughts about ranking the elders and all he is hit by yet another notification shouting about some treasure down south. Without missing a beat, he dashes with the speed of light towards the south while he has got his head in the game, knowing that he is up against a big shot this time. He figures he needs to level up his martial arts before this formidable foe strikes back. So after a lightning-fast journey that would make the Flash proud, he finally hits the brakes. Standing there, his face widens with shock as he senses something fishy in the air. And as the scene unfolds we are treated to a spectacle where we can clearly see some sorcerers duking it out with a colossal monster. A closer look reveals the monster roaring, showcasing sharp fangs that could pierce anything and claws resembling a hybrid of a desert crab. However, in the middle of all this chaos our lad spots something odd a random herb sticking out like a sore thumb. Turns out, it is the notorious Datura Stramonium, standing tall in front of a cave entrance. And according to our boy's inner thoughts this herb is supposed to have the magical power to bring the freaking dead back to life. Our lad puts two and two together, realizing these folks must have come for that flower. But the demonic beast got it all wrong thinking they are here to wreck the cave. So, naturally, it starts attacking them. In the following scene, we have got a guy clinging to his gigantic sword for dear life. It's obvious he is in deep trouble with a monster silhouette towering over him. This poor soul's none other than Chen Hu a wielder of the sixth stage of the Grandmaster Realm. Seems like things are getting dicey real quick. And up next we catch a glimpse of two terrified individuals, a boy and a girl. From the looks of it, they believe they are running out of steam and are on a one-way ticket to being monster snack. The guy, Lai Yuan, is at the second stage of the Grandmaster Realm, while the lady beside him is known as Liu Mei and is at the seventh stage. So in a desperate attempt to turn the tables, the young lady instructs the boy to stand on the left while she takes the right. With a combination of swords, victory is the plan. With their strategy set, the duo lunges toward the behemoth with all their might. But here's the kicker their attacks seem to have zero effect on this monstrous creature and in comparison to the beast's colossal claws, the duo looks like tiny ants. This is where the grim reality sets in and we catch a glimpse of the duo's devastated faces as they realize that their attacks are about as effective as throwing pebbles at a tank. Despite the odds, they have not thrown in the towel just yet. One determined lady fueled by sheer willpower launches into the air towards the monstrous foe while the other two closely following suit. On the flip side, the colossal and seemingly invincible behemoth is not exactly thrilled with this turn of events. Meanwhile, our dude on the sidelines is watching intently, finding it quite intriguing to see the trio employing a combination of swift movements and powerful sword techniques. As the camera shifts, another lady steps into view, urging her comrades not to drop their guard. 
This fearless lady is Lai Kingju, a powerhouse at the ninth stage of the Grandmaster Realm. But that is not all, we get a sneak peek at a man in white. Clearly impressed by the improved craftsmanship of the Lady Lai Kingju, this man Wang Gan is the big shot leading the charge and their de facto leader. He proudly boasts an eighth stage of the Grandmaster Realm and while he is further at it he extends an offer to join forces while the beast is down and out. Our boy observes keenly as the five individuals engage in a fierce battle. What catches his attention is the fact that they are all done in the distinctive intersect disciple costumes of the Kaiyuan sect. Surprisingly, each of them possesses significant power, with even the weakest among them boasting a mastery of the sixth stage of the Grandmaster Realm. The camera zooms in on our boy's face, revealing a clear sense of curiosity. He ponders whether these formidable individuals are on a mission from the Affairs Hall. The thought unsettles him realizing that rashly attempting to seize the treasure might not be as straightforward as he initially thought. So, we see the beast is going all out, roaring and throwing a wild red ore into the mix. The leader guy is on it and yells at his crew to block whatever this beast is about to unleash. Meanwhile, the duo a young lady and the boy catches wind of the impending danger. So the boy immediately raises his voice warning that the beast is about to make a desperate strike. The girl all worked up questions whether the beast is attempting to take everyone down with itself and asks for guidance on what they should be doing. She turns around to his leader asking if they should give up on the mission and this is where the senior gives the green signal she was looking for. Here comes our boy, rocking a smirk like he just won the lottery, proudly declaring he is taking the reward since they are ditching the mission. No shame in his game. With the matter settled, he shoots into the air with his lightning speed, now just inches away from grabbing that precious flower. But hold up this is where the girl senses our lad making a beeline for the flower. However before anyone can blink, our dude effortlessly snatches the coveted prize everyone had their eyes on. Then, out of the blue someone starts screaming that the beast's about to blow itself up and orders a full-on sprint for safety. Quick on their feet, the crew immediately throws up protective barriers to dodge the green goo showering down like a mutant waterfall. After finally ridding themselves of the monster, the duo takes a well-deserved breather. The boy checks in on the lady making sure if she is alright and she assures him she is fine. But in the background, someone catches wind of the situation and lets out a loud scream while announcing that someone has grabbed the flower they were fighting for. The man in white swiftly turns around, demanding to know where Kingju is and by the looks of this man's face it's clear that he suspects her of snatching the flower for herself. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to the mountains, where our boy leaves a trail of lightning in his wake as he sprints away. Amidst his escape he suddenly catches a strange fragrance in the air that clearly alerts him of someone else's presence. So, in the midst of my man sprinting through the forest, we catch a glimpse of someone gracefully landing on a nearby tree. As the scene pans out, what we see it is the same lady from before specifically asking our lad to hand over their hard-earned prize. Standing squarely in front of our lad, she pops the big question, is he an outer disciple of the Caillou insect? And then without wasting a beat she demands to know why he swiped their treasure. But my man seemingly not in the mood for a chat stands there in silence. Of course the lady she presses on, wondering aloud if he is either incredibly brave or just plain dumb for wanting to die. But our boy is not one to leave things ambiguous. He spills the beans revealing that since everyone was ready to bail on the mission the treasure became fair game. At this point he leaps into the air to get closer to her making it crystal clear that those who can seize it can get to keep it. And with those final words he dashes away vanishing with his lightning speed. The lady turning around to watch our boy swiftly making his exit, realizes the guy is faster than a speeding bullet. However, she is no slouch herself and without missing a beat she kicks into gear and starts trailing the boy with her own lightning speed. My man seeing the woman closing and finds himself astounded by the fact that her speed rivals his own tenfold. However, we can clearly see him holding onto a talisman that is brimming with electrical energy all while he makes it clear that she is not even close to catching up with him. With his trump card activated we see an explosion of electric energy happening while the boy just disappears into thin air, leaving the lady alone perched on the tree root. To track our boy down she immediately uses her ability that causes ripples of energy to spread throughout the entire forest in search of his presence. But as the fate would have it she finds nothing as if his aura has completely disappeared. A moment later, the other leader guy arrives at the scene, promptly asking the lady who is just chilling around on the tree how it went and if she got the guy. While landing on the ground with a thud she informs him that the person has escaped. At that very moment we also see the duo has also arrived at the scene and the young girl immediately expresses her concern suggesting that the one who fled might have deliberately concealed his cultivation that only indicates that the guy was an expert cultivator. In response to her concern, the lady clarifies that even if he was at the first stage of the Grandmaster Realm with an instant transfer talisman he possessed the five of them would have no way of catching him even if they teamed up. Meanwhile the juniors standing behind their leader are shocked to the core, unable to fathom the reality of the situation. Meanwhile, the leader's face reveals the growing concerns swirling in his mind. So the Mr. Explain a lot decides to school the gang about how epic this talisman thing is, revealing that only a Martial King Realm powerhouse with control over the power of space can create one. He adds that the talisman's value increases with its rank and mentions rumors that suggest that even the cheapest ones may fetch tens of thousands of spirit stones. 
and of course everyone's face is etches with worry as they realize an outer disciple is casually strolling around with such a high value item. And by the looks of their comical faces it's clear that the gang is having a low-key existential crisis, contemplating how they manage to lose to a guy who does not even crack the top 20 in the inner disciple strength rankings. The leader of the group puts on his philosopher hat, expressing that if they can track down the guy and snatch the treasure back, it will not be a total failure. So after making that much clear he decide to call it a day and head back to the sect. In the following scene we find ourselves inside an outer disciple's cave where we see our guys there effortlessly juggling a flower and a bag of treasures while basking in the glory of Han Feng's storage bag. Our man drops the bombshell that he did not plan on using the instant transfer talisman so soon and wanted to keep it until the very end. Turns out, Han Feng's storage bag is the gift that keeps on giving. It's got the soul-devouring bead and the shepherd's bow, but the real star of the show is that instant transfer talisman which turned out to be a game-changer. In the current moment, as he fondly cradles the treasure-filled flower, he is hoping on this spiritual treasure to live up to its hype. And true to form he just utters the magic word devour, and as expected his dark energy springs into action starting to suck up all the sweet mana for himself. At this point a timely notification pops up, declaring the devouring a success and this is where we learn that our man cashes in on a cool 10 million experience points, propelling him into the coveted fourth stage of the Grandmaster Realm. But wait there is more. The divine ability of million times attack speed also undergoes a major glow up, now flaunting a tenfold increase in attack speed. It's like a double scoop of success from this martial arts buffet. While he is busy reveling in the glory and feeling good all about of his upgrades, our man is rudely interrupted by an unexpected arrival. Alert and ready, he scans his surroundings, demanding to know who dares to intrude on his pleasant moment. The scene then transitions to the next day, fast-forwarding to the bustling market of Kingyong County. In the following moment we see our boy is strolling alongside the purple head companion, and by the looks of it he seems less than thrilled about their detour. He questions if their mission was not for a shopping spree down the hill. So while maintaining a serious tone she dismisses his concern explaining that she heard rumors of a grand auction at the treasure pavilion and apparently this is city's largest auction building. And of course she is now forced to believe that there must be numerous treasures, so she invited him to join. To alleviate any worries she also offers to buy him anything he desires as a token of gratitude for the ice elixir he purchased for her last time. Remembering that she has not thanked him yet, she starts feeling a bit awkward about the whole thank you situation, so she throws it out there. She makes it clear her choice of outfit is not some fashion show for him, and this outing is definitely not a date. Our lad being the straightforward guy he is, just nods in response. While they continue their walking, she leads the way and gets ahead of our boy seemingly trying to cover up any lingering embarrassment. But our idiot ever dedicated to his cultivation, ponders the mystery of understanding women. Later, in a moment, we spot a familiar face walking just behind our duo. This is the same guy who previously tried to mess with our dude and his father just before he joined the sect and Elder Q intervened. After a while, we find ourselves in the Yano Mansion. In the following scene, we see a guy in red standing on the stage, while the green guy is on his knees before that mysterious guy. This is where the green dude spills all the information, revealing that our boy has been seen in the city with the mayor's daughter, and rumors circulate that they are close and joined the Kaiyuan sect a month ago. As the scene focuses on this mysterious guy with a snake coiling around his neck he can be clearly seen wearing a sly grin, and this is where he gives the green guy a signal to take his revenge. And later in the moment, we come to know that this guy is Yang Longchen, a young master of the Yang family, and is at the seventh stage of the Grandmaster Realm. We're back with another episode, where the snake guy finally decides it is time to wrap things up with our dude. And, you will not believe it, the once cocky dude has now turned into a humble kitty, saying, thanks for the permission, oh gracious one. But hold on, he is not ready to stroll away just yet. Out of nowhere, a purple energy blade comes whizzing towards him. Meanwhile, the old coot is fuming, wondering how this disgraceful dude has the audacity to ask for rewards. The energy blast smacks the guy right in the back, leaving him groaning in pain like his soul is doing the limbo out of his body. But as it turns out, another big shot in the family makes a grand entrance. This terrifying fella, Yangcheng, master of the Yang family and boasting the first stage of the transcendental realm, is not pleased with the green-headed snake guy's judgment. He's like, dude, you are taking over the family soon, why so impulsive with your decisions? So, our man Yangqing is not holding back. He straight up declares that the green dude is nothing but trash, not doing his job well. And just to add some spice, he reminds everyone that this green fella had his arm amputated by someone else and brought disgrace to the Yang family. He shimmers with purple energy in his rage, and makes it clear that, no favors for this green motherfucker. Talk about cutting to the chase. Now, the scene transitions, and we have got these hoodie-draped lackeys standing there all respectful, congratulating their master on returning from cultivation. It's like a weird cult greeting, but hey, to each their own. The snake guy turns to the cocky dude and calls him father. He's been missing in action for two months and casually asks how the cultivation game is going. 
The cocky guy is not holding back either. He makes it crystal clear that if it were not for him going on a cultivation vacation, the family would not be in this disgraceful mess caused by the green-headed troublemaker. The lackeys, ever the obedient bunch, start dragging the greeny guy out of the place, while the cocky dude is still fuming. He cannot believe Elder Q from the Caillou insect had the audacity to protect our dude, the one who took a shot at a young family member. Snake Guy, with a face that practically screams evilness, nods along with his father and casually mentions that now that our dude has dared to step into their territory, they are planning to finish him off right here in this county. The cocky guy throws some shade, reminding the snake guy to take notes from the Sixth Harmony sect. Apparently, this snake dude insisted on learning martial arts from some ghostly old man, and now he is looking all aged despite being in his twenties. But, the old fella reassures his father not to get too worked up. He firmly believes that the more he cultivates this underworld secret art, the older he will look. So, basically, the fact that he looks like a grandpa today is proof that his cultivation is on the rise. So, the old fella proudly declares that he has now climbed from the Q1 blood realm to the second stage of the Grand Master realm. He's practically beaming with self-praise, telling his father to be thrilled about his son's newfound prowess. But true to his cocky nature, the dad does not let a smile crack his face. He casually challenges the snake guy to prove that he has actually learned something worthwhile in all these years. As the cocky dude pours himself some wine in his fancy skull-like glass, he throws down the gauntlet. He dares the snake guy to bring our lad here before nightfall. With a dark twist of words, he adds that he cannot wait to use a new skull as a cup. With all the lackeys present, the snake guy immediately accepts the challenge. It seems like things are about to get intense. We are back in the sect at the treasure pavilion. We zoom into the crowded scene, where we see the silver head is buzzing with excitement about the treasure pavilion's annual auction, and he turns to his sister to gauge her thoughts. He casually reveals that he accidentally snagged a treasure while on a mission last month. This gem he got is said to block attacks from the third stage of the transcendental realm, and he offers it to his sister for defense. But, it seems the lady is not in the mood for small talk. She flatly tells her brother that she does not need it and suggests he keeps it for himself. Undeterred by her cold response, he humbly accepts and throws another question her way. He reminds her that she is the third elder's direct disciple, usually accustomed to rare items, and finds her behavior peculiar for not baiting an eye for an item like this. At this point, she drops a bombshell, revealing that she has seen someone interesting. The brother, totally lost, asks who it is. She then points out our lad, revealing that he is the one who took the Datsura Stramonium. Zooming into our duo, we see the lady is now quite excited, sharing that she has heard there are loads of exotic items in this auction, and she is all in for witnessing the spectacle. Their pleasant journey to the auction hall is abruptly interrupted by a silver-headed dude and his sister blocking their way. It's, of course, the silver-headed dude with his sister, and he pops the question to our boy, asking if they have met before, triggering an immediate alarm in our dude's head as he remembers her as the one who trailed him in the jungle. The lady takes a step forward, politely inquiring if he is a disciple of the Caillou insect. In response, the purple head reveals that they are outer disciples of the Caillou insect and wonders if there is something wrong. At this point, the sister extends her hand with a pleasant smile, claiming to be a disciple of the Caillou insect as well. She introduces herself as Lai Kingjo. Now, the purple head starts getting a bit jealous at the sight of this lady directly extending her hand toward our boy. On the flip side, our lad's mental gears are turning. He wonders if she is testing his strength with this handshake. In a hilariously jealous turn of events, the purple head cannot hold back and lunges forward, shaking her hand before our boy can even make contact. At this point, the silver head introduces himself as Wang Kayan and reveals that he and his sister are inner disciples of the Caillou insect. He then explains that during a mission, the treasure they were after got snatched by an outer disciple. Furious, he asks if they know who that person might be. The purple head, completely clueless, questions how they would know and wonders if they are suspecting our dude, the one who snagged it. In response, the silver head reassures her that they are just narrowing down their search. He turns to our boy, asking him to prove his innocence by allowing them to check his storage bag. Our lad stays silent, and his sidekick does the talking, shouting at the top of her lungs, questioning why he needs to show the bag. At this point, the sister tells her brother not to be pushy, but he assures her that he knows what he is doing. He goes on to explain that it is proper for a senior to discipline their junior, and even if our dude is aggrieved, the most important thing is to retrieve the item. So, the silver head presents a stash of shining crystals, suggesting, How about this? I will bet a hundred spirit stones, and if he not the one I am looking for, then these spirits all belong to you. But the lady is having none of it. She once again shouts that they are not agreeing to anything. Our boy, not only a master of martial arts but also the art of negotiation, laid down his terms like a seasoned market trader. He firmly expresses that he wants a thousand spirit stones plus a kneeling apology, and then he will take the bet. The silver head turns to his sister, making sure once again if she is sure that he is the one who snagged their reward. She immediately replies that she is 80% sure. With that clarification, he accepts the offer. At this point, our man casually throws his storage bag to the silver head's way. The brother hands over the bag to his sister, reminding her that she is the best at spirit sensing. 
She instructs him to check the bag carefully. She starts her wonders. The pouch levitates, and her eyes shimmer with a bluish aura. Despite three searches, she fails to detect the Datura Stramonium. The brother, losing his composure, immediately asks how it is going. Finally, she accepts and apologizes, confirming that he is not the guy they are looking for. Now, the brother is pale and has lost his cool, realizing that his precious spirit stones are gone. On the other hand, our man is grinning like a devil at the prospect of claiming all those sweet rewards for himself. The purple head jumps in, flashing her confidence like a superhero saving the day because, you know, they have proven their innocence. While the lady hands back his bag, he casually mentions that with so many outer disciples, it is normal to make mistakes. As our lad is about to clutch onto his pouch, the lady attempts another spiritual scan, thinking she has got some detective skills. But my man is not fooled, he was ready for this situation as well. At this point, she is forced to admit that there is no supernatural drama going on, while the purple head is practically steaming at the sight of them indirectly touching each other. The silver head turns into a telepathic guru. He taps into her sister's mind, asking if there is something fishy going on. The lady spills the spiritual beans, explaining that when her spiritual energy flowed through his body, she did not find any lingering aura, which only means he did not snack on or refine the Datura Stramonium. And to add a cherry on top, there is no trace of any aura related to the Datura Stramonium in the storage bag either. Here's where we uncover the secrets of our lad's devouring system. It has got its own built-in storage space. It's like having a mystical backpack that is even roomier than Hermione Granger's bottomless bag. And even if he refines the Stramonium, it leaves no aura behind because, well, it has got the power of devouring, not your everyday cultivation method. With innocence proven, our lad does not waste any time. He's like, so, when are we cashing in on this bet? I have got spirit stones to count. The lady decides it is time to exit stage left, telling her brother to catch up with her later. But the brother is standing there looking like a lost puppy, wondering why she is making a dramatic exit. And here's where the plot takes a 360 turn. She drops the bomb that it was the brother who proposed the bet, and she advised him against it. Now, she is playing the blame game, making it clear that the storage bag was handed to him willingly, and he is the one who asked her to check it. She is basically passing the blame like a hot potato to avoid paying up in the bet. But the brother is not taking it lying down. He tries to clarify that he did it all for her because, you know, the lad's got some feelings going on for her. She coldly drops the truth bomb, telling him there is no need to do everything for her. She throws in a reminder that she has rejected him multiple times over the past few years at Kaiyuan Sect. Ouch. And just to make it crystal clear, she states that if a guy loves her, it does not automatically mean she has to reciprocate. After all, if there are 100 people in line professing their love, what is a girl to do? The poor dude is left internally shattered. His heart resembles a jigsaw puzzle, and the pieces are scattered far and wide, taking the rejection like a champ. Meanwhile, the blue head lady is intrigued by the whole scene, feeling a wave of admiration for the cold-hearted rejection masterclass on display. As she was walk away, she casually informs him that she will be chilling in the second floor private room. True to his word, the silver head hurls a pouch of spiritual stones toward our lad's way, revealing that there are only 300 stones in this bag. He promises to hand over the rest when they return to the sect. However, after snagging the stash, our lad stares at the silver head with deadpan eyes and sternly tells him to halt. The surrounding aura thickens, making it clear that he has not given permission for the silver head to make a swift exit. The authoritative aura starts engulfing the surroundings, catching the silver head off guard. He's practically in panic mode, wondering what kind of mystical roller coaster he just stepped onto. Turning around, the silver head is met with a statue of Grendur and our guy, practically using intense aura. Despite our lad being four realms behind in terms of power, the silver head is feeling a mixture of awe and terror. True to the dramatic setup, as promised, the silver head drops to his knees before our dude. In a humble display, he accepts his mistake, apologizes for accusing our boy. But hold on, our boy has a mischievous plan up his sleeve. His hand starts oozing dark energy, and with a sly grin, he cheekily mentions that this senior brother has not been properly disciplined by the previous generations of senior brothers. So, he decides to take matters into his own hands, quite literally, to teach a lesson or two. He places his demonic hand on the silver head's shoulder, and at this point, the silver head is practically getting torn apart from the inside. The crowd starts forming, and whispers spread like wildfire. Everyone is wondering what is going on, with one person saying it is some kind of bet. Meanwhile, the silver head on the ground is in a state of sheer panic, face muscles tensed up as he cannot resist this earth-shattering force. But our boy is having a blast, and he does not want to stop. He casually mentions that he wants to use an alternative form of payment. And here comes the grand finale, he snags the silver head's precious artifact that he was once flaunting. With the artifact in his hand and a sly grin, our lad wonders aloud if there is something special about this item. After having his fun, he starts to walk away with his sidekick, leaving the silver head on the ground, utterly humiliated. 
Sure enough, the silver head gets back on his feet, fuming and frustrated, while the crowd starts to disperse. He vows to remember this humiliation and promises to get back what he lost tenfold in the future. Finally, we are at the auction of the treasure pavilion, where we see the crowd is all worked up, wondering why the auction has taken so long to start. Then, a lady appears on the stage, and as we zoom in, the first thing our eyes land on is her, well, let us say, voluminous assets. She apologizes for the delay, welcomes everyone to the organized treasure pavilion, and introduces herself as the auctioneer and host, Hong Lion. The crowd is all ears, or maybe just eyes, on her introduction. On the other hand, the purple head is all fired up, excited that the auction is finally about to kick off. No time wasted here. The first item up for auction is a big blade, a grade 3 advanced weapon, the wave-splitting blade. As she puffs up her pipe, she reveals that this grade 2 weapon is refined from the bone and blood of a grade 3 demonic beast and the Stormblood Spirit Rhinoceros. Wielding it can unleash a fierce and incomparable blade energy resembling a giant wave. Needless to say, if a martial artist possesses it, it would significantly enhance their power. The auctioneer, Hong Lion, starts the bid for the wave-splitting blade at a modest 100 gold coins, and the madness begins. The crowd goes bonkers, with people blatantly throwing out figures like 150 coins, 160, and one ambitious bidder even throws in a bid of a whopping 170 coins. Meanwhile, the blue head is thoroughly enjoying the spectacle and casually inquires her buddy about his thoughts. However, he makes it clear that he does not need it. Why? Well, the rank and battle power of this weapon do not hold a candle to the spirit execution sword he already possesses. Finally, after the frenzy of bids, the auctioneer seals the deal for a whopping 300 gold coins. As the auction continues, we shift our focus to the silver head, who is feeling a kind of relief. He's grateful that when he was being utterly humiliated, she was not around to witness it. Having her witness the spectacle would have been bad for his image, and he knows she would always start looking down on him. He's also relieved that she does not take matters to heart, and this auction involves bids in gold coins. So, he is planning to go all out, making sure to catch her attention and maybe change the way she looks at him this time. The auctioneer announces that the next and last item of this auction is about to be revealed. One of the servants holds the mysterious item, and the crowd is intrigued, anticipating what it might be. Finally, the big reveal, it is a jar containing the blood of the grade 6 cold jade toad king. The crowd is in disbelief, wondering if it is actually the blood of a toad king. To add some more spice, the auctioneer mentions that, as everyone is aware, the cold jade toad's blood can cure all poisons in the world, and the efficacy of this blood is even higher than that of a normal cold jade toad. If a martial artist takes it, not only will they be able to cure poison, but their power will also be greatly enhanced without 10 years of hard training. At this point, my man is looking all interested, and he is definitely thinking of snagging this one. The bid starts from 10,000 gold coins, and the madness begins once again. The whooping 10,000 gold coin figure starts to look measly when the bidders take it to the level of 30,000. But the silverhead steals the spotlight, bidding 100,000 gold coins. Everyone in the crowd is left with their bids stuck in their throats after hearing that amount. However, just as my man is about to chime in with a bid of 200, he is completely stopped from spitting out any more numbers by the purple head. She immediately reminds him that she will buy it for him and asks if he is trying to look down upon her. The guy makes it clear that he is not looking down on her. It's at this moment that he almost forgets he is hanging around with one of the richest ladies. Then she goes for it, instantly uttering 300,000 gold coins. The reason behind this extravagant bid is simple. She does not care if she gambles away her entire New Year's worth of money, but if our dude wants this item, he is getting it. The dude is caught off guard, he did not expect her to be that rich. On the other hand, a sparkling glint appears in the auctioneer's eyes at the prospect that she is going to spend the entire day counting up that money. The crowd is also filled with despair, their faces are totally paled by the realization of just how wealthy she is. The silver head is now looking more tarnished than silver after getting caught. The auctioneer, raising her voice like she is on a game show, asks if anyone wants to bid anymore or if she should just close the deal and start counting her commission. The silver head is in a real pickle, torn between the fear of bankruptcy and the hope of impressing the lady of his dreams. But wait, the lady decides to play her cards and casually raises her hand tossing out half a million gold coins like she is tossing spare change into a wishing well. The crowd's reaction is priceless, they are coughing up more than just surprise. Some might need a financial Heimlich maneuver. Meanwhile, the purple head, realizing it is the same woman who had some questionable handshakes with our dude, turns angrier than a cat at bath time. The auctioneer, unfazed by the chaos, asks once more if anyone else wants to join the bidding party or if she should just wrap it up. This leaves the lady in a tight spot, turning to our boy and practically begging him not to break her bank because she never expected the price to suddenly be so high. But our man, cool as a cucumber in a snowstorm, just smiles and appreciates her financial bravery. The auctioneer, hammer in hand, is ready to bring the curtain down. With a twinkle in his eye and a confidence level rivaling someone who has just found a cheat code in life, our dude decides it is time to join the bidding war. But, just as he is about to make his move, the mayor strolls in and casually drops a bit of one million gold coins.
At this point, the Silverhead and his sister find themselves on the edge, where the auctioneer is just pleasantly smiling deriving joy from the chaos. And the purple head is in complete shock to see her father, and of course, I am not going to delve into what is going on in our goofball's mind. Then and there, the auctioneer seals the deal and congratulates this handicapped old coot for obtaining the blood of the Jade Toad King. After the intense bidding, we find ourselves outside, where the sun is casting its yellow shade on everything, turning it into evening. Under this yellow hue, we see the lady carrying her father's wheelchair, expressing her coincidence. She reveals that he has just come down from the mountain and decided to visit Kingyong County. Keen as ever, she asks if he has sent someone to keep an eye on her every day, but the old man immediately denies it, though his face clearly tells a different story. The old man, trying to divert attention, suddenly starts coughing dramatically and pulls out a bottle, suggesting our lad should take it since he was so keen on bidding for the toad blood. Our lad, seeing through the act like a pro, calls out the old man's bluff and demands him to cut the crap and get straight to the point. The old man, clearly not in the mood for pleasantries, fires back with a sassy tone, pointing out that this brat still has the same knack for pissing people off. He bluntly states that the words coming out of our lad's mouth are irritating as heck and tells him to feel free to take the darn bottle. Apparently, she has gone from the ninth stage of the key blood realm to the fifth stage of the grandmaster realm, and our dude gets all the credit. Of course, the lady immediately nods in agreement. Now, the old man is still on a gratitude spree, babbling about how his daughter had a congenital cold constitution, and she could not unlock all that potential in her body. Now that her strength is on the upswing, he is really thankful for it. So, in the end, my man casually snags the toad blood bottle. The old man, being all wise and grandpa-like, tells our dude not to carry the weight of gratitude because, hey, it is just part of the dowry. Suddenly, the lady's caught off guard, giving her old man the what nonsense are you talking look. But, judging by her blushing face, it seems like she is secretly digging the idea he is suggesting. She quickly turns to our lad, telling him not to pay attention to her father's ramblings and tries to downplay the situation, assuring him it is not like that at all. But our dude, being as cold as a popsicle, just bluntly states he never thought about it either. The old man is stunned by the ice-cold response, and the lady seems like she just got hit with a rejection bomb. Panic mode, activated. She repeats the same question, shocked, asking if he never thought about it. Once again, he drops the same truth bomb, saying he never thought about it. Now the lady is draped in despair, throwing out those sad vibes. In an attempt to ease her mind, she declares that she is going to take a walk somewhere else and makes it clear they should not follow. So, after the lady gets her heart a bit smashed, she decides to bolt ahead, leaving everyone in her emotional dust. The concerned dad, being the warrior he is, tries to stop her, but she is not having any of it. So, the old man immediately decides to go into superhero mode and chase after her. Before dashing off, he tells the dude they will rendezvous back at the same spot in two hours. Our dude, true to his chill nature, just stands there while the old man's servant speeds off with the old man in tow, heading in the direction of the lady. As they sprint away, the old geezer casually throws shade, questioning why it is always the old folks suffering when young people fall in love. The servant smoothly responds, saying this old coot is just a slave to his daughter's whims. Left standing amidst the whistling air, he is all alone and utterly clueless, openly wondering aloud what in the world just happened. It's crystal clear, this dude's got zero romantic cells in him. But brushing off the confusion, he decides to shift his focus and is more eager to find a secluded spot to examine the cold toad king's blood. Priorities? Right. Finally, he is wandering around in the mountains, the night settling in, with the whistling air echoing through the scene. He's strolling alone, contemplating how this cold jade toad blood can cure a hundred poisons, making it a handy thing to keep for emergencies. Under the shimmering light, we spot an uninvited guest crawling out of their caves, ready to crash our dude's party. It's a giant snake with shimmery green eyes, its tongue doing a victory dance in the air as if it is counting up the points for its next win. Suddenly, this anaconda arrives stealthily behind our boy, who senses something is amiss. Without even looking back, he nonchalantly extends his hand behind, ready to unleash his laser cannon. Wasting no time, he directly takes on the snake head-on with its shimmering bright light attack. Finally, our dude decides it is time to tilt his head and throws a warning to whoever is lurking around, telling them to scram because these little tricks pulled behind his back will not work. At this very moment, the snake dude emerges from hiding, engaging in a weird tongue dance while tossing some compliments the boy's way. He acknowledges the dude's strength and figures out how he managed to take down so many people from the young family. Cutting to the chase, our dude asks for the snake dude's name, casually throwing in the question, are you lying Yongjin? Sure enough, it becomes clear to our dude who this reptilian motherfucker is. However, it seems this cocky crawler does not appreciate being addressed so bluntly without any honorifics. He throws a warning our boy's way, telling him to behave or else he will haunt him even if he is dead. But my man's not having any of that nonsense. With the speed of lightning, he zips past this old bastard like a flash. The snaky guy is left bewildered, not even catching a glimpse of the dude moving. 
While he picks up the momentum, he throws some shade at the measly powers of this snake guy, casually asking if he wants to seek revenge with those skills. He then unleashes a whip of lightning so fierce, it could probably charge a smartphone from a mile away. The snaky guy's face has gone from reptilian green to ghostly white. As the snake guy tries to regain his footing, our dude is just standing there, cool as a cucumber, with light dancing around him like he is the star of his own disco. He leans in and tells Mr. Snakey that he has not had a decent sparring partner since he hit the big leagues as a grandmaster. With a chuckle, he towers over the scene like the hero he is, patting the snake guy on the back, saying he has got high hopes for him. But the snake dude, still tangled up in his own pride, insists he will take our guy down with one hand tied behind his back. Finally, the snake dude decides to unleash his inner gas giant, hurling so many fart-like green monster claws at our boy that it could make a skunk blush. But our dude is not about to let a little gas ruin his day. With the agility of a ninja on a caffeine high, he somersaults into the air, dodging those stinky claws like they are yesterday's leftovers. Then, he decides to whip out his spirit glow sword technique. And suddenly, it is raining artificial swords like a bad magic trick at a birthday party. But these farts are not just any old gas. They're packing a punch strong punches, turning those swords into scrap. At this point his eyes widens in disbelief, and cannot help but wonder if he has stumbled into a gas chamber instead of a battle. The snake guy, now grinning like he just won a lottery, casually asks our boy if he is enjoying the scent of victory. Then he reveals that this trick is called spirit devouring power. The snake guy, with the confidence of someone who just found a cheat code, reveals that not only can his gas corrode a martial artist's spiritual energy, but it can also pull a sneaky move and weaken their power by a solid 20-30%. He proudly declares this is the proudest martial art of his master, the Elder of the Underworld, and suggests our boy should feel honored to be on the receiving end of such an esteemed technique. With a broad grin and a shimmering green light show, this snake dude is all set to give our boy a thorough taste of despair. It's like a martial arts showcase with a touch of stand-up comedy, but not everyone's laughing. Finally, the snake guy decides to drop his trump card, the spirit devouring power, bury the soul. And behold, the entrance of a skull-like giant artifact marching towards our dude. Yet, by the look on our dude's cool cucumber face, it is clear he has got a few tricks up his sleeve. He immediately counters with a fire hand, pulling out his technique called the Vajra Glaze Physique. As the tables turn, the snake guy is losing his shit, wondering if he is witnessing the purest young technique in the world. Now, the snake guy is all terrified because, despite the spirit devouring power being a heavy hitter, it has a fatal flaw. Adding to the drama, it is already nightfall, setting the stage for some spooky black magic shenanigans. The snake guy, thinking he had the upper hand, decides to pull off a dark magic trick, assuming our dude would not be able to fight back. With the theatrical flair of a magician, he hurls another skull-like thing in our lad's way. But our man, cool as ever, just looks at it and asks, is that all you got? Then, with a nonchalant I have got this attitude, our dude decides to use both hands and, with his conjured up fire, casually grabs the skull-like artifact. Now, the snake fella is losing his composure even more, as if the script just took an unexpected turn, and he is not sure how to ad-lib his way out of this martial arts melodrama. Our man, not one to mince words, calmly tells the snake dude, this is how it is. With a determined look, he clenches his fist, intensifying his fire power until it starts shattering the skull-like artifact. At this point, the snake dude is practically a geyser of blood, like a budget horror movie where the special effects team went overboard. He collapses on the ground, looking like he just lost a round with a blender. Now, our man means business. He prepares his sword, thrusting it through this battered snake guy. But, before facing a fatal flaw, the lizard dude pulls a Houdini act, turning back into his snake form and making a run for it. However, our man, with deadpan eyes that have seen it all, seems to have already figured out the trickery. With a devilish grin, he readies himself, twirls his sword around like a pro, and cuts through every snake that is slithering away, turning them into a bunch of cucumber slices at a ninja chef's hands. And just like that, the showdown ends with a slice of martial arts comedy. Our dude, standing above the defeated snaky dude, places his hand above him for one final act of parting words, rest in peace. And just to make sure he will not be bothering anyone in the afterlife, our dude starts devouring his cultivation as a final gift to the snake fella. After draining the old guy dry, our dude discovers something of hefty weight in a pouch. Naturally, he decides to play Santa and see what treasures the rich and powerful young Master Young has been hoarding. Opening up the pouch, he starts devouring everything it contains. It's like an unexpected Christmas morning for our dude. Then, a notification window appears, informing us that the mass devouring has completed, and our host has successfully broken through the fifth stage of the Grandmaster Realm. To you a satisfying grin on his face. As we take a peek at his entire profile card, it is a feast of juicy powers he is holding up his sleeves. You can practically hear the power-up music in the background. Feel free to pause the video and delve into the details because our dude is walking away from this showdown. And do not forget to check out this divine ability, the million times attack speed, a tenfold attack speed. Suddenly, a purple light starts shimmering in the sky, creating an aura of impending drama. In the blink of an eye, a man descends from the sky, crashing directly into our guy, catching him off guard. 
But our dude is cooler than the other side of the pillow leaps back, effortlessly dodging this meteor of a guy. This newcomer is the head of the family and the father of the snaky guy, who is now a sorry sight in shambles. The father desperately calls for his son, but let us face it, it is not worth the minutes on his cell plan. At this point, our man is pissed. He bluntly states that dealing with the Yang family is like dealing with a never-ending cockroach invasion. They just keep coming at him one by one. But he is not without a silver lining, and pleased to see that the head of the family has finally arrived, and there will be no more mingling with these little ants. The father, gracefully laying his son down with rock support, tells him to rest well, and that daddy dearest will avenge him. Now, the father is shimmering with his purple energy, going completely bonkers at the thought that his son just got a kick in the rear from our dude. Holding his sword tightly, he makes it crystal clear, he wants payback for his son's dignity. With a powerful swing, he hurls down a force so hard that our dude has to put up a shield just to save himself from getting smacked by the impact. But the young man is just grinning like it is a casual stroll in the park. He asks the furious father if he really thinks the first stage of the transcendent realm is something to be proud of for this old bastard. Then, in a move that is a mix of audacity and sheer cheekiness, he lunges at the furious fella, declaring he is just going to use him as a punching bag to explore the extent of his own limits. Not one to be outdone, the man lunges into the air, questioning the audacity of this young man to be so cocky despite the fact that he is about to meet his end today. But, the dude casually throwing back the same energy, states that he will repay him with the exact same words. But the father is even more pissed, persistently ridiculed by this cocky dude, and lunges towards him with full force. Our dude, in his signature casual style, throws his hand, dispelling all the purple energy. Now, this big eyebrowed, grumpy-faced fellow's expression turns pale, probably wondering if he left the oven on at home. As the scene shifts, we see our guy's hand wrapping around the sword like it is turned into elastic. With a nonchalant pat to the father's wrist, the old man recoils, leaving the sword going down. But before it hits the ground, our dude catches it midair, leaving the old bastard bewildered at this unexpected turn of events. Holding onto the sword, our dude reveals that he finds it quite good, and you know the drill, what our dude likes is now his. On the other hand, the father is fuming to see that with just a flick, this dude snagged the sword from him. He starts shimmering into more purple energy, making it clear that even without his blade, he can still give our guy a run for his money, and it will be worse than death. But our dude throws a reminder at this grumpy fella, telling him that the last person who spoke to him like this is already rotting in the depths of hell, courtesy of a mere flick of a slap. The father, quick to catch on to things, immediately realizes our dude is talking about his son. Now, he is screeching at the top of his lungs, declaring that our dude is as good as dead. But, true to his cool demeanor, our dude is dodging these attacks like it is just another day at the dodgeball arena. While gracefully maneuvering through these attacks, he makes it clear to the old man not to blame him for not reminding him. Soaring through that purple-bluish thing, he emphasizes that if he easily gets distracted by his opponent during a battle, he is bound to get killed easily. The old man's eyes widen in disbelief. As the scene zooms out, it appears the sword is about to hit this old fart right in the belly. But as fate would have it, the old dude manages to halt the sword in midair with his flame blood attack. It seems that our man is not holding back, and the sword starts piercing the bubble the old man was reciting inside. With a sly grin, he makes it clear that the old man's struggle is useless. With a flick of his finger, he hurls down the sword, and it is now only inches away from piercing this old dude in the belly. As we take a look at the old man's face, he is trying his best to stop this sword at this point. But, as expected of our lad, he straight up pierces the sword into the old bastard's chest, reminding the old man once again that he was doomed the moment he lost his cool and showcased all his weaknesses. Now, he is ready to send this old man to the depths of hell to finally let him meet his son, making it clear that it is all over. The sword starts pressing against the old man's chest, and within a blink of an eye, it starts to pierce into the old man's heart like it is just another Tuesday afternoon. Now, we take a peek inside what is going on in the dude's spine, and it seems that the old man's hopes are being crushed, leaving him screaming at the top of his lungs. Finally, he is on the ground while our man towers above him like a champ. The old man keeps hurling down our dude's name again and again. Under the shimmering moonlight, with a confident grin etched on his face, he makes it clear that the old man is no match for him, even in the transcendent realm. Now, the old dude starts to laugh out loud like a maniac, revealing that this young bastard is not going to leave alive even if he kicked the bucket here. In a final desperate attempt, he clenches his tongue in his jaw, leaving a gush of blood in its wake. With his jaw broken and the tongue dangling in this act of blood spilling, he utters the words blood burst technique. And with that, an explosion starts to intensify. In his dying moments, the old dude, with a sinister grin, says to our dude, let's go to hell together. In this grand explosion, everything is engulfed in its fiery might within the vicinity. It's like the grand finale of a martial arts saga, where the villain goes out in a blaze of glory, taking everyone along for the ride. So, after the explosion, the dust starts to settle down. The first thing we see is our dude, with swift gestures, making the smoke disappear like a magician revealing his grand finale. With a cheeky smile, he tells the old man that he does not deserve to die just yet. 
On the other hand, the old coot, now all beaten up and shirtless, is left dumbfounded to see our boy not only in one piece but grinning like he just pulled off the ultimate magic trick. With a cheeky grin of his own, our dude makes it clear to the old coot that his plan has failed. He brandishes a magical relic he snagged from the silver head in the bet, revealing that it is all thanks to this little buddy who saved him from the blast. At this point, the old man's mouth is agape, questioning where he got such a high-level magical item. The dude decides to snag his weapon as well, and not to mention, he wants the old coot's cultivation too. Even while the old bastard is on the brink of death, he throws another warning, telling our dude to just wait, he will come back for revenge, even as a ghost. Now, the dude starts to chuckle at the silly notion of haunting someone after becoming a ghost, as if he is mocking the old man's ghostly revenge plans. With bold confidence, he declares that even if his mother came at him in a dream, he would take her down without hesitation. With a palm on his face, he starts sucking up all the energy the old coot had left in him. And right on cue, the notification chimes in, congratulating the host for completing the devouring process and reaching the seventh stage of the Grandmaster realm. Now, the guy is feeling over the moon, thinking about how he has risen three stages in a row. It's been a while since he felt this happy, probably since the last time. So, after wrapping up with the old man, he calls out to whoever is lurking around in the shadows, and there appears a lady behind him. He asks her if she had been following him since he came out of the treasure pavilion and questions what she wants now. Without beating around the bushes, she directly asks for the cold jade toad king blood. The dude chuckles and asks if she is here to snag it, but the lady immediately says no. She gains a posture of respect and tells him that she is here to humbly ask for it. Now, we are back in the city of Kingyong County, and in this county, we are at the Lai's mansion. As the scene zooms in, we see the graceful lady gracefully showing the way for our dude. At this point, he starts to wonder if there are a total of three major families in Kingyong County City. Other than the Yang family, there is the Lai family and Mu family. These three major families are powerful and hold quite a status in Kingyong County. And he is all stoked to realize that this lady is from the Lai family, one of the three major families. However, what surprises our dude the most is that she witnessed him killing two people from the Yang family and devouring their spiritual energy. Still, she did not even mention it along the way, so he really cannot figure out what this girl is thinking. Suddenly, he spots some ladies crying and shocked out of their wits because it is highly unusual to see that the lady has brought a man with her. They even wonder if the sun has started to rise from the west. But amidst the two ladies gabbling, the third lady chimes in, telling them not to scare away the lady's fiancé. Little do these ladies know how big of a goofball our hero is when it comes to love affairs. Anyway, they finally arrive, and the lady stops, directing him toward the short man laying on the bed, moaning in pain. And this guy is their grandfather, Lai Yun Jian. The dude asks if this man is poison. This is where the lady reveals that three years ago, her grandfather went into the cave to cultivate and was accidentally poisoned by the fifth grade black scaled snake king. The poison can cause the patient's entire body to develop snake scales, which slowly erodes the patient's internal organs. As a result, the patient cannot speak, cannot eat, and suffers from colic day after day. And lastly, when the scales appear on the body, they start to spread until the face, and the patient eventually dies. Now, the dude is in a pensive mood, thinking that by observing this old master, it is clear the Lai family should have spent a considerable amount of effort to slow down the toxin's erosion. Otherwise, it is unlikely that this old man has lasted until now. So, with a confident grin etched across his face, he finally understands that this was the reason she wanted the blood of the cold jade toad king at the treasure pavilion. She followed him all the way there to save her grandfather. Then, he strikes a question, what if I do not hand it over? Now, the lady falls on her knees, and with all the posture of respect, she makes it clear that she can do anything he can ask of her, no matter cost. Suddenly, the entire household falls on their knees and starts pleading with the young hero to save their master. The dude is standing there, caught off guard and scratching his head, wondering when the heck did he sign up for a heroic house call. Meanwhile, the entire household is pulling a real tearjerker, practically begging him to play the role of snake scale superhero. He is feeling a bit trapped because, let us be real, he is not equipped with a PhD in snake scale medicine. Plus, if he declines, he is pretty sure the lady will make his life terrible all the way to Kaiyun sect. So, with a heavy sigh and an eye roll that could be seen from the next county, he finally decides to save Grandpa Scales. But he better get some serious hero points for this. After all, he is about to save someone's life. No beating around the bushes, he decides to cut to the chase and pours the Toad King's blood straight into Grandpa's mouth. Worried that using the system might accidentally devour the old coot's cultivation, so he opts for the direct antidote approach. Right on cue, a blue energy starts shimmering around the old grandpa. In the background, onlookers are left in awe and disbelief as they witness the trick working, and the scales start fading away. Fifteen minutes pass, and the grandpa finally opens his eyes. Out of nowhere, he starts puking in a rather interesting shade of purple. The lady instantly lunges at her grandpa, handing him a handkerchief while the coughing geezer declares that he is feeling better now and his spiritual energy is gradually coming back. 
The grandpa then pops the ultimate question, who is the hero of my golden years? She points at our dude and casually drops, this cool cat here is my fellow disciple. Without skipping a beat, the old timer dramatically flops at the dude's feet, grabs his hand, and announces him as the grandson in law, leaving the lady utterly creeped out. Now, this pint-sized old geezer starts bouncing around our dude, clinging to him like a persistent mosquito. He is blabbering about being the chosen one and bragging about landing such a handsome grandson in law. In a blink, the boy gets a shiver down his spine as the old man tightens his grip. Suddenly, it hits him. This must be the power of someone cruising in the fourth stage of the transcendent realm. The old man, ecstatic about finding a skilled and handsome potential grandson-in-law, is over the moon. Filled with excitement, he enthusiastically instructs our hero to head back to his place and prepare for the impending wedding. However, the joyous atmosphere takes a nosedive when our hero clarifies that there has been a colossal misunderstanding. He asserts that there is nothing romantic between him and the granddaughter, and he has no intentions of getting married. The bald old coot, now irked, demands to know if our hero thinks the granddaughter is not good enough for him. Unfazed, the dude coolly dismisses the old man's persistence, asking him to stop bothering him. With that, he casually leaves, leaving the old man fuming in frustration at the audacity of this little brat. In a fit of rage, the old geezer prepares for an attack, all the while insisting that our hero must marry his granddaughter. However, the guy effortlessly dodges the oncoming assault, taking two steps back, and questions why the old coot is suddenly pulling a fast one. The lady's jaw drops to the floor when she spots her grandpa going bonkers out of the blue. Now, this seasoned old-timer is all geared up for a spar, dead set on turning my man into his grandson-in-law. Classic grandpa moves, right. And just when you think the old dude is done, he decides to pull another punch. The dude's ready to fight back, but he is also sweating bullets because, let us be real, grandpa's apparently a ninja at the fourth stage of the transcendent realm. But, the vibe takes a 180. The once fiery old guy is now a mess, shedding tears like it is a waterworks show. Turns out, the old man finally accepted that my dude is not up for marrying his granddaughter. Now, here comes the guilt trip. He starts questioning why he bothered saving this old coot from sickness. Like, maybe it would have been better if he just kicked the bucket. Now, the lady jumps into the scene, her eyes practically shooting laser beams, and with a tone that could make a lion flinch, she asks how much longer grandpa plans to be the star of this dramatic show. The old man's spine shivers just from her tone alone. Finally, grandpa decides to drop the act and play it cool. He admits they are just fellow disciples and there is absolutely nothing between them. To seal the deal, he even takes our boy to the treasury for a well-deserved reward. I mean, the dude did pull this old guy back from the jaws of death. Fast forward a bunch of moments, and here we are in the Lai family treasury. The dude's got the green light to grab anything from this room that is practically shining with gold and treasures. Just to make sure they are both on the same bling-filled page, the boy straight up asks if he can really grab whatever he wants. The old man gives a nod that could rival a bobbleheads. Now that it is crystal clear, he gets down to business, scanning the room like a pro to figure out the top-tier goodies. Shout out to his system for making it a breeze. First up, a bunch of diaries and books that scream low-rank artifacts. But then, he stumbles upon two books that have his interest piqued. With a swift move, he starts stuffing those precious books into his inventory. A notification chimes in, announcing that the divine power of technique and the blood god's martial wrath have just been incorporated. Out of the blue, his eyes lock onto something behind him. Now, fast forward a few minutes, and we find ourselves at the entrance of the Lai Mansion. There is Grandpa, fuming and steaming like a kettle on steroids. He is pointing fingers at our dude, accusing him of being a treasure-hoarding bandit who swiped half of the loot from the treasury. But hold on, my man, with a sly grin and some wordplay, hits back. He drops the wisdom bomb that life is way more valuable than material stuff. After schooling the old dude, he casually strolls away, tossing a final thanks over his shoulder to the frustrated grandpa for the generosity. Talk about an exit with style. Now, the old fella's feeling a tad spooked and nervously asks his granddaughter if our dude really took down the young family master and young master all on his lonesome. The lady does not beat around the bush and confirms it is as true as a unicorn in a fairy tale. Forced to give credit where it is due, the lady reluctantly acknowledges that his outstanding natural talent is rarer than a unicorn riding a rainbow. She even adds that it would be a blessing for the Lai family to have further relations with this guy. The old man mentions further that the Yang family has now lost their backbone now and thanks to our dude who took down their big shots. The rest of them are basically as threatening as a kitten with a feather. He goes on to spill more tea, explaining that the sake-loving dude our guy faced earlier. His master is the big cheese of the underworld, not someone you would invite to a tea party. With the snake dude gone, this old geezer is shaking in his boots because that underworld boss might come out of the shadows. The snake guy was basically his only heir, and if he catches wind that his beloved disciple bit the dust, revenge is on the menu. Now, our guy might be a powerhouse, but facing off with the old man of the underworld is next to impossible. Now, after soaking in that juicy info, the lady looks like she has seen a ghost. Right on cue, her grandfather, being the cheeky rascal he is, starts teasing her. He throws out the question if she is worried about our guy, 
and with a straight face, she denies any feelings and claims it is pure curiosity about what would go down if the underworld boss makes an appearance. Then, like some mystical wizard, the old geezer snaps his fingers, and shadow guards materialize, all on their knees, ready to take orders. The old man starts dishing out commands, telling these lackeys to keep a hawk eye on every move of the young family. If they catch a whiff of them being in cahoots with the underworld boss, he instructs them to report back right away. Sure enough, the lackeys nod in agreement and vanish into thin air. Now, the old man decides to drop some embarrassing knowledge bombs on the lady. He hits her with the revelation that being curious about someone is the starting point of a relationship. The lady, caught off guard, looks like she just inhaled a dose of copium. Quick on her feet, she pulls off a disappearing act to hide her embarrassment, announcing to her grandpa that she is heading back to the sect. The cheeky old rascal starts thinking maybe she is just getting shy. Outside, in the peaceful surroundings, we eavesdrop on a conversation. One person comments that she is grown up but cannot talk properly, while the other decides to let it slide, claiming that the young generation will always be blessed. Now, we find ourselves in the spiritual cultivation pavilion, and the excitement is off the charts as someone cannot wait for it to open today. The crowd is forming, and there is a man at the desk ready to kick off the event. In the midst of the crowd, one guy asks Brother Lai if his cultivation has taken a leap after not seeing him for a few days, while another tells Brother Yang that he is looking stronger. The guy at the desk addresses the eager crowd, letting all the disciples who want to enter the spiritual cultivation pavilion know it is time to line up. With a grin as broad as the Great Wall, one dude asks Brother Lai if he is still planning to use the 3x cultivation efficiency room today. However, Brother Lai bursts the bubble, explaining that he is so broke that even getting his hands on the 2x cultivation efficiency room would be a miracle today. But then, out of nowhere, a cocky bastard crashes the party, demanding everyone to step aside. Brother Yang is taken aback and furious at the audacity of this guy unjustly jumping to the front of the line. This giant, double-chin mother trucker is none other than Hao Yaokian. His family's been in the business for generations, boasting a rich history. Rumor has it he has been exchanging 100 gold coins to one for spirit stones since he set foot in the Kaiyuan sect, making him the richest outer disciple this month. While his talents and realm might not be sky-high, his pockets are deeper than the Mariana Trench. If anyone dares provoke him, there is no guarantee he will not throw money at the problem and beat them up. Like a seasoned pro, he straight up demands to requisition a 10x cultivation efficiency room. The crowd goes wild, losing their minds, and even Brother Yang cannot hold back his frustration. Brother Lai steps in to explain that this is precisely why he tried to prevent any confrontation. Unfortunately, the receptionist drops the bomb that this wealthy buffalo is already fashionably late, and the 10x cultivation efficiency room is fully booked. The crowd, once again, is struck with terror at this revelation, and the buffalo goes absolutely bonkers upon hearing the news. With a cocky tone and anger-induced vines popping out on his body, he attempts to threaten the old coop, questioning how the room that is always empty is suddenly booked. He demands to know who else has the audacity to use that room besides him. The old guy, not one to back down, confidently challenges the buffalo to see for himself if the room is truly booked. All eyes turn to the top of the building, and lo and behold, the room is actually booked. The shimmering light above it can be seen from afar. Even the lackeys of the buffalo have their jaws on the floor, wondering what their boss plans to do next. With a broad grin, the double chin decides to play the waiting game. Now, he turns to the crowd, reminding them that the reason no one's been using the 10x cultivation efficiency room is not just the high room fee. Everyone would have to cough up at least 300 spirit stones to activate the spirit formation after entering. Regularly pumping more spirit stones into the formation is also necessary for its maintenance. And here comes the kicker, if the activation of the formation fails or someone cannot handle the subsequent pressure, they are in for a world of hurt with a reversal. With a wicked grin, this dude confidently tells the crowd to sit tight and watch. He predicts that the person who booked the room, even if rich enough for a 10x cultivation room, will not last without sufficient funds to activate and maintain the formation. He assures them the guy will be out in an hour for sure. The lackeys behind the double chin boss are totally vibing with this plan. An hour ticks by, and the bulky dude is still standing there, anticipation written all over his face. The lackeys are smirking, ready to unleash some serious wrath on whoever was inside. Two hours pass, and they are all scratching their heads, wondering why this brat has not come out yet. The anticipation is turning into confusion, and the atmosphere is thick with suspense. Four hours drag on, and they are starting to feel like they have been clowned. Out of frustration, the dude slaps the lackeys hard enough to leave them spitting out their mouths. One of the battered lackeys, recovering from the hit, mentions that it has been way too long, and the guy has not come out yet. They are beginning to wonder if he is some low-profile tycoon. But then, they start shouting in determination, claim that when it comes to financial power, their boss is the cream of the crop. Suddenly, a bunch of guys come sprinting out from the cultivation building. The double chin seizes one of them, demanding to know why they are running and what is happening inside. The terrified guy mumbles that the entire pavilion is shaking, 
pointing his trembling finger toward the building, prompting the bulky dude to take a peek himself. Indeed, the entire building is shaking, and upon closer inspection, the double chin is sweating bullets, realizing that it must be the person in the 10x cultivation room breaking through a realm, leaving the entire building shimmering in its wake. Panic ensues, and everyone starts running out. The lackeys are dragging their boss away from the chaos, but the double chin insists on witnessing the spectacle himself. Then, an explosion rocks the tenth floor, and jaws drop as if the Grim Reaper himself has descended. Finally, someone emerges from the tenth floor with lightning bolt speed, crashing onto the ground and leaving dust and debris in his wake. And behold, it is our dude who made his grand entrance. After getting all jacked up in the room, he is beginning to see why the spiritual cultivation pavilion lives up to its name. Now, let us dive into his updated profile, and it appears that he has finally reached the first stage of the transcendent realm. You can pause the video to dig deeper into the details. The cherry on top is that he has also achieved a whopping 20-fold attack speed. The chat is grinning from ear to ear, having used half of the treasury he snagged from the old man to level up in this cultivation game. Not a single regret, and he has swiftly ascended from the third stage of the Grand Master to the Transcendent Realm. After leaving quite a mess, my man is casually strolling out of the place like it is no big deal. Now, he is eagerly looking forward to the Intersect competition. Meanwhile, the lackeys are crying their eyes out while dragging their double chin master out of the rubble, deep in the pile of consumed spirit stones. Finally, the day of the Outer Disciple competition has arrived. People gather, filling the fighting arena, eagerly waiting for the commencement of the event. A lady clad in red steps forward, announcing that today marks the Trinial Outer Disciple examination competition of the Kaiyuan sect. With all the contestants present, she lays out the rules. It will be a one-on-one -on -one format, with several sparring platforms for the competition. 300 Outer Disciples will compete one by one, and by the end, only 20 will qualify to become Inner Disciples. She also reveals that during the fights, Disciples should not fight to the death. Amidst the Disciples, our man is seen in the crowd. Behind her stands the purple-headed lady. The boy turns around, asking if something's wrong. She shrugs it off, saying it is nothing, but the look on her face suggests that her mind is stuck somewhere else. Now, the dude is also sensing the same vibes, realizing that she has been avoiding him since her last trip down the mountain. He wonders what she is up to, but when we take a peek into the lady's mind, there is a scene on the playback when the guy straight up rejected her. She has now figured out one thing she will catch up with the dude in the future, and the only way to get him to notice her is to be at a high place. Now, she is fuming, totally engulfed in the fire of determination. Onlookers are startled to see her, and she is dead set on making the boy fall for her. Meanwhile, the goofball is as clueless as ever, struggling to figure out the intricacies of women. Now, the red-draped lady officially commences the Outer Disciple competition. We get a glimpse of the dude, standing tall and mighty, eagerly looking forward to the competition. This fella is Hu Yanfeng, seventh elder of the Kaiyuan sect, boasting the fourth stage of the Transcendent Realm. The red-draped lady is Sun Kai, fourth elder, at the fifth stage of the Transcendent Realm. Finally, in the company, we have Elder Qiu Chang'un, the tenth elder of the sect, standing proudly at the fourth stage of the Transcendent Realm. Adding to the mix, we also have the third elder, Zhao Zhu, at the seventh stage of the Transcendent Realm. It seems that she is the highest of them all. There is another guy in the mix who seems quite pissed to see our dude here and alive. He is worried that if this guy passes the outer sect competition and becomes an inner sect disciple, it will not be easy to get him killed in the future. And this spiky-headed fellow is the sixth elder, at the fourth stage of the Transcendent Realm. Now, the Red Lady turns to Elder Q, asking him if he received the Sect Master initiation transmission not too long ago and now has recruited talent for the Kaiyuan sect. She starts to admire Elder Q for his efforts in bringing in new talent for their sect. There is thick tension between this spiky-headed guy and Elder Q. We get to hear the inner secrets of Spiky Head. He believes that Elder Q is smug, and he has been plotting against him for a month. He even sent a few of his close disciples with profound skills to disguise themselves and blend in with the Outer Disciples, and today is the Day of Reckoning. He is confident that if one assassin could not kill our guy, he will just send more until this troublesome to meets his end. Now, we are in the arena, with a guy facing off against our dude. With full swagger, my guy just tells his opponent to come at him. On the other hand, Spiky Head is grinning like a maniac because he believes that as long as he is in the Kaiyuan sect, our boy will never become an inner disciple. The duel begins, and the dude starts whipping out his flashy sword moves. But my man moves with lightning speed, barely missing his opponent and leaving him bathed in his own blood. The opponent falls to the ground, defeated. With that, stage 7 of the competition is completed, and our boy emerges victorious. Now, the lady is thoroughly impressed by our dude's impressive swordsmanship, but Spiky Head just scoffs it off, saying he was just lucky. But just like that, our guy's making opponents bite the dust, and he snagged stage 9 too. Now, the lady's practically swooning over Elder Q for recruiting our man, showering compliments on the Elder's keen eye. 
But, of course, the elder is trying to play it cool, saying there is no big deal. On the flip side, Spiky Head is totally losing his marbles. After all, my man's on a winning streak it is like victories are his favorite hobby. The onlookers are also losing fear bananas, in absolute disbelief that a guy like him is an outer disciple. Now, some random dude blows a horn, announcing that the competition is done, and this year's showdown is even crazier than the last. Enter the lady in red, casually dropping the bomb that the competition's wrapped up, and soon we will know who is snagging the coveted inner disciple spot. So, it is our young man who is rocking the first place and the second place goes to Giant Yu, and third is the one and only Purple Head Fang Yaling. Now, let us zoom in on Purple Head, who is clearly dead set on reaching the same level as our guy. On the flip side, Spiky Head is losing it. He is absolutely ticked off to see our guy hitting the first stage of the Transcendent Realm in such a short period. He is probably scratching his head, wondering what kind of sorcery is at play here. We see one of the ladies from the crowd is heading back, and her friend asks her why is she bailing when she wanted to stick around for the whole tournament. She casually shrugs it off, saying it is nothing, and the game's already done. Because she has got the inside scoop that our dude is winning, and she is pretty well aware that he is hiding his talents like a pro. Now, we have landed in the treasure hall. The instructor is leading the disciples to the treasure hall, and my guy is practically jumping with joy at the sight of how massive it is. The lady draped in red spills the beans that there is this rule in the Kaiyun sect. It lets an outer disciple, once formally entering the sect, dive into the treasure hall and grab an elder, a weapon, and a martial arts book as a sweet reward. Talk about perks. So, we finally get a sneak peek at the treasure hall, and it is a three-story wonderland. The first floor is the treasure floor, second is the weapon floor, and the third floor is the secret book floor. You can pick one thing from each floor, but here's the catch you have got 30 minutes, and then it is registration time back here. With that crystal clear, disciples are sprinting like crazy towards the hall, eager to snag the best goodies. Meanwhile, my man. Oh, he is just casually strolling, taking his sweet time. Now, my man's starting to think this is the Caillou insect after all. They are not holding back. It is like a treasure trove here. Forget just grade 1 long swords. They have got grade 3 short swords and even grade 4 weapons in the mix. But suddenly, his attention is snatched by something totally unexpected. He is utterly shocked to find a whole stash of grade 5 weapons. The Starfall Sword Remnant, a grade 5 weapon, is practically stealing the show in this golden treasury. Now, we are back outside, where the lady is handling the registration of disciples returning with their loot. And there is our dude in line, casually complimenting the purple head for making the right choices. She shoots him a curious look and asks, what about you? What did you pick? He proudly showcases all the goodies he snagged. She takes a look at this broken sword and gives it a skeptical glance. Then she shoots back with question why is this sword broken? Finally, amidst all the goosebumps, one guy in the crowd recognizes that this is, in fact, the legendary waterfall sword. Resuming the story, we find out that this sword is a legendary divine weapon with the power to destroy the world. It is a shame that it broke in some accident, and even the entire Caillou insect and the elders couldn't fix it. Because right now, it is just a piece of scrap metal. One guy in the crowd warns him that he should not have picked up that broken sword. But my man, with a cheeky glance, says, how would they know if they cannot fix it? Back in the Lai family's treasury, our dude spots something totally out of this world and snags it right away. It is the top-grade ancient metaphysical iron, an extremely rare find. This bad boy can be used to temper a divine weapon and amp up its grade. And guess what? The Lai family is the only one in the entire Kingyong County with this treasure. So, he proudly lays out his loot on the registration table, and the lady gets to work, recording his epic haul. With that done, they start strutting out of the place like they own the joint. But wait, there is more. The dude's got a pill, an inner spirit elixir that can amp up a martial artist's senses and boost their spiritual power. And there is also the Earth Rank Intermediate Level Martial Art, the Blasting Storm Slash. It is known for its speed and lethality, and when combined with his million times attack speed, it is a powerhouse move. Now, our dude's practically buzzing with excitement, strolling out like he owns the world. The lady, curious, asks where he is off to. But my man, all eager to flex some fancy moves, flashes a sassy grin and says he is on the hunt for an opponent. In the following scene, we get a glimpse of the seven-tiered pagoda. It is spilled that each layer of this pagoda has its corresponding challenge. This is the first layer, and challengers can snag the rewards just by overcoming these challenges. To get in, though, they need to throw in a spirit stone at the entrance. With that crystal clear, my man takes a leap of faith into this uncharted territory. As the challenge gets activated, each disciple enters a separate channel but faces the same challenge. It is a smart move to ensure no interruptions mess with the final results. And who is their opponent? Brace yourselves for a showdown with the peak third stage demonic beast the Black Shadow Leopard. So, the battle power of the first layer is like facing off against a third stage demonic beast. With a cocky grin that practically screams confidence, he snatches his sword and is dead set on breaking through the three layers first. The beast lunges at him, but our dude is ready with his fiery attack. In the blink of an eye, the beast is engulfed in ferocious inferno flames, burning it to a crisp. 
outside. The crowd is losing their bananas seeing someone blast through three layers of the pagoda. Yet, one purple head tries to downplay it, saying there is nothing to make fuss about and it's just three layers. But the guy standing beside him points out that it is not about the number of layers, it is about his speed. He passed through those three layers in almost an instant, so fast that you could not even blink. There is a black-haired lady in the crowd, listening intently and looking quite intrigued by the commotion. As onlookers gaze at the pillar, it is evident that my man has successfully breezed through the fourth layer as well. And just like that, he conquers the fifth layer. The purple head is left in disbelief, while this dude, with a twinkle in his eyes, enters full admiration mode. He points out that the current highest record for the seven-tiered pagoda is held by a challenger who took a whopping four hours to pass the fifth layer sister Lai Kinju, a known genius disciple. She only succeeded with the help of the third elder's treasures. Now, this guy did it in just half an hour. His speed is downright extraordinary. Now, this black-haired lady, with her assets on full display, is even more intrigued by this individual breezing through the layers like a stroll in the park. Suddenly, the advance of our dude gets halted at the sixth layer. The crowd starts thinking the worst. Could it be that the challenger has hit a snack? One person even suggests that if the first five layers of the pagoda are dangerous, the sixth is on a whole different level of danger. He goes on to reveal that those who break into the sixth layer not only need a high realm but also require extremely strong real-world experience. He has heard that even those at the same level as the elders of the sect might struggle to make it all the way through. It is a whole new level of challenge. The purple head's curiosity sparks, and he starts asking what is really inside this sixth layer. The brown-haired guy explains that it is the most terrifying because no disciple in the entire Caillou insect has ever ventured inside, and no one knows what lurks there. Now, we are inside the sixth layer, where a chain guy exudes immense dark energy vibes, covering the entire area. Our guy stands there, fully excited that he does not have to fight beasts anymore and hopes this guy will keep him entertained. His eyes focus on the shackled guy, and starts wondering if he is a prisoner here or something. Before he can figure anything out, he is almost struck by this shackled dude, who charges at our guy with lightning speed. It is probably the first time my man feels startled to see someone formidable. This dude seems to be on the fifth stage of the transcendental realm, but our man does not hold back either and gears up for a counterattack. His fist starts shimmering brightly, ready for action. Sure enough, he throws his best punch, and this prisoner responds with a casual flick of his palm, like swatting away a pesky fly. Now, my man is left wondering what the heck is going on. Despite the direct hit on the prisoner, my man does not feel any sense of touch. It is like he just tapped a surface of water. Finally, the ominous guy decides to speak. With a broad malicious grin, he expresses his amazement that the elders from the Caillou insect seem to have found a treasure. He then throws a direct question, asking our young man about his mysterious grade spiritual technique and whether it is bad. But it seems our guy does not know about this. So, he asks back, what is mysterious grade spiritual technique? Then, this maniac starts to laugh and reveals that it is about immortality and longevity. He then explains that a martial artist looking to master this technique must take the blood of a hundred babies daily for a ritual and cultivate it for 49 days. And if the martial artist successfully masters this technique, they would be able to transform the lingering death aura into flesh and gain eternal life. Now, my man is all pumped up after listening to this downright horrific technique. He grabs his sword, making it clear that what he despises most in his life is people who bully the weak. He questions the audacity of killing innocent babies for his own selfish desires. With eyes that scream confidence, he makes it clear that he is going to defeat this motherfucker and show him a technique involving kindness and puppy cuddles instead. But this ominous fellow starts to laugh at his idea and calls him a hypocrite who claims to be righteous. He then pops out a question, asking him if he ever heard that people can be killed if they are not a little selfish. He starts hurling down his dark energy, while my man, with his lightning speed, is dodging those attacks like a ninja on copium. And while this ominous fella is busy throwing punches, he further makes it clear that those old men from the Caillou insect imprisoned him here using his special technique for their disciples to conduct trials. And, to put it nicely, they are asking him to atone for his sins and questioning our guy if this is not a bit selfish of them. But my man is deep in the battle of dark and light, too busy slicing and dicing to bother with a response. Then, he prepares himself with his sword, while this motherfucker tells him to give up the struggle as he cannot finish by just slashing his dark energy. He then points out that if anyone wants to blame someone when my man kicks the bucket, they can blame those old geezers from the sect. They are the ones who sent so many disciples to his door. So, with a grin wider than a cat that just stole the cream, he reveals that he is feeling really good today. He gets all generous, telling our dude that he will generously gift him a comfortable death, as if he is offering the deluxe package of demise. Meanwhile, his dark energy is throwing a party in the entire place, and everyone's invited, except our dude of course. But it seems my man is not fooling around either, he is fully prepared to take this guy down. He unleashes his 20-fold attack speed, moving so fast that even the air is telling him to slow down, I cannot keep up. And there is this shimmering blue energy blob around him, acting like his personal bodyguard against the dark energy onslaught and in the blink of an eye, he is now only inches away from this cocky bastard. 
At this point, he uses his ability Stormy Slash and crosses through the guy with the sword in hand, leaving this fucker screaming at the top of his lungs, probably hitting notes only dogs can appreciate. The downside of this dude is practically obliterated, and in a desperate attempt, he tries to escape. But my man dashes once again like Flash, and hurls down another slash of light toward him. Luckily, this white haired dodges the attack by taking a step back. But wait, it is not just one slash, my man is throwing slashes at this dude like he is trying to break a record for the world's fastest sword dance. It is like he ordered a slashing combo with a side of extra pain. After this relentless slashing, the entire body of this guy has gone on a vacation to oblivion. Here comes the plot twist. This dude is practically immortal, and my man's sword energy is about as effective as a rubber sword in a pillow fight. But, being the merciful martial artist he is, the young man declares he is not going to kill him. The white head starts turning purple, either from relief or realizing he left the stove on at home. Then, he grabs this white head by the head and tells him he just has to be half alive. Now, this white head is losing his composure, asking the guy what kind of martial arts voodoo he is pulling. So, the system window pops up, casually announcing that the target's severely injured and practically begging to be devoured. Sure enough, this dude starts chomping down on the poor guy's cultivation, who is now groaning so loud it is like a karaoke night in pain. His screams could probably wake the dead, and his jaw is hanging wide open like it is trying to catch flies. Then, the dude disappears into thin air, and the system window hits us with another notification, as if it is handing out participation trophies, saying the host just scored a whopping 2. 2 million experience points. Now, our hero's all geared up and ready to ascend to the final layer. With a confidence level etched on his face, he decides to dive into the unknown. Time to see what is really going on in the seventh layer. So, now we are outside, gawking at the crowd, all wide-eyed and jaw-dropped, realizing this dude just casually ascended to the seventh layer. Zooming back into Pagoda's seventh layer, we spot a mysterious person chilling on a chair like it is a lazy Sunday picnic. As we squint a bit, turns out it is a girl, surrounded by butterflies, she announces that our guy, despite being at the mere first stage of the transcendent realm, managed to breeze through six layers, knocking out opponents left and right. She is giving him a virtual high-five for being unusually talented. Then, this graceful lady in purple, probably the queen of the butterfly picnic, finally swivels around on her chair with a twirl and casually asks, What is your name, Hacha? But my man, being the no-chill champion, immediately tosses out his name and straight up challenges her to start the battle right then and there. No time for small talk, let us get to the action. In the blink of an eye, the lady gracefully glides over to our dude, her hand reaching for his chin. Meanwhile, the butterflies around her are putting on an aerial ballet. She drops some wisdom, saying impatient guys are not exactly winning her favor. Little does she know, my man is not here for the dating advice. He straight up tells her to step away, giving her the memo that he is not interested in dealing with creatures like women. She takes a few steps back, starts hovering midair while comfortably seated on her chair, and what do you know, a portal-like thing starts to materialize behind her. Then, she dramatically points her finger at him, realizing that this man who could not care less about women is about to have a painfully fiery demise. Just like that, a storm of fire materializes behind her with a single gesture from her hand, and the dude's face instantly goes from cocky to scared pussy. He is practically on his knees, witnessing the sheer intensity of this powerful spiritual power. The lady finds it rather amusing that this dude has not kicked the bucket yet, and disappears from her spot. Next thing you know, she reappears right in front of our dude, hands shimmering with purple energy. In a split second, the dude channels his inner ninja with a 20-fold attack speed and darts away, leaving the lady utterly confused, wondering where the heck did he vanish to. Now, the lady gives an angry yet kinda cute pout, realizing this dude is skillfully dodging her attacks like he has got mosquito repellent on, even after she tried to come at him twice. Glancing at the dude, it is clear he is absolutely terrified out of his mind. The realization hits him that if he moved any slower just now, his arm would have been disabled. Talk about a close call. So, he decides to drop the cocky act and get serious because, turns out, she is not someone he can play around with. Meanwhile, the lady continues floating gracefully, butterflies doing their majestic dance around her. With a tone as sweet as honey but as sharp as a blade, she makes it crystal clear that she will not let him dodge next time. But our dude is not taking any chances either, he unleashes a flaming stormy slash. The lady, standing firm on her feet, faces the fiery dragon heading her way. Instead of dodging, she takes a moment to compliment the dude, and mentions that despite him being at the first stage of the transcendent realm he knows so many martial arts, which she finds downright impressive. Then, she whips out a few purple discs and tosses one at our guy with a flourish, calling it the Jade Wheel of Spirituality. She declares it is time to end our guy's arrogance. But the fiery dragon is still charging, not showing any signs of slowing down. In a moment of desperation, our man utters a simple smash. The lady's eyes widen in disbelief. The scene zooms out, revealing her attack rendered useless. She is struggling to suppress the fiery dragon, and it seems like our dude might have just found the cheat code to this mystical showdown. 
Now, with the fiery dragon practically warming her marshmallows, the lady takes a stance. She casually tells our dude, nice move mixing sword energy and flames. In a twist that even surprised her, she conjures a colossal cube, labeling it the aura boundary. It then traps the fiery dragon like it is the annoying neighbor's cat that wandered into her cosmic garden. With a flick of her wrist, she smashes the cube like she is playing interdimensional whack-a-mole. Back on the ground, she starts a mystical TED talk about our dude's bag of tricks. She says if that is his a game, then he might need some more to win against her. It seems she is also while healing her wounds like it is just another day in her life. Our dude, looking more clueless than a goldfish in a labyrinth, start to feel terrified. Now, the lady decides it is time for a little energy gathering session, conjuring a cute little energy ball in her palm. She drops a truth bomb, saying our dude might be handsome and all, but it is a shame she does not dig guys weaker than her. Undeterred, she whips out her trump card, the windy flare, summoning a gigantic purple ring behind. But our dude is not about to be a passive observer in this mystical drama. He pulls out his own circus-worthy move, the wrath of the blood god seal of blood god. Lightning starts crackling around him, and his eyes turn a shade of red that could make even the most vibrant sunset jealous. With all the theatricality of a superhero landing, he lunges into the sky, exuding more ferocity than a cat on copium making it clear he has got the secret sauce to defeat her, and boldly tells her to prepare for her cosmic demise. So, now with his energy beam, he is ready to high-five her purple orb like they are old pals. In the blink of an eye, it pierces through this orb. The lady is giving the universe major side eye, wondering what the heck is happening. She has got her detective hat on, trying to decode this cryptic attack. Now, scene shifts to the mountains, where dark clouds are throwing shade at the sky and lightning is cracking jokes. Outside the Kai insect, we see the lady is casually chilling under a tree hovering like she is the queen of a chill meditation session. Out of nowhere, her chill bubble is popped as she spots a spectacle unfolding in the same direction as the seven-tiered pagoda. Her curiosity hits its peak, and she is wondering if someone finally broke through into the last layer. So, in the affairs hall, the old boozer is basically a professional nap taker after a solid drinking session. He is out cold, muttering about our dude leveling up even more. Now, we are back in the seventh layer of the seven-tiered pagoda, where the purple lady is desperately trying to dodge our dude's fiery might. But, plot twist, everything she tries backfires on her. In a moment of disbelief, she takes a defensive stance and straight up asks him how he figured out the secret sauce to her weakness. Our dude, being the no-nonsense warrior he is, has zero time for useless chit-chat. He is marching towards her with a 20-fold attack, spicing things up by unleashing a 20-fold attack speed too. But, before the sword can hit, the lady pulls a surprise move. She shrinks down and starts whining and crying like a little girl, declaring she is done playing. The dude's eyes widen in disbelief as he realizes her original form is a total curveball. She casually floats past him in the air like she is on a leisurely stroll. Now, she is in full sob mode, unleashing a river of tears like it is a waterworks concert. Then, she goes full on whining marathon, throwing shade about why he is bullying her. She is wondering how, after all these years, there is still someone audacious enough to bully her like that. The boy is standing there, completely dumbfounded by this unexpected plot twist, asking her if she is doing okay. Amidst her loud cries, she dramatically raises her hand and points her finger at him, demanding to know when he figured out who she was and if he was actually planning to use her spiritual powers against her. He goes on to spill the beans, revealing that when his crimson flame blade did not hurt her at the beginning, he sensed something fishy. Unlike that guy on the sixth layer, she was not just healing quickly, it was her original form doing the magic. So, he puts on his detective hat and concludes that she must be some kind of spirit being. The lady nods in agreement, confirming with a casual yes. She drops the bomb that her name is Bai Chen, and she is the guardian spirit of the seven-tiered pagoda. Now, he is deep in contemplation, pondering how a spirit being is a form illuminated by the aura of Earth. It is like, ordinary martial arts techniques will not cut it against this illuminated spirit vibe. Only attacks with spiritual power can make a dent. Our dude is in disbelief that the wrath of blood god he got from the Lai family is actually proving useful here. As they are having this heart to heart, he cannot resist throwing in a casual question about why she was dressed up like that before. She responds by sticking her tongue out like a 12-year-old and casually spills the beans. Apparently, she was bored out of her mind in this tower and just wanted to spice things up by pretending to be an adult. Now the dude's face going full on dumbfounded mode as he realizes she is actually a child in disguise. Deciding it is time to head back after conquering the seventh layer of the trial, he throws a casual goodbye to Bai Chen before parting ways. Now, he is grinning like the cat who got the cream, reveling in the fact that not only did he gain some practical experience, but he also snagged a bunch of spirit stones. Just when he thinks it is time to celebrate, the little charming fun lady grabs his hand and starts dragging him along. She is casually dropping truth bombs, claiming the rewards from the Caillou insect are nothing compared to what she has in store. Urging him not to rush off, she insists he comes with her. After a while, they find themselves standing in front of a giant door shimmering with green energy. The little lady mentions that after passing the seventh layer, he still has a shot at some special rewards from her, a first-class divine reward. 
they finally step inside and enter a hall where the lady reveals the grand finale. He gets to choose one divine class martial art. In utter disbelief, he double checks with her to make sure he is really getting to choose any divine class martial art. Being the practical guy, he brings up her earlier words about having a chance and asks for the criteria. In her mischievous tone, the playful lady drops the bomb that the main criterion is being handsome. After some thoughtful contemplation, he finally makes a choice, the Nine Swords of Nirvana. The lady gives him a nod of approval, mentioning that he indeed has a keen eye for picking treasures. With a theatrical flourish, she tosses the scroll into his hands, revealing that this martial art is her most explosive and strongest secret manual. She adds a casual hope that he can practice it to perfection soon. With a broad grin etched on his face, he says that he definitely will. The story resumes, and we find ourselves deep within the mountains, where a hut is nestled atop one of the peaks. Zooming into this scene, we see someone engrossed in a board game. It is an old fellow named Wang Fin, the Grand Elder at the first stage of the Martial King Realm. He is excitedly telling his fellow players that their sect has received its first class divine reward in hundreds of years. Across the board sits another man, Qin Yandao, a sovereign at the fourth stage of the Martial King Realm. In response to the old guy's news, Qin Yandao casually asks for his thoughts on the situation. The old guy chuckles and says he will dispatch someone to scout the person who snagged the reward later. If the individual turns out to be a promising talent, this old coot plans to make an exception and accept him as his disciple. On the other side, the sovereign stands up, resigning from the game, and jokes about getting older and becoming less adept at winning chess games. The old guy then asks the sovereign if he is preoccupied. In response, the sovereign mentions that there are less than three months left until the Tian Luo Empire sect competition. He expresses high hopes for the individual who just snagged the divine reward, and the other old guy shares the same thoughts. As the air whistles and the evening starts to cast its yellow hue over the mountains, the scene shifts outside the seven-tiered pagoda. Among the crowd, we see our man standing in front of the receptionist, declaring that he is here to collect the spirit stones rewarded for breaking through the tower. The receptionist wastes no time and hurls a ton of spiritual stones at our guy, leaving the onlookers shocked out of their wits. My man casually opens his pouch and starts snagging all the sweet spiritual stones like it is no big deal, leaving the onlookers losing their minds at this brat claiming all the rewards for himself. Just as the chaos ensues, a black-haired lady appears, calling out to our boy from behind. Approaching him with a pleasant smile, she turns out to be an acquaintance. She expresses how long it has been since she saw him and never expected to find him here at the Cayuan sect. So, the dude, after playing hide-and-seek with his memories finally remembers her. She starts expressing surprise and calls him amazing for breaking through the tower like a breeze. Then, she lays on even more flattery and praise, further boosting his ego, while the crowd standing behind is thrilled to see our dude soaking up attention from a beautiful lady. Finally, excitement takes over, and she starts dragging our dude, telling him that it is a rare occasion that they are united. She insists on treating him to dinner and expresses her eagerness to hear all about the deeds and experiences he had inside the pagoda. Now, the crowd is basically eating the dust kicked up by these guys, and everyone's scratching their heads, wondering if Mr. Dust Kicker snagged the top spot in the Intersect showdown. Meanwhile, this other dude casually drops the bomb that he just hopped on the Intersect train and conquered the seven-tiered pagoda like it is no big deal. But, it seems there is this one person in the corner giving major side-eye, totally unimpressed with all the hype our dude is getting. As it turns out, he is Spiky Head Sidekick, who is now buttering up his boss with the juiciest gossip about our unsuspecting hero. News hits Spiky Head like a surprise ninja truck, and he is in full-blown disbelief mode. He asks again if he catches that news right. His sidekick, doing his best nod of certainty, assures him it is the real deal. Now, Spiky Head is freaking out. Dark vibes start swirling around him, and in a moment of frustration, he Hulk smashes the cup he is holding. He then starts kicking himself for not taking care of business earlier, because apparently, my man's power level has gone through the roof now. Finally, they have landed in an inn where the young man is chowing down on dinner, and the lady seems pretty darn delighted to soak in all the deets about our boy's tower troubles. Now, after catching the 411 on his roller coaster life, she is starting to admire him more. She is practically giving him a standing ovation. Mentally, of course, she goes on to declare that with her superhero strength, she is betting he will be rocking the top spot in the Spirit Spring competition this time. But it seems Mr. Oblivious over here has no clue about this epic spring showdown. Observing his cluelessness, the lady, being the understanding soul she is, realizes it is totally normal for a newbie not to be in the loop about this spring shindig. So, she spills the tea, unveiling the secrets of your run-of-the-mill spirit springs. Apparently, these ordinary springs pack a punch of majestic spiritual power, like the secret sauce for martial artists to level up and break through. But they are like your phone battery after a day at the theme park. They run out pretty darn fast. Now, here's where it gets juicy. The spirit spring she is gabbing about is not your average Joe. It is chilling in the middle of Funu Mountain, just hanging out outside Kingyong County. What makes it the bayance of spirit springs is that it has got a spirit vine under its belt, and this bad boy automatically refuels its energy like it is chugging energy drinks at a frat party. 
But hold your horses, because this spring is like a VIP lounge. Its geographical swagger, coupled with its precious vibes, made it a hot commodity owned by the Fab Four, the four major sects. Think of them as the Avengers of Kingyong County and the three nearby counties. These clans are not just powerful, they are the big shots in town, holding the keys to the Spirit Spring Kingdom since the day it was discovered. She clarifies that alongside the Kaiyan sect, we have got the Laiyang sect of Heishan County, the Liuhi sect of Baiyan County, and the Fenglei Pavilion of Human County, the four musketeers of the Spirit Spring scene. Around a century ago, these big shots struck a deal, deciding to turn this Spirit Spring into their own personal playground. It is like an annual party, but with more spiritual vibes. Each sect can bring eight of their best and brightest disciples to the showdown, all vying for a golden ticket into the Spirit Spring. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Originally, there were five slots for each sect, but after a lot of grumbling and discontent, they decided to spice things up. Enter the pre-spring competition, a tournament where only the top 20 contenders get the golden pass into the spirit spring. Our clueless hero, after soaking in this info, drops a nonchalante C. So, she spills the beans that every year when the spirit spring turns into the ultimate showdown arena, it is a face-off between the fresh blood of the four majors and, for some reason, the Kayan sect has not been scoring many victories lately. She is low-key relieved, thinking our guy here, with his talent and strength, could be the game-changer they need. He is the secret weapon they did not know they had. So, he, being the dedicated cultivator he is, decides to join the tournament. Our hero, never one to miss a beat in the cultivation rhythm, thanks her for the heads up. But, being the humble lady she is, she shrugs it off, saying he saved her life, so sharing a little info is like lending a cup of sugar. He then drops the bomb that he actually wants something from her right now. The lady, leans forward and asks what is it. We have now ventured into the Cayenne sex backyard, where we witness a poor tree getting more punches than a punching bag at a boxing gym. As we zoom in on his exhausted mug, we see Silverhead huffing and puffing. It seems this cultivator extraordinaire is fuming because, in the spotlight, our boy is becoming the rock star, stealing the show with his strength, while the lady of his dreams, King Ju, seems to be giving him the cold shoulder. He has worked so hard yet his cultivation still stays stagnant. Right now, he is going bonkers because the lady he once fancied seems to have traded her attention card with our boy. Just as our frustrated cultivator contemplates the mysteries of his stagnant cultivation, something catches his attention from behind. A dark, foreboding tunnel looms, and eerie voices beckon him to step inside. Silverhead starts to wonder if it is a secret cave or the entrance to a mystical realm. Now, the scene flips to the Cayenne Sex Training Plaza, where disciples have gathered like they are about to witness the biggest concert of the year. The camera zooms in, revealing two sect elders in attendance. A fiery-haired lady takes center stage, announcing that those chosen unanimously by the elders among the inner disciples are in for a special mission. And the mission is a trip to the Spirit Spring, guaranteed to be a game-changer. She rallies the troops, hoping they will not disappoint. In the midst of the chosen one stands our dude, looking as determined as a cat eyeing a laser pointer. Meanwhile, the spiky head is practically on the edge of his seat, eagerly awaiting our guy's next move. Now, we have fast-forwarded to the Funiu Mountains. The disciples have finally arrived, ready to face whatever challenges lie ahead in this mystical journey to the Spirit Spring. As the lady announces the spirit competition venue in the scenic Funiu Mountains, a wild interruption occurs. Someone takes her by surprise, expressing disbelief that she is leading the show solo this time. Now, we see the second elder of Fenglei Pavilion, crashing the scene with his team in tow. He is here to stir the pot and, just for good measure, reminds the lady of her miserable loss in a past tournament, throwing shade like confetti. In the crowd, Blackhead Lady leans in and spills the deets to our dude. Turns out, this guy is Lei Shan, the second elder of Fenglei Pavilion. Despite his youthful appearance, he is no pushover. The word on the cultivation street is that he has already reached the ninth stage of the transcendental realm. To put it simply, he is a big deal, and his strength should not be underestimated. Another elder arrives, this time from a different sect, struts onto the scene with his squad of muscle-bound goons. He starts cracking jokes and mocking the other two sect masters like it is a stand-up comedy show. The tension in the air is thick enough to cut with a sword. Our black-haired informant, always ready with the inside scoop, whispers to our guy that this dude is Yang Yin, the third elder of Lai Yang sect. His cultivation is also at the eighth stage of the transcendental realm. But wait, there is more. Another sect leader enters the stage. This guy, Ju Lian, is at the second stage of the Martial King realm and holds the grand title of leader of the Liu He sect. With all these sect elders strutting around, the tournament has not even started, and the animosity is already at peak levels. The lady cuts through the verbal sparring like a sword through butter, declaring that this stage is for the young guns, and the old fogies need to save their trash talking for bingo night. She is all about action and suggests kicking off the tournament before it turns into a midnight roast. The bulky elder nods in agreement, admitting that it is not up to seasoned warriors like him to trash talk. It is time to get this show on the road. Another elder, sporting a majestic long beard, seconds the motion, and without wasting a breath, a member of his team steps forward in the arena. Then, Yang Guan from the Liuhi sect, throws down the gauntlet and challenges anyone brave enough to face him. 
the red-headed lady turns to our spiky-haired hero, seeking his take on this contender. With a knowing smirk, he spills the tea that Yang Guan has reached the first stage of the transcendental realm. The smugness lurking beneath the long beard suggests he is not playing patty cake this time. Finally, a new player enters the stage, answering the challenge with gusto. He boldly throws his name into the ring, King Feng from the Caillou Insect. Cut to the crowd, where we see the lady turns to our dude, seeking his opinion on whether King Feng stands a chance. The boy does not mince words, flatly stating that this dude is no match for her. It is like predicting the outcome of a chess match when you already know the checkmate move. The showdown kicks off, and the Caillou Insect guy takes the liberty to launch an attack. He hurls himself into the air with a giant spirit fist, ready to show off his moves. But the golden boy, with a flick of his sword, effortlessly counters the fist attack. He even boasts that he does not need to move to defeat him. The Caillou Insect dude goes flying backward, executing backflips like a gymnast of the year, all thanks to the powerful pushback. Another strike lands right on his chest, leaving him groaning in pain. To add insult to injury, he ends up in a water pool, and the Goldie makes it crystal clear that weaklings like him are no match. The Caillou Insect members, terrified witnesses to their fellow disciples' swift defeat, are practically trembling. Meanwhile, the Golden Victor stands tall, declaring that any loser who thinks they have the strength can step up and face him. The shockwave is not limited to just the Caillou Insect, other sect members are equally stunned by the Golden Warrior's prowess. A brave soul from the Lai Young sect, Zhu Pingxin, jumps into the fray with a wide grin, oozing confidence. Little does he know that his confidence is about to crumble as the Golden Swordmaster swings his sword through the air, casually labeling him a weak opponent. True to the proclamation, Zhu Pingxin takes a fatal blow to the belly, leaving him writhing in pain. The other members of the Lai Yang sect are sweating bullets, realizing they are in way over their heads against this formidable foe. Meanwhile, the elder of the Lai Yang sect, despite his disciple biting the dust, maintains a tough exterior, claiming that the golden warrior is not half bad. The big beard guy, with the longest beard in the sect, chimes in, praising the golden one as his most talented swordsman. He nonchalantly mentions that the golden swordsman's skills are pleasing to his discerning eyes, and he is actually his closest disciple. He casually adds that he has only recently let him out to practice, as if releasing a lion into the wild for a stroll. The other three elders are now in utter shock because it is widely known that the long-bearded elder does not just hand out discipleships like candy. The fact that he claims the golden swordsman as his closest disciple speaks volumes. With no doubt left about the golden warrior's strength, anticipation builds for the upcoming spectacle. The golden swordsman, with a shimmering aura that could blind a peacock, swings his sword effortlessly in a display of unmatched skill. Anyone foolish enough to challenge him finds themselves eating dust. The another challenger from the Caillou Insect, after receiving a beating of a lifetime, humbly apologizes to the Elder. In response, the Elder graciously assures him it is okay, praising his effort. But the expression on her face reveals she is not exactly vibing with the whole hack and slash Goldie situation. Meanwhile, the Elder with a backbone decides it is time to throw in the towel. He concedes, declaring that he will settle for second place. The ponytail motherfucker turns towards the lady, confidently stating that this year the Caillou Insect is destined for the bottom of the list. Realization hits her, and worry creeps into her expression as she wonders if there is anything that could counter this unexpected powerhouse. Then, breaking through the tension, the spiky-headed maverick chimes in with a confident smirk, boldly declaring that the Caillou Insect will not go down without a fight. The other elders exchange glances, trying to decipher this man's madness. To prove his point, the spiky head turns to our dude, urging him to step up and compete on behalf of the Caillou Insect. However, the red-headed lady intervenes, insisting that while our dude is undoubtedly talented, he is not a match for the formidable opponent. She decides it is best not to add more casualties to their count. With an evil grin that practically screams mischief, the spiky head reassures the lady that our guy's strength is solid, and he has the potential to turn the tide. He urges our dude to win glory for the Caillou Insect. Our nonchalant hero responds with a casual flick of the wrist, agreeing to show his strength to everyone present. Before stepping onto the stage, Yu Yun drops a cryptic remark to the spiky head, leaving him scratching his head, wondering what kind of riddle he just encountered. Nevertheless, he gracefully jumps into the arena, introducing himself as Yu Yun from the Caillou Insect. The Goldie Bastard, brimming with cockiness, declares that if the Caillou Insect is sending someone like our dude, they must be out of talent. He challenges Yu Yun to grab his sword and prepare for defeat because he is in a hurry. Unfazed, our man throws down with a casual tone, claiming that the Golden One's skills are not enough to make him draw his sword. This audacious response ticks off the Goldie guy, who screams at the top of his lungs, challenging Yu Yun to see how he will talk when faced with defeat. Now, the Goldie motherfucker lunges at our guy with his shiny sword, but Yu Yun decides to pull a Houdini move and vanishes from the scene. But then he reappears right behind the Goldie Bastard, who is now as pale as Casper, wondering where our dude vanished into thin air. He stands there, all graceful, while Mr. Goldie is having a reality check, his once cocky face now resembling a scared kitten. 
Then, my man gives the golden dude a flick of his finger, and the guy tumbles down on the ground like a tipsy toddler. The elders from various sects are losing their minds, looking at the arena freaked out and wondering what the heck is going on. If is this some kind of magic show? But, the Kai insect members are now pumped up and excited, cheering for their fellow member as he makes the opponent bite the dust. Back in the arena, the golden dude is still in disbelief, wondering how he got busted by this dude. He is practically using fire, making it clear that the fight is far from over. Sure enough, with all his fiery might, he lunges at our guy with his mad flame killing technique. However, the battle takes a hilarious turn when my man casually kicks the guy on his belly, like someone knocking over an empty can, and then nonchalantly calls for the next opponent. The golden warrior ends up directly falling into the water pool, leaving onlookers in sheer terror wondering what just happened. But wait, the golden guy emerges from the water, totally fuming, making it clear that he is not ready to admit defeat just yet. But then his master forces him to face the grim reality that he has lost, telling him to come over before losing any remaining dignity. However, instead of gracefully accepting defeat, he throws a disdainful glance at his master. Now, my man in the arena stands all defiant, boldly declaring that this time, his Kaiyun sect is claiming eight of the spirit spring slots. He throws a challenge to anyone interested, suggesting they join forces and come at him with their full power to save time. The spiky head is totally dumbfounded, wondering what this guy is talking about. Sure enough, everyone starts lunging at him like ninjas in action, ready to slice up this arrogant fellow. It is about to get wild in the arena, but my man stands defiantly, thoroughly pleased to see that he will not have to deal with these small fries one by one. Then, he hits the ground with his feet, making a thudding sound, and pulls off a move called Tremor Stop. Suddenly, everyone in the vicinity starts floating around in this fiery display, and with just one flick, everyone has been knocked down. Even the elders on the sidelines are recoiling back due to the sheer pressure and power burst of this energy. The spiky head guy is now sweating his balls because my man turns out to be way more powerful than he initially appeared. After wiping the floor with everyone, he raises his hand, asking, who else wants to challenge me? It is like he is just getting started. Finally, we make our way into the spirit spring cave, and lo and behold, the Kaiyu and Sect disciples are proudly marching in, flaunting the fact that they have secured eight slots this year, all thanks to my man. The lady in charge seems quite pleased with the achievement, giving our man a round of applause for his outstanding performance. She promises him rewards when they head back to the sect. Now, getting back to the main business, we find ourselves standing before the cave entrance. The lady explains that the left cave has the strongest energy, while the one on the right is the worst. Before bidding farewell, she urges them to hurry in, find the best spot to cultivate, and make the most of this opportunity to absorb more energy. The disciples of other sects are also excited to secure their spots, feeling the tons of energy just waiting to be absorbed by standing in this spot. So, with enthusiasm, the disciples stride into the caves while the elders instruct them to meet outside the cave after the cultivation game. Now, they finally make their way into the cave, and our boy is leading the pack. The lady beside him mentions that the energy in this place is ridiculously strong. They reach the spirit springs, flooded with a ton of spiritual energy, and the disciples go bonkers, stripping off their clothes and diving headfirst into the springs. Meanwhile, the system window pops up, revealing that the southern direction boasts the strongest energy. My man, being the strategic genius he is, heads straight to the southern side, thanks to the system's guidance, ensuring he can absorb the maximum amount of energy. Just as he settles into his spot, a black-haired lady, clad in a swimsuit, enters the pool he is in. She remarks that the energy here seems to be the strongest, and my man firmly agrees. As they both find their spots in the spring, preparing to start their cultivation, I cannot help but marvel at how sleek my guy's six-pack is. I wish I had those as well. Anyway, enough daydreaming, the devouring begins. My man starts absorbing all the spiritual energy in the vicinity for himself, gearing up for some serious cultivation action. Now we find ourselves in the low rank caves, and there we spot disciples from other sects, sulking due to their bad luck. They never expected the Kaiyun sect to be on everyone's lips, and one of them nods in agreement, stating that he also did not anticipate the Lai Yang sect at the bottom of the list this year. Now, another guy joins the mix, holding onto a green bottle. He reveals that they just lost a match, but there is nothing to be disappointed about, and reminds them to do not forget the master's guidance. Curious, the other two turn to him, asking how he can be so optimistic at times like this. The dude explains that he just has his own ways of looking at things. With a mischievous grin, he pops open the green bottle, telling his fellows to take a look. Now, we get a glimpse of the past, where the elder gave him the spirit Jade Gird, a treasure bestowed upon him before entering the cave. The master mentioned it is a treasure capable of devouring all energies. Now, he is boiling up a plan to use this treasure at the Kaiyun sect. The grand scheme involves using the treasure to absorb all the energy from their spirit springs. Sure enough, he gets down to business, pointing the bottle towards the Kaiyun sect's cave. The goons standing behind him are getting all excited because, with this treasure, they believe they can render the Kaiyu sect's efforts today completely pointless. At this point, it does not matter if the Kaiyu sect took the first place, as these goons are convinced that they are the ones who will seize all the energy in the end. 
Finally, the mist starts to reach the Caillou and Sect disciples' spiritual spring pots. Immediately, they recognize something shady going on, feeling as if the energy of the spirit spring is weakening. Another guy adds that he feels the same way and wonders if the energy is depleting. Of course, my man is not liking this trickery happening. He immediately finds out that someone is manipulating the flow of energy. Instead of feeling concerned, a grin starts to form on his face because now he has found the competition. Who can devour more? So, my man gets down to business and activates his system devour. Immediately, the energy starts to swirl and gather towards him. Now, we are outside, looking at this maniac stealing all the energy for himself, proudly stating that those fools from the Caillou insect do not know about this trick up their sleeve. But much to his surprise, the energy abruptly stops gathering inside the bottle. Suddenly, he is totally alarmed, wondering what is going on. He questions if there is something wrong with this spirit jade guard. One of the lackeys, standing behind him, snaps out, blurting that the energy is doing a disappearing act. The dude then shouts at the top of his lungs indecipherable gibberish, demanding answers. He wonders if they secretly prepared a relic to devour energies, like some cosmic snack bar. But he is dead set on not losing to those KU insect folks. The energy is still pouring out of the jar, and even the bit they managed to collect is leaking like a sieve. Now the dude finds himself in a bit of a pickle because the energy seems to have a boomerang effect. He then yells to his buddies for help before they lose all the energy, but now the three of them are utterly terrified. Not only is the energy they gathered in the jar running out, but the energy they absorb themselves is also doing a disappearing act. Now, let us turn our attention to our dude, who is grinning like a kid who just scored a free ticket to Disneyland. He wonders aloud if those goons still want to make the pointless effort of trying to suck the energy back. Now he unleashes his full absorption powers, and the energy starts to swirl around him like he owns the place. A bubble of energy forms around him, making him look like the boss of the cosmic dance floor. Even his fellow members are startled, trying to figure out what the heck is happening here. Now, let us peek into the cave where the Lai Young sect is cultivating. These folks are also terrified, witnessing the spirit spring acting all wonky. One remarks that the water is acting like it is in a turbulent relationship, and the energy has suddenly decided to play hide and seek. Not only them, the entire cave is thrown into chaos, and the whole place is now shaking like it is doing the jitterbug. Now, even the elder of the sect is feeling dumbfounded, wondering what kind of cosmic joke this is. Why is the energy surging into the cave of the Caillou sect? Not just him, but every sect elder has descended into utter shock. They are all bewildered by the unusually moving spiritual spring energy, fearing that the springs will dry up at this rate. In the midst of the chaos, one of the elders questions where Elder Young has gone. Now we are back inside the cave, where my man is just chilling, casually siphoning off all the energy from every nook and cranny of the caves. Suddenly, a notification interrupts the Zen moment, proclaiming that the host has busted through to the second stage of the transcendental realm. But wait, there is more. Another notification barges in, announcing that he is now rocking the third stage of the transcendental realm. As if that is not wild enough, he is broken into the fourth stage of the transcendental realm. It is like he is playing a celestial video game, and the levels just keep getting crazier. Hold on to your hats because the fifth notification rolls in, declaring his conquest of the fifth stage of the transcendental realm. At this point, the lady caught up in this madness is making sure her blouse does not decide to pull a disappearing act. Now, after successful snack time the absorption is complete, and yet another notification smacks us in the face like a cosmic freight train, announcing the host's triumphant arrival at the sixth stage of the transcendental realm. My man is feeling so good, like he just powered up his cultivation game to a whole new level. Now, let us check out his profile card, where the sixth stage of the transcendental realm proudly takes its place in his never-ending list of abilities. It is like collecting cosmic stickers for a spiritual passport. Our dude is standing tall, grinning like he just aced a celestial exam after devouring all the energy in the caves. And get this, he graciously left a small portion for his fellow sect members, but he did not stop there, he also drained the energy of other sects. The enhancements this time around are blowing his mind, way beyond his wildest expectations. Now, we are outside, and the guy who once tried to snatch other people's spiritual energy is now standing there, trembling on his feet while clutching onto a bottle. A brave friend attempts to snap him back to reality, declaring the game is over. But no, the dude straight up collapses onto the ground. The rest of the sect members are in shock, realizing they do not have an ounce of energy left in them right now. The lady with the blouse immediately turns to our guy, asking if he is the mastermind behind all this chaos. Without missing a beat, he confesses and makes it clear that while he caused a little commotion, he did not disturb any fellow members from practicing. So, as she is proudly flaunting her, a uh, significant assets out in the open, my man, not a fan of the impromptu show, casually suggests she covers up. Undeterred, the lady stands up, showcasing her vulnerability and sexiness. But guess what? My man remains unfazed, giving precisely zero cares about the display. In a classic exit move, as my man is making his way out of the cave all dressed up, and then, someone throws a roadblock in his path. 
and it is the sect elder accompanied by his disciples, and it looks like they are not here for a friendly chat or to exchange high fives. The sect elder cuts to the chase, immediately demanding an explanation for why our dude decided to drain all the energy from their spirit spring. Right then, the blackhead lady jumps into action, declaring that the elder's words are too surprising to digest. She points out they have not even reported to the other elders yet, questioning how he is assuming they are at fault. She boldly claims it was the other sect that tried to steal energy from the Cayuan sect first, and our dude was just lending a helping hand to defend themselves. So, technically, they are in the clear. The elder, not one to back down, retorts with a sassy tone, challenging her to provide any proof that they were the energy thieves. Right on cue, the other elders join the scene, asking if everyone is alright. The black-haired lady takes the opportunity to brief the other elders about the situation. Now, the red-headed lady steps in, sternly advising Elder Yang for wrongly accusing the Cayuan sect. She questions why he is being aggressive if this is how he wants to handle things. Caught off guard, the elder fires back with a big, what? Another elder decides to chime in, questioning how Elder Yang got here so quickly. Quick on his feet, Elder Yang defends himself, claiming he rushed over because he was deeply concerned about the safety of his disciples. Now, the big bearded elder adds his two cents, suggesting that the spirit spring, which could originally replenish spirit energy on its own, has now dried up. He drops the bombshell theory that someone must have used a devouring type relic to suck the energy dry. Now, Elder Yang, feeling like he's got the smoking gun, starts pointing fingers at our boy, suggesting that they should investigate this brat first. Now, Elder Yang is wearing a cheeky grin like a badge of honor, fires back, claiming he only hung out in there for a mere two hours and still managed to radiate such a thick aura. According to Elder Yang, that is a clear sign that he sneakily used some treasure to suck the spirit spring's energy dry. With a dramatic flourish, Elder Yang steps back and throws down the gauntlet, daring our boy to let them take a peek inside his storage bag if there is nothing fishy going on. The long-bearded elder seems to be catching the same vibe and turns to the other two elders, asking for their take on the situation. The redhead lady, not one to mince words, immediately shouts back, calling the whole thing sophomoric. However, the spiky-headed elder adds a twist, questioning why the Cayuan sect should be afraid to let others check out the bag if they are innocent. Our boy, never one to back down, agrees to the idea and boldly states that if he did not have the relic to devour spirit energy, the elders would owe him a big apology. Quick on his feet, Elder Young jumps in, promising a personal apology if our boy is proven innocent. He shoots a questioning look at our man, who is all in for the deal. Without wasting a moment, our man pulls out his pouch from his pocket, ready for the grand unveiling. Elder Yong turns to the big beard guy, urging him to be a notary for the sake of fairness. The big beard nods in agreement. Our man confidently tosses his bag to his way, and urges him to go ahead and check it out. Now, the elder begins the grand inspection, meticulously scanning every nook and cranny of the pouch. Much to the confusion of Elder Yong, the elder finds nothing unusual inside. He looks genuinely perplexed at this unexpected turn of events. The other elder also confirms that there is nothing special inside the pouch, leaving everyone scratching their heads in bewilderment once again. Our victorious man, basking in the glory of his vindication, turns to Elder Yang with a confident grin, asking if he is satisfied with the results. True to his word, Elder Yang, adopting a posture of respect, concedes that it might have been a misunderstanding on the part of his disciples from the Liang sect. He humbly apologizes to our guy. To seal the apology deal, Elder Yang presents a mysterious elixir pill, declaring it as a secret elixir of the Liang sect, the sect-breaking elixir. This magical potion can apparently stabilize martial artist cultivation. As a token of apology, he extends the elixir to our guy. Our dude, always up for some mystical offerings, extends his hand to graciously accept the elixir. With that sorted out, Elder Yang decides it is time to take his leave, along with his party. He mentions that in the future, if anyone's interested in visiting the Liang sect as guests, he will treat them all to a feast. However, just as they are about to make their grand exit, our man decides to put a temporary halt to their departure. In a move that catches everyone off guard, he unleashes a light beam, hitting one of the guys and swiftly grabbing their storage bag. The atmosphere gets serious as everyone wonders what audacious move our boy is planning next. To add to the drama, he pulls out the spirit energy snagging bottle that Elder Yang's disciples were using. The other elders immediately recognize this bottle as the spirit jade gourd, a notorious energy devouring relic. Now, Elder Yang is fuming, realizing that because of his disciples' carelessness, their sect is about to face humiliation. The red-headed lady, not one to mince words, steps forward and declares that it is downright shameless that Elder Yang wrongly accused someone, despite being the real culprit. Turning to the long-bearded elder, she requests his judgment, given his seniority, on this scene. Now, the old guy is throwing some serious shade, stating that the spirit spring has been destroyed, rendering further discussion useless. He makes it clear that he does not want to be associated with someone like Elder Yang. Reminding everyone of their centuries-old friendship, he declares his intent to request the northern region deacon of the Tianluo Empire to remove the name of the Liang sect. 
Now this elder Yang falls on his knees and starts begging for forgiveness. With a tone as stern as a winter wind and eyes cold enough to pierce through steel, the old geezer delivers a harsh reality check to elder Yang. He instructs him to take responsibility for his own deeds and face the consequences, leaving those words hanging in the air like a sore thumb for the entire Liang sect. He then turns his attention to our guy, prompting him to explain himself. With a firm smile, the seasoned elder praises our boy for his talents and decides to return to his sect. He vows to train his disciples more strictly and invites our boy to the summit in the future. With that, he departs with his own disciples. Our dude, accompanied by the lady, also decides it is time to head back. Meanwhile, there is a not-so-happy camper in the mix. The spiky-haired dude is furious that our guy slipped through his fingers once again. In the following scene, we see Yu Yun is comfortably seated in his inner disciple cave, performing some mysterious magic to fuse the elixir he received as an apology gift from Elder Yang. It is revealed that he is just a few points away from breaking through the realm, thanks to the sect-breaking elixir for Yang Yan. As he casually stands, lost in his thoughts, he reflects on how the sect quests have become less challenging. With a decision made, he figures it is time to spice things up a bit. He contemplates going somewhere new, perhaps in search of high-level demonic beasts to add a bit of thrill to his cultivation journey. Suddenly, his keen eyes catch something unexpected. This is where we see a blade hurtling towards him, carrying a note. With precision, the blade pins the note into the wall. And as we squints our eyes to read the message, it instructs our dude to meet at the post hill after 2 p.m. He realizes it is probably a challenge inviting him for a spar. So, with a casual shrug and a smirk, he gears up to meet this mystery person, ready for whatever awaits at the post hill. And there you have it for this video. We have covered all the chapters, unraveling the twists and turns of our boy's journey. But stay tuned, because as soon as the new chapter drops, I will be right here to narrate the next thrilling installment of our hero's tale. Until next time.